Yeah, let's see. Yeah, state its objection uh, to the request for 4 a.m. temporary liquor license for Monarch Tavern, 12 Little Street, on June 11, 12, 13, 14, 17. That's, that's probably fine. Yes. Yeah. 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 So the dates that he's good with are 8 and 9 and 15 and 16. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's clear. Yeah. And he can speak to the people if he has to. Yeah.
uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started. Um, uh, we're on t item TE 32.5, which is a uh, 10 o'clock item 1209, 1232, 1234, 1238, 1246, 1250, and 1264 College Street. It's a zoning amendment. It's a final report. Uh, it was being held for Councillor Bailao. Councillor Bailao, do you have any questions or is there anyone here to speak to the item before we get to that? That's item 32.5? Yes, it is. We're still holding it. I'm waiting for a motion. Oh, okay. So that's, so that's still being held. Okay, so we are now on item, still 10 o'clock, 32.11, Changing Lanes, City of Toronto's Review of Laneway Suites, City Initiated Official Plan Amendment and Zoning Amendment Final Report. Um, so this is a statutory meeting, um, and I understand that there are, is a deferral motion coming. However, um, I've been asked by the clerk's office to say that if there are people here who would like to depute in the event that they are unable to depute next month when this item comes back, um, that they can in fact speak today. Um, at the same time, there is also, if there are people here who would like to speak today, um, we have a 10 minute presentation by staff on this item. So I just would like to get some sense of members of the public who want to speak to changing lanes, if they're still interested in speaking, then please come forward. If there was anyone that wanted to speak, they needed to come forward. What, why aren't we having the presentation first? Well, so the, the clerk has explained it to me, but I'll allow the clerk to speak. Uh, I believe the chair is just trying to determine if anyone would like to make a deputation today. And if that is the case, then we will have a presentation from staff and then hear those deputations. Is that clear? Yeah, can, can we have the, the presentation? Yeah. Yeah. We, we can, that's another, that's another option that I was presenting one option, I was going to present a second option. The second option is we can still, if no one wants to speak, we can still have the presentation from staff. I just wanted to get a sense if there was anyone in the room that wanted to speak. Yes, people, so yes, there are. people wish to speak. Great, thank you very much. So we will get a presentation from staff. So if I just kind of check the will of the committee in light of the fact that we're still on 10 o'clock items, is uh, 10 minutes in terms of a presentation okay, colleagues? 10 minutes? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I think we may have a technical issue. Sorry, can we get some assistance from the AV, Mike?
ready to go? Ready to go. Okay, so you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for having us. My name is Greg Ewens uh, with Toronto City Planning. I'm here with my colleague, George Pantazis. For the last uh, several months, uh, about a year, we have been working on the Changing Lanes Initiative. Uh, there's a report before you today that we'll talk about. I'll provide some background on, uh, on our work and our recommendations. Uh, first, uh, the City of Toronto has a very broad network of laneways. 300 kilometers of laneways uh, within the entire city and about 2,500 individual laneways themselves. You can see a map here of one of the more concentrated areas uh, of laneways in the city and that those are primarily within Toronto and East York District. The laneways were originally used back, uh, or they were, they've been around uh, since uh, the city itself uh, has been around, some dating back to the 1870s, originally used for more utilitarian purposes, sometimes stables, blacksmiths, later garages with the invention of the automobile. Uh, lately, through naming of some of these laneways, we've been able to commemorate certain historical events, important people within local history, which is an excellent thing and shouldn't, should continue. But we're here to talk about uh, housing on laneways, laneway suites specifically. What is a laneway suite? It is a house on the same lot as another house located generally in the backyard uh, where one of the lot, uh, one of the lot lines uh, is next to a public laneway. Laneway suites are intended to be subordinate in scale, they're serviced from the main house, they're completely detached from the main house. They may have outdoor access via a side yard on the lot to the street or in some cases via the lane. The city's considered laneway suites before. In 2006, a review of laneway housing uh, prompted a report from a number of city staff titled Housing and Laneways. The report advised on permitting laneway housing, and it was primarily concerned with severance of new laneway uh, houses. Um, and there were three concerns that were raised in that report. The first being compliance with the city's neighborhood policies in the then uh, recently approved official plan. Issues regarding privacy overlook and shadowing and lack of municipal infrastructure in the lanes themselves to service the newly severed properties. Private entities have also studied and commented on the city's uh, opportunity to allow for laneway suites. Bridget Shim and Donald Chong, the site unseen Jeffrey Stinson and Terrence Van Elslander in 2003, both those documents published, um, talked about the opportunities for the city to adopt laneway housing as another form of housing uh, in the city itself. More recently, uh, a group, Lanescape and Evergreen, developed Laneway Suites, a new housing typology for Toronto. It was released in May of last year and includes, uh, among other things, current legislation, a summary of Laneway Suites uh, criteria and uh, test scenarios, technical comments from staff, results of a consultation, and approaches from other cities. Council directed us in 2017, uh, you know, as part of that report from Lanescape, to look at laneway suites in Toronto and East York area, to consult with city divisions and RAs, and to consider an implementation strategy that looked at uh, things such as staff resources, uh, animating laneways, um, an affordable housing component, and incremental cost increases regarding laneway suites. Undertaking this study, uh, we were guided by generally the following principles. Laneway suites are intended to be rental, not severed, subordinate to the principal house, permitted as of right, and they may not be possible on all lots for a number of reasons. So this study became what's called Changing Lanes. Changing Lanes is uh, the report that's in front of you, and the report uh, is essentially three things. It recommends an official plan amendment application and a zoning by, recommends an official plan amendment and a zoning bylaw amendment to permit laneway suites subject to a range of criteria, from separation distance, uh, coverage, height, form, a set of guidelines are also being developed to help assist people that would look to construct laneway suites to communicate the, in, uh, the information in these guidelines and the zoning bylaw and talk about the process, contact information, city uh, initiatives and other things that should be considered when pursuing a permit for a laneway suite. I'd mentioned that the study area is confined to the, uh, the boundaries of Toronto and East York District as it existed uh, last year. So you can see that map here. You can also see the laneways. The majority of the city's laneways are within Toronto and East York District. So why are we considering these? Well, provincial policies and direction supports laneway suites. The city's policies in the official plan intend a range uh, of housing in terms of form and tenure. The city's neighborhoods, where these are primarily proposed, can accommodate gradual growth and change over time. That is written in the plan. And laneways themselves can evolve along with this new form of housing as interesting multi-purpose 
public spaces. Um, but these suites provide for a new form of housing for potentially an aging population, larger families, downsizing seniors, people of different abilities, and other groups. Various provincial legislation speaks to second suites and specifically laneway suites in a number of areas. The Planning Act um, directs that municipalities shall amend their official plan have policies to allow for a second unit on a residential lot. Uh, the growth plan contemplates complete communities, including a mix of housing options and second suites, and the, the provincial policy statement contains similar wording. The official plan uh, which in Chapter 1 starts off with a number of broad statements guiding the vision of how Toronto is to grow and how the policies that come afterward in the official plan uh, are to implement that vision. It talks about a successful Toronto as being characterized by a city where housing choices are made available to all people in their communities at all stages of their lives, where individuals can participate in the decisions affecting them, where we meet the needs of today's generation without compromising uh, the needs of future generations to meet theirs, uh, among many other things that characterize Toronto as a successful city. The official plan also talks specifically about housing, provision of a full range of housing, noting that it is essential for Toronto's quality of life and that the city's balance and diversity of areas and economic success depend on it, the provision of a range of housing. Now, within the Toronto and East York area, there are a number of land uses that allow for growth. Uh, we're looking only at the neighbourhood's designation, which is generally intended to remain stable over time, though not static. The city's, neighborhood, the city's neighborhoods, shown here in yellow, uh, contain a range of housing, parks, community spaces, schools, local businesses, services, and they are intended to remain stable over time, though not static. Uh, our recommendations in this report recommend amending the official plan uh, policies in this area to permit laneway suites uh, in neighborhoods. Right now, laneway suites are only permitted in instances where uh, they are consistent with the prevailing character of an area as there is no uh, framework to allow for laneway suites, they aren't characteristic of many of the city's neighbourhoods. We undertook uh, a technical review in collaboration with a range of city staff, looking at things such as on-street parking, garbage servicing, stormwater management, lane maintenance, um, things such as the separation distance, setbacks, green spaces, outdoor access, emergency access, the type of lot and main house, um, parking, sustainability, tree preservation. And, and other things such as the opportunity for affordable rental housing, levies and fees, and uh, the city's development charges. This was a, a project that involved a range of city divisions in a collaborative effort, in, in a, which has created the report that you see before you. We also consulted heavily with the community. We had, uh, on November 30th and November 29th, we had some large format meetings. At the original meeting, we presented our objectives, what we were looking at with laneway suites, but didn't provide any recommendations. 250 people attended that meeting and submitted uh, 100 plus comment forms that we, uh, you can see at the bottom of the screen there, tailored for the event to ensure that we uh, received appropriate and usable feedback. There was general support for what we were proposing at that meeting. And, uh, the meeting we had on March 29th was attended by about as many people with some questions, clarification, generally support. Uh, we also worked closely with residents associations. A number of them uh, were very interested in this process. We had an invite-only residents association meeting on February the 24th. 20-plus uh, of the 80 or so residents associations in Toronto and East York were at that meeting. And we have had several individual working group meetings with residents associations and councillors uh, to talk about uh, the, our recommendations. We've also provided periodic updates to all of the residents' associations, whether they engage with us or not, as well as councillors' offices throughout the study process at key times. I won't go into details on the criteria. The report uh, does that thoroughly, uh, though this is what is being proposed in the zoning bylaw amendments, essentially a two-story uh, maximum height laneway house, which is separated from the main house uh, by either five or seven and a half metres, if you have a one or two-story laneway house, respectively. There is an angular plane transition from, uh, or a step back rather, at the second story to assist with uh, overlook and privacy issues. Um, there are landscaped open space requirements. On the laneway side, um, second floor amenity areas are only permitted facing the lane itself. There are no balconies permitted facing into the lots. Um, there is a setback from the lane as well, which is a greater setback than is currently required in the zoning bylaw for garages. That is to provide for greening and, and an entry space and a front door, uh, in some cases, to these laneway houses. The emergency access requirements uh, for these laneway suites can be a constraint. There are uh, a few ways to provide emergency access. 
uh, to laneway suites. They're detailed in the report. But they result in a number of lots, specifically on areas with large unbroken lanes and areas with smaller uh, side yards as being not able to achieve the criteria for adequate emergency access. The lanes themselves present enormous opportunities as public spaces, and along with the creation of housing on these lanes, the city will monitor development and determine where improvements may be made, where maintenance required, ma additional maintenance is required, and part of requiring increased setbacks and uh, for the lanes themselves is to provide for landscaping and lighting on private property next to the lane. Severances are a concern that we share with the communities. Uh, the policies, the zoning bylaw, the guidelines, and um, the development charge framework all deter people from severing their properties. There may be very unique instances in which severances are possible. Those would have to be considered by a zoning bylaw amendment, and a, a full uh, set of development charges would be paid upon severance. So there are significant financial process and policy barriers to severances occurring. We are recommending a three-year monitoring period where we will monitor everything to do with the implementation of this. Uh, that will include staff training as well to ensure a consistent approach in the application of laneway suites. So the, we're recommending these be permitted in the zoning bylaw as of right. So if you, could achieve, if you could build a laneway suite on your property, which met the as of right zoning, you would require a building permit, uh, potentially other permits, but generally a building permit. Um, there are, in some cases, Variances may be considered, and the city will consider those against the four tests, as we usually would. Uh, but we also wanted to note that buildings which achieve accessible design standards, sustainable building technology, protect mature trees, and accommodate a laneway suite within an existing building should be given consideration. We were asked to look at laneway suites as part of the affordable housing uh, strategy. The Ontario's long-term affordable strategy recognizes second units as a potential source of affordable rental housing to allow homeowners to earn more additional income. And exempting second units from, uh, such as laneway suites or basement apartments from DCs makes them less costly to build, resulting in more units in an area where there is a, necess a necessity to provide a different form of rental housing. Staff are recommending a pilot program with financial incentives that will result in rents being maintained at affordable levels over a period of time uh, on certain laneway suites. That would be an application process in a way similar to Open Door. So in summary, the report presents an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment which provides certain criteria to govern the development of laneway suites where appropriate in the Toronto and East York area. A set of guidelines would be forthcoming um, depending on uh, receipt of the recommendations and any changes and those are intended to clarify the guidelines, the official plan amendments and assist those looking to build or modify an existing structure to create a housing unit. In conclusion, laneway suites are consistent with provincial policy, legislation, city policies. They have been successfully implemented in many other cities. They will limit, they've been designed to limit their impact on adjacent properties. They can introduce a new form of rental accommodation, provide opportunities for aging populations, young families, different family structures to live within neighborhoods that can accommodate appropriate infill and change over time. These are subject to ongoing analysis and a reduced application fee and streamlined approach to ensure that they will be constructed where appropriate. They can also improve the, and, and enhance the safety of our laneways by providing more eyes on these spaces and, and better lighting. Laneway suites represent good planning. I want to quickly thank a couple of my colleagues in numerous divisions who collaborated on this, specifically my colleague George, Satari, Caroline, Deanna, Jeremy, Joseph. Thank you to Lanescape and Evergreen, and thank you to all of the residents associations who took time to meet with us, attend our meetings, and engage in constructive conversations that helped shape and inform this initiative in a significant way. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have no doubt that that represents a, a very large body of work and, and, uh, and a summary of uh, the consultations from, uh, from the uh, public engagement meetings. Um, at this point in time, I'm going, there's no questions of staff right now. We're going to move straight to deputants. You've all been extremely patient. Uh, you have, uh, this is a 10 a.m. item which is now being heard at 2 p.m. So hope you've had a chance to get your coffee and lunch. Uh, we're gonna buckle you in. We're ready for deputations. So um, there are a number of deputants. I'm gonna call you. Here. That yeah. was a great presentation. I don't know if we have that presentation specifically or we just, but we don't have it. We don't have a copy here. Pardon yeah, me. So if you didn't have a copy for counselors. Councillor Fletcher, would you like a copy now? And normally we would have a copy, okay, so we're so working from that because it may be. So, so please note that the uh, that Councillor Fletcher has requested that a Thank copy you. of 
today's staff presentation be made available now uh, for the members of the committee. So if we can just ask staff to, to get that printed off and circulated. Okay, wonderful. So, Councillor, you're going to get your, pre your presentation in a hard copy soon. Um, our first speaker registered to speak, and before you come up, just to go through the rules one more time, for those who are registered to speak today, you are very welcome to speak. Uh, there is a, ref a deferral motion with some um, instructions from councillors coming forward. Um, the, uh, just taking a look at what I believe is going to be a series of um, lengthy recommendations that are going to ask staff to do additional work and review. It is most likely going to uh, come back uh, with some supplementary attachments to it, which means that if you speak today, contrary to my earlier instructions, uh, you will most likely still have the opportunity to speak when it comes back, uh, this matter, in June. So you get two shots at it. So I'd like to call our first speaker, George Emerson. And then just to get yourself ready, Nicholas uh, Kochani, Kochan, you are next. Uh, please, George, you will have five minutes. Uh, just note that in this committee, we do not curb your speaking time. We want you to get everything you need to say uh, said. And the clock is on your left-hand side. I'll start it when you're ready. Thank you, councillors. Thank you, city staff. Hello, my fellow Torontonians on this beautiful, warm day. Uh, my name is George Emerson. My family of six, soon to be seven, live on Galley Avenue in Parkdale. And I want to give you some personal, some social, and some economic context as you deliberate uh, this important opportunity in city building. So I came to Parkdale as an economic refugee from the Maritimes, when in the 80s unemployment was around 20%. My wife came 50 years ago as an economic refugee from Jamaica. My father-in-law says Parkdale was once nothing but Maritimers and West Indians. Now all these people come into Parkdale, renting a little room, getting a good job, if they're lucky, a house. Um, that's what builds Toronto in little neighborhoods like Parkdale and all over the city. My father-in-law, Victor Mullings, was the first black driver for the TTC. His friend Larry McClarty was the first black police officer in the city of Toronto. My mother-in-law, dear Daphne, was one of the first black nurses at Sick Kids. I'll get back to Grandma in a second because her story has a bearing on Laneway Suites, but that's the personal context, uh, how I come to be here living and thriving in Toronto and very thankful for the city that I'm in. I'm also a member of the executive of the Roncesvalles Mactonell Residents Association, which is one of the oldest continuously operating residence associations in Toronto. A majority of the executive of the RMRA is in favor of laneway suites, but as a residence association, we are not taking a stance one way or another. Um, I think, and some of us feel, that there's something not quite right about RAs trying to claim to have a representative constituency when we already have one, and that's you, the City Council, who have done uh, a great service in uh, engaging the city staff to examine this issue very thoroughly, um, to listen to a lot of people and, and to make some well thought out recommendations. Um, but for what it's worth, the RMRA did a little survey this week and there was overwhelming interest in laneway suites amongst our, our membership who have uh, responded to our little email survey. Um, I'm personally in favor of laneway suites because it's an organic way to add capacity to a city, to grow a city. And if the reports are correct, we have a dire crisis in housing availability. And we have a cityscape that's quite underdeveloped. When I first moved to the old city of Toronto from the old city of Halifax, I couldn't believe how underdeveloped the, the old city of Toronto was, the downtown old neighborhoods compared to even an old city like Halifax, like just the way the houses are built. Uh, it's serious underutilization of land. Now, I say my family on Galley is growing to seven, not because we're having another baby, but because we're moving in my mother-in-law, Daphne. We don't want her isolated and living on her own as she enters her 90s. And I would far prefer to accommodate grandma with a nice ground level, accessible laneway suite, rather than have to undergo major renovations to three slash four story, depending on the size of house you have in downtown Toronto, or two story, whatever. These are old buildings that can be adapted, but there's a lot of investment required, especially if you're dealing with things like accessibility and uh, ground floor access. 
So Laneway Suite is a perfect opportunity for grandma, and grandma would actually like it. She wants to be close to her family. She doesn't necessarily move in with them. And I know a lot of grandmas feel the same way, and a lot of daughters and their son-in-laws feel the same way. So a laneway suite could not only be used for grandma, but in years to come, it could be a place for the young men in our family coming back from university to get a start in their own place, or we can rent it out on the market to help defray the costs of home ownership and living in the city, the cost of education, and so on. And I know a great many of my neighbors are also in this kind of a transition phase of life, the empty nest phase they're anticipating. And I know many of them who've said they want to build a laneway suite, not necessarily for grandma, they want to move into it. They want to rent out the big house in the front, these three, four, five bedroom houses that I think are frankly seriously underutilized in the city of Toronto. And I hear there is a very serious shortage of family rental, family size rental accommodations in the city of Toronto. And this is a way that you with a simple vote can really increase the capacity of that type of rental housing. Whether it's in the back or the front, you're adding capacity that is seriously underutilized to this point. That's it. Thanks very much. Uh, as Courbozier said, the house is a machine for living. You have an opportunity with a simple vote to make it a much more powerful tool. Great. Thank, Thank you very you. much, George. Thank you. Uh, are there any members with questions for the speaker? Seeing none. Thank you, George. Thank you. Uh, Nicholas uh, Kozchany. Kozchany. I'm sorry. That's I'm going to okay. get it right at some point. You'll get it one day, Councillor. I am. I am. I, this is, I hang my head in shame. Please don't. So, um, good afternoon, members of Community Council. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Nicholas Kozchany, and I am Kozchany, and I am an urban planner at the Laneway Project. We are a nonprofit planning and design consultancy working here in Toronto uh, to create laneway demonstration projects, encourage laneway friendly policies and procedures such as the ones before you today, and to inspire, empower, and support communities in undertaking their own laneway improvement projects. So the motion that you have before you today really sets the stage for increased laneway revitalization within the city of Toronto while providing very specific requirements for what constitutes appropriate developments that fit right in a laneway. And while we would like to see the ability to build laneway suites extended to the entire city at one point, not just within the Toronto and East York district, uh, we accept the proposed um, policy in its current form and would like to see it passed today rather than deferred uh, further down the line because the sooner we can start building these laneway suites, reviting our, revitalizing our laneways, the better in our opinion. Cities around the world have taken steps to liven their laneways. These include cities not just um, different from Toronto but similar to Toronto, including Melbourne, Chicago, Baltimore, Portland, Vancouver, San Francisco, Seattle, the list goes on. Those are only the cities that have laneway housing projects, but there are a variety of other cities such as Virginia and Ottawa, which also have, um, uh, which also have uh, other accessory dwelling units such as backyard suites. This is just one tool to revitalize our laneways, but a very important one. The motion is a step towards bringing our laneways into life transforming them from neglected spaces into calm community gathering points or vibrant spaces or simply places of nature. And to finally end on a humorous note, the motion will also allow millennials like myself to move out of our parents' basements and into their garages. So thank you very much for having me and uh, we hope that you do pass this motion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Ko Shaney. Ko Shaney. There you thank go. You. Uh, thank you. Uh, any questions for Nicholas? Okay, uh, Councillor Davis, followed by Councillor Bailao. Of course. Um, I wondered about um, where there are lane, where there's laneway housing in other jurisdictions. Are there limits on those that back onto busy commercial laneways that are the back of, uh, like the Bloor Dam yeah. North, where there is potentially real conflicting use? Sure. Um, so, with um, loading and uh, large trucks and yeah. that kind of activity. Um, so I know off the top of my head in Vancouver where they have some laneways which are commercial on one side and residential mm -hmm. on the other and that's similar to some laneways here in the city such as those around like uh, Danforth East, like Danforth right. and Greenwood. Um, I believe they allow laneway housing on the residential side, obviously not on the commercial side however. Right, but they they 
they haven't experienced the conflict between those uses? No, no, not to my knowledge. The laneway is um, acts as kind of a unifying space, if you will, because um, they manage to calm these spaces down so that while there is still commercial unloading, the space still acts as a, it's still calm enough that it doesn't conflict with the residential uses on the other side of the laneway, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bailao. Questions? Um, the, in your opinion, would a project like this um, have an impact on the safety of our laneways? Or mm -hmm. yes, I absolutely, I do believe it would because when you add uh, things like laneway suites to laneways, you provide eyes on the laneway. You provide a more active, engaged population. Laneways currently are seen as engaged, uh, sorry, not engaged, neglected spaces, and I think that's largely due to the fact that we don't have people who are literally facing onto them. Too often our laneways are blocked by fences or the backs of garages, for instance. But if you have people whose front doors enter onto a laneway, for sure they're going to start caring more about the space. And moreover, that provides more sort of political capital to do further revitalizations on these laneways and provide other such interventions that would also provide for public safety. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else with questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Craig Race. Following Craig would be Michael Lafrenner. Uh, I'm going to be combining with Joe Flat from Evergreen for my talk. Okay. Wonderful. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, really pleased to be here to be looking at this really innovative work coming out of the city. My name is Joe Flat. I'm Senior Manager of Policy and Partnerships at Evergreen. We're a national nonprofit organization with a mandate to create flourishing cities all across the country. We work with senior decision makers such as yourselves and the general public to work together in creating these amazing cities of the future. I've had the privilege over the past two years to do a lot of this work in partnership with Lanescape and two councillors, Anna Bailao and Mary Margaret McMahon. And we are really committed to seeing this through and think it's an amazing opportunity for this city. Why do we think it's an amazing opportunity? Because we know we have a bit of a challenge when it comes to housing affordability and rental supply. And to address this challenge, we need 21st century solutions that are innovative, that are different, that are unique to actually address this problem. And we can't just have one solution, we need many. And this presents one really viable option for Toronto to think about increasing its density in a gentle way. Um, and how do we know this is worth pursuing? So we've heard from many, many community residents and stakeholders across the city that this is something that they want to see. Through our consultations, in-person, survey, correspondence, walking tours, bike tours, we've done many, many things with many different people, and we've heard over and over and over again that they want to see laneway suites in their communities because they want to live in dense, walkable, complete neighborhoods. They don't have places to go. They can't afford to buy a house, so they would like to live with their parents in their separate dwelling, and they see this as a real opportunity to move forward on and a real opportunity for the city. So what do Torontonians want? They want new housing solutions, they want to live in great places, and they want their municipal leaders to be bold and to take on new approaches to dealing with the problems that we have in our city. Thank you. Thanks, Joe, and thank you for hearing us today, councillors. Um, it's important to reinforce that laneway housing is not a new solution. As you've heard before, cities like Saskatoon and Regina are far more advanced than Toronto in terms of their housing when it comes to living on laneways. Impressive that they've lapped us. Uh, Vancouver is the originator of this and they've had a policy in place for over 10 years now. Currently, there's a provincial mandate from the Ministry of Housing for all municipalities in Ontario to create uh, official plan changes and zoning bylaw amendments to accommodate detached laneway suites. That's why Ottawa did it in 2016 and have seen success in their municipality. Our fellow citizens are desperate for more flexibility when it comes to housing. 91% of our survey respondents online said that they want to see this in your wards. And today, you've got 175 letters supporting this in front of you. And three that are maybe not objecting, but have some valid input on how it could be improved. 
but they're far outweighed by people who are saying this needs to happen now, and they're actually asking for higher density and higher heights and things that we don't think they should have, but they want to see more. So it sounds like we're doing the right thing. It's important to also understand that we need to change the way we think about living on laneways in Toronto. We're not talking about the laneway mansions you're probably familiar with that are three stories and generally bad urbanism. We're talking about laneway suites. The important distinction is that they are non-severable and that's been assured by the recent changes to the development charges bylaw where if you try to sever them you have to pay very steep development charges. So there is financial penalty if you try to do that already in place. The height maximum of six meters ensures that the laneway suite will always be subordinate even to one-story houses with peaked roofs. The maximum footprint means there's space to accommodate cars if the homeowner chooses or have family-oriented units. The rear yard angular plane ensures that the shadow impact of these will have a barely different impact than current as-of-right garages on neighbors and make sure that there's very minimal overlook and privacy concerns. Something I've found in the laneway houses I've designed for clients is that they want people looking into their laneway houses as little as they want to look into your house. So good design will follow from this policy. Finally, they're going to improve our laneways. They're going to create beauty and safety and ensure that we're activating this underutilized portion of our city with high quality street facades. Basement apartments and other secondary units are great but they still don't instill a sense of housing pride that our changing demographics need. I don't feel proud putting my grandmother or my kids in a basement apartment. I want them to have accessible housing options that are above grade, that are bright, that are airy, and I want to support my loved ones in dwellings that they can be proud of. And I want families to be able to rent in low-rise neighborhoods where there are schools and parks, because right now they can't afford to buy. I've built laneway houses here in Toronto and I've toured them all over North America. And I have to applaud the city for these suggested guidelines. They listen to Torontonians and they address their sensitivities in a very thorough and comprehensive way. They offer an implementation strategy that's controlled, focused, and is able to adapt as time goes on and we learn from the early adopters. Finally, they've been respectful to our official plan, to all secondary plans, and to heritage districts not to mention our tree canopy. This is really good policy work. And supporting this sends a message that we want to empower our homeowners who have roots in our neighborhoods. This is a vision that, collective, that is collectively authored by the people who live in your wards. They need their kids to transition out of their home during college. They need income to afford their mortgages. They need to support their family members in a suite that their family members can be proud to live in. And this policy gives them the power to do that. You should support it in its entirety, and the thousands of Torontonians who have put in work to make this happen want to see our city grow in a positive way. I know that you do too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you both. Are there any questions? Uh, Councillor Mahevic first. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate what, you're, what you said. Um, and uh, I just by what context I do support, I do have some questions around, frankly, affordability. Joe, you mentioned affordability. Uh, do you have any data, say, let's start with this, uh, say Vancouver or Regina or the other cities that were mentioned, how many folks actually rent out versus how many folk, for, for how many folks is this a granny flat or a secondary unit? Do you have any data on that? So this is anecdotal, but from um, a site visit in Vancouver last year, a lot of the laneway suites are being used for intergenerational living. So we can't claim that laneway suites are going to solve our affordable housing challenges, but it is going to contribute to the stock of our Yeah, okay, I get that. So uh, would you say 20%, 20% become rented and about 80%, 50, 60? We don't have any data. You don't have any data on that. Okay, I'll, I'll ask staff the same, same question later on. So, okay, so now let's separate the ones for whom it is intergenerational or extended family uh, or partnership living. They go over here, that's all fine and good. Now we're only focused on the ones that are rented. Mm -hmm. How would you uh, assure affordability? Do you think there's enough here to assure affordability? In a market-driven rental economy, it's whatever the market can bear. I have a question to ask you I'm about asking that. Joe. Yeah. 
So I, I have a question, and I'm wondering if laneway suites are where we need to be focusing that specific question. So I think there's lots of tools, as I, as I mentioned, to address this problem of affordability. And maybe laneway suites aren't where we're going to be getting the, the most affordability because it's actually hard to build them affordably. It's very expensive. We know it's expensive to build in the city of Toronto. So unless there's incentives that may be coming from the city, I can imagine that it would be hard to make them all affordable. So minimally, just to push you a little bit, you shouldn't be talking about affordability when you're talking about laneway housing unless we put in place a series of policies. Sorry, folks. Uh, uh, Councillor Mahavik. Just to clarify, I stated that our housing I challenges ask? around affordability. I did not claim that laneway suites were going to address challenges of affordability. Okay, okay thank you. Although they will. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, Councillor McMahon, question, and then you're next. Thank you very much. What do you think? Do you think we should make a decision today or we should defer this? Make a decision. We've been working on this for three years with councillors, with city staff, with literally thousands of Torontonians. They've waited long enough, and this needs to happen now. It's flexible enough that it can change and grow with our city. It needs to happen now. And the last time it was visited at City Hall was um, two years ago, 2006, Six. right? So this is the closest we've, we've, we're, we've been to adopting a, a laneway policy. Suites policy. Yeah, and that policy was fundamentally flawed. It implied that services would have to be run through the laneway. We've addressed that simply by focusing on the severability issue and making it financially impossible for people to sever laneway houses. Now the servicing is already resolved, like it already is for any kind of secondary suite within a house. And you feel that you're the community consultation you've been involved with. Uh, right across the city um, has been extensive or you feel yeah. you've reached thousands of thousands of people from wards all over this city and we've heard unanimously that again I think we may need to redefine how we understand this this is a missing middle part of the housing ecosystem we are not going to be providing deeply affordable units through this strategy but this is for that middle section which we know are really really struggling to live and buy in our communities we won't have teachers living in the city if we don't come up with new solutions to laneway housing or to sorry to housing generally that's the that's the basic thing here this is one drop in the bucket really in the grand scheme of tools that we need to be moving forward on and how we can think innovatively around solutions? I think it's important to note 2,600 Torontonians answered our online survey. We had about 400 people show up to community consultations and the city's had another 400. You've had over 400 letters mailed to your offices in support of this. There's no shortage of people who have been engaged in this process and have helped create it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your question. Councillor Fragedakis, followed by Councillor Davis. Any other members? Please indicate your, uh, your desire to speak with your hand. Thanks, Madam. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, so you said this has zero to do with affordability. Um, I'm wondering how much supply do you think you're going to add to the housing crisis that we're facing in the Toronto and East York District, given the nature of the city and the district that we live in, and not all the parts of the district actually have laneways. So how many units do you think this endeavor will um, create? The City of Vancouver approves about 100 building permits every year, and we think we'd be a little bit higher than that. Uh, the city's estimated between, I think, one and 300 units a year. One and Sorry, two. you're saying that you think you're, we're going to create 100 units a year? That's what Vancouver is doing, and we expect to potentially outpace that. Okay, so, and you think 100 units a year is going to, so, do you think that that's going to solve the supply issue for no. housing in this city? Categorically, yes. No, it's not, but it's, <laughs> it you. adds flexibility for homeowners. Okay, thank you very much. No way. Okay. It's part of uh, many, many things that we need to be doing, but why would we not move ahead on something that's gonna give us 100 more units? Okay. Thank you very much for those uh, answers. Uh, Councillor Davis? Thank you. I want to ask the same question about... Councillors, can I ask you to keep your debate on the side to a very quiet level so I don't have to hear it? Because I want to hear, I want to hear the deputants, please, and I want to hear the questions from the members. Please, go ahead. Um, about crowded uh, service-type laneways, where these businesses um, are doing loading and whether or not that's appropriate um, 
we, we know that commercial, industrial, or employment lands juxtaposed to uh, residential areas often cause conflict. And in this situation, you're face to face. Um, and whether or not that would uh, present any particular issues that you've identified. Um, in our Garbage, study. Garbage, dumping, I mean. Right, so for the, for the laneway suite itself, garbage would be collected where it currently is, which is typically on the main street in front of the house. So we wouldn't be adding any sort of garbage or servicing requirements to the laneway unless it already exists there. Um, and in our studies, very few of the properties where this would apply have an R zone property adjacent to a commercial or employment land property across a laneway. Uh, there are certainly conditions where that happens, and right now people's houses back onto them. So uh, we don't see it causing any adverse effects. I think it's also important to note that this is an incremental strategy. I feel like we ha can have a lot of confidence in staff to, that, and the slowness of how these houses get built to iterate and to adjust in situations that maybe aren't perfect. So those kinds of questions could be sort of developed over time. So the other issue is guidelines, and we're apparently waiting for guidelines. So there's a piece of me thinks, why wouldn't we wait till we had guidelines? And I understand we're also doing second suite, a secondary suite review uh, under the OP. Um, somehow, I think those things should all fit together. Wouldn't that make sense? Gu guidelines for laneway suites? Along with the OP amendments for secondary suites. No, I'm going to ask staff that. Okay, and, thank uh, you. And so we, we have seen the draft guidelines for the laneway suites, and we've read the bylaws that are attached to this. Um, and in general, they look really good, and they've done a good job of addressing the sensitivities that were provided to us by Torontonians during our engagement process. Great. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker, if there are no more qu questions. One yeah. question. Often we hear about permit parking here. You may have been here this morning and you heard the gentleman talking about the developments in permit parking. Have you given some consideration to what should happen or your suggestions about a permit at each of those uh, laneway homes? Is that something that they've tackled or you've thought about at all? You mean uh, like street parking permissions for Correct. the... Correct, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the final decision on that was. There was talk of limiting street permit parking for people who build laneway suites. Um, that that's fine by us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Fletcher. Any other members with questions for the speaker? Okay, seeing none. Thank you to both our speakers. Uh, I'd like to call Michael Lafrenner. Michael, welcome. You will have five minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Michael Lafreniere. I'm an architect in the city. We've built a few, we've renovated some laneway suites, we've built new ones, and we just finished a brand new coach house in, uh, in the annex. And so we're pretty familiar with a lot of the challenges of servicing, building, permitting, committee, development charges, and on and on as, as they go. So <clears throat> I just want to say I'm very excited to see this uh, before you guys today. and I. Really hope we, we vote for it and we approve it and we move on and we keep expanding opportunities for other lot types in the city as well, right? I mean, secondary suites shouldn't necessarily be limited to a lot that has a lane. We have, we have a big city that can take advantage everywhere else. One, of, one thing I noticed is, uh, for instance, a through lot is not covered in this. So there are some houses where they, the garage you'll see will front on a street. Well, currently in this zoning, that doesn't have the permission to have a laneway suite on that lot. The law says it has to have a lane, which is totally fine, but I would say this is step number one. We passed it, we know we gotta keep moving ahead. I attended the meeting with uh, Bridget Shim and Don Chong over 15 years ago when they did that Changing Lanes book that was referenced there. And so it's been a long time coming, looking at all of these, these options. So, you know, I think, uh, Deferring doesn't feel right to me. It feels like we should vote and, and, and move on and free up other types of properties and other types of opportunities to build additional uh, intensification in the city. It's happening all around us, so allowing it to happen at this scale of property just seems like a long time coming. So I don't have any more to say on that, but I'm happy to answer any questions if, uh, 
anything comes up. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, for your remarks. Uh, Councillor Cressy, followed by Councillor McMahon. That would be Councillor Layton. I know oh, that sorry. we look the same. Oh. But. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. It's, a, it's okay. It's okay. Um, I'm just going to get some free professional advice. What's yeah. the cost per square foot to build a laneway house? It, Everyone gets out their pads and paper just to try to... I mean, I, I'll try and weasel out of that as much as I can. But oh, come on. It's not going to be cheap. It's, it's going to be difficult because you're going to have to build the foundation, figure out if we're doing basements. And there's a lot of program people want to put in these laneway suites. We've had a lot of people since this initiative has started, they've been coming to us because everyone has that need, for, and it's always a specific need. So someone has a, a, a grandmother, and some of them are going to be nanny suites. Some people want to put parking garage we've got one client who's looking at putting a car elevator so you can put a second elevator in the basement so they can free up the space for the for the laneway suite so in some instances it's going to be you know two hundred dollars a square foot and some maybe four hundred five hundred dollars a square foot and how much uh, in your experience or with this last example how much does the the cost of uh, the DC the going to the committee uh, like what does that represent in a in an actual cost for your project well on the project we've done in Admiral which is probably the the last new coach house that's been built on a virgin lot that didn't have a historic coach house the development charges were almost a hundred thousand and the approach was they met with uh, one of the lawyers here and they said you know listen pay the fee get the permits then appeal it and we'll see what happens later on. So it's up because they, they knew the development charges were artificially high because you have to you have to essentially value the lot. It, it was a long process, but in this case, I believe there's an exception for development charges. And you were maybe of adjustment pro projects another project because right now, you know, if, if someone comes into our office with a regular project, they're looking at nine months until they get their permit. In the best case scenario knowing that 95% of our projects have some element that's not going to comply with the bylaw. And I would say there's probably similar things are going to come up with these. You know, it's impossible to make a perfect bylaw, right? Yeah. Every lot's different. Every user is going to be different. So we pass this. We keep moving. And some laneway suites are going to have to go for special zoning variances. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councillor McMahon. Thank you very much. So you're saying that this, in your mind, this would be... Um, Today's policy would be uh, phase one, and that phase two, we should look at other types of secondary suites. So Absolutely. lay um, garages backing onto, uh, or face fronting onto a, an arterial road, um, uh, driveways with a garage at the end. Absolutely, yes. So uh, we need phase two, phase three. This is not enough. Well, th th there's, a, there's a limitation in the bylaw to having two houses on a lot. And every time we've had a, a historic property, there's a lot of historic properties that have two houses on a lot. And so when someone comes in and they say, they come to our office and say, we have, a house on, we have two houses on a lot, we're like jackpot, we can, we can work with that now, right? And so the first thing is knocking down this barrier that says that the only other suite can be in the basement. Right. And once you've knocked that barrier down, for instance, we've done accessory structures. You can have an accessory structure where you can have a... In, in, in other parts of the city, North York and, and whatnot, you want to have a gym in your backyard if you have a certain type of classification, you can have that gym, but no one can sleep in the gym. God forbid someone sleeps in the gym, right? So I think it's phase one of a living document and living process. And, and, so. you, and you'd like to see it pass today? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you very much for your remarks. I'd like to call Sita Ram Kalawan Singh, and following Sita will be Jennifer Hunter. Sita, welcome back. Thank you. You'll have five minutes. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to make it clear that I do support the concept of laneway suites, but the devil is in the details. And today, for example, we received for the very first time a copy of revised amendments to the zoning bylaw. And if you look, for example, if you have it, at the section 150.8.20.1 general, the first point which talks about laneway suite permitted uses, it says, despite regulation, blah, 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 a laneway suite may be used for living accommodation. If this is supposed to provide housing, why does not it say will or shall as opposed to may? So there are many, pro there, as I said, we've only seen this for the first time 
today, this is an amendment, and if there's any reason for deferring one round to get all of these things right, I think that should happen. So the question around deferral is not about we don't support or we don't like or we don't want. It has to do with some problems that are in this, the way in which it has been drafted. There are recommendations in the communications from Harvard Village, from ABC Residents Association, from um, uh, Seton Village, which provides some significant detail, which I think you need to really take a look at and tightened up so when it comes back in June, there's absolutely no difficulty in moving this forward. Because you know, my motto is more haste, less speed. If you move this forward the way it is, you're going to wind up in a situation where people are unhappy and will do the appeal process and it might be another year or two before we actually get to implementation. So I'm urging you to take the month to get this right. Um, my second points and some specific details are, for example, we've witnessed uh, in the Grange neighborhood, I'm in the, from the Grange Community Association, where people have been using Committee of Adjustment to get around a zoning bylaw. In this particular instance, the way in which I read this amendment to the zoning bylaw, there is no, uh, the floor space calculation is not included. It provides, as of right, 0.3 times area of the lot. So where does that actually get us in terms of the density and maximum density, and will that not contribute to destabilization of stable neighborhoods? So I think that there needs to be some tightening up over the floor space. Um, and uh, uh, for ex and uh, so that needs to be done. There is some comment about monitoring, and I think that the monitoring needs to happen sooner than three years, because we want to know how many are being built. We want to know as well, in addition to how many being built, we know what the impact assessment will be, and I know that may not happen until 2020, but we don't want to be in a situation where we actually want to understand what's actually going on. Um, I don't really have anything further to say. I mean, I intend to be back here in June uh, to actually comment on the uh, corrections that are made. My cover letter outlined a whole bunch of uh, issues um, that I think need to be need to be principles which govern this. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, don't go anywhere. You have questions from Councillor Mahevic. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, coming and presenting. Um, so one of one of the issues that you've identified is uh, density calculation. So right. right now it's an accessory unit. It's not counted in the density calculation for committee of adjustment purposes. I'll just finish the question. Uh, and if you do it. So let's say you add on, I don't know, whatever it is, uh, say 300, say 500 square feet in, into the back onto your garage. You're saying that if later on the house wants to put on a third floor, that that size of that garage might need to be calculated in the density consideration for them putting on a third floor. You mean of the main house? Of the main house, yeah. Uh, we run into situations like this before where because of definitions of gross floor area and so on, people have actually been granted approvals which are way in excess of the uh, permitted density. So the way in which I'm reading some of this, and it seems to me that increasingly zoning and density has no meaning in the planning regime currently in the city. So, so I'm a little bit concerned about that. Any you? other big areas, like big things that strike you? as an experienced um, neighborhood person that we need to look at? Uh, I'm really concerned about the destabilization of neighborhoods. Um, and the other comment I would make is that even though this is only limited to streets which are residential, lanes, are, I think that there are examples 
where there is commercial and residential on the other side, there's one that I know of in my neighborhood, where, which is coming forward. And I think it's entirely appropriate to take a look at some commercial strips, maybe not as part of this exercise, but in some other, some other exercise. Um, but, you know, uh, I would really urge a detailed review of the recommendations from Seaton Village, from ABC residents, and contrary to what somebody said earlier about residents associations not having any place in this debate, I disagree with that because we do have ongoing detailed conversations all the time with members of our association, and they actually count upon us to feed that and bring it forward. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sita. Your next uh, set of questions is coming from Councillor Davis, followed by Councillor McMahon. Yeah. Uh, and I will ask this of staff. You didn't comment on it, but... Um, Councillor, can I ask if, you to speak into your microphone? Sorry, if, if these are as of right um, buildings, um, we may see uh, the loss of more trees, or at least I worry about what the impact will be on trees. Um, I wonder if you've looked at that. Well, oh, well, I know that the other residence groups have looked at it in great detail, and the kind of minimum distances from the main house the main building, and yes. so on actually, I think, creates stress upon the amount of green space that would be available. And in downtown neighborhoods, such as the one that I live in, which we are under, there's limited amount of green space and so on and so forth, you don't want to have every single little bit of backyard, even if it's, you know, half of it, you, you want to make sure there's sufficient space, green space for trees, for drainage, and so on and so forth. Yes, and I should have mentioned uh, green issues. Mm -hmm. Because right now, as of right, trees disappear all the time during redevelopments. Right. Mm -hmm. Re as of right developments, yep. they, they, it trumps our tree bylaw. Um, so, I mean, I know many, this will be mostly on existing garages, but um, it may not be. Yeah. There may it's, be a whole bunch of new ones that where trees exist, and if it's as of right, um, we could lose what few trees uh, we have. One part of the draft the zoning bylaw I was looking at has some examples of the percentage levels, you know, 25%, 35% about the amount. Anyway, I think that needs to be refined a little bit. Okay, thank you. Councillor. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, Councillor McMahon, questions. Thank you very much. So, um, Sita, you're, thanks for coming down. Um, your residents association has some concerns, as you said, and a couple other ones. And have you heard and read about the other residents associations who don't have concerns and they think this is fantastic and we should get on with it? Yeah, yeah, I heard that. But there are other residents associations yeah. who've done extensive reviews in greater detail. And I would suggest perhaps maybe in greater detail because everybody, part of what I think the submission I've heard from everybody so far is that there are a lot of people who support this. So they support it. But I don't know to what extent they've actually taken the time to look through you know, the details and the implementation. And that's why we've taken the time to do it because we live in a very dense downtown neighborhood because we want to make this work. And I think it needs to work, but it cannot be, you know, ha move forward in a way that, uh, you know, undermines neighborhoods. And, and did you voice that when you came out to some of the community consultations, I believe? I went to two of them uh -huh. and I have had several email exchanges with the planner. Great. So the, he's fully aware of our right. concerns. So you're, you feel that you want to take a month and get it right, yep. and then you have other groups, Lanescape and Evergreen and, and uh, planners of the city who have feel that they have gotten it right with this. And then you have other groups like or residents, as you heard the deputant before you, who said this, is, this should be this is just scratching the surface. This should be phase one, and we need to do phase two and three. And so do you not think that there's a balance somewhere in the middle? There, there lies the sweet spot. Is your experience here when you, you know, that if you're not pleasing 
If everyone is, is not pleased, then you found the sweet spot. Uh, that may well be so, uh, but uh, I do believe that there are problems in the zoning bylaw that need to be fixed for you to achieve what it is yeah. you want to achieve, Councillor. Yeah. I mean, there's a balance. Yeah. I guess that's what I'm saying. And Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor McMahon. Councillor Bailao, please. Questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sidia. You did say that you have participated yes. in the consultation. Yeah. So. Um, you recognize that there has been an effort from city staff to meet with the residents' associations and, and actually work with some of the residents' associations that themselves have done quite a bit of work on this, correct? Mm -hmm. um, so is it, would it be possible to do this work between now and council as well, that there's a recommendation that we actually, instead of deferring it, that we actually just ask staff to between the now and council in three weeks that we continue that work that you've been doing and so many resident associations have been doing with our staff and that we acknowledge I acknowledge as well that the right has that the work has to be done right but acknowledging that there's been a lot of work being put into it and continue that work until council it's not the first time we've done that we do that all the time would that be uh, uh, acceptable well, we as residents don't have the opportunity, first of all, to address council. We will not have the opportunity if there are revisions to the official plan amendment or the draft zoning bylaw to comment on it, except by a way of communications. Um, you know, as I said fairly early on, more haste, less speed. So I'd like to take the time to get it right. So you're just, your basic message is that this is moving too fast? No, I don't think it's moving too fast. I'm, I don't think that a month will uh, jeopardize this. Okay. But moving it in three weeks would? If you don't have it right, you run the risk of appeals, which takes you a year out or two years out. Am I done? Yes, thank you very much. You did very well. <laughs> that was a lot of questions for you. Um, Jennifer Hunter, I'd like to, <laughs> sorry. On a, on a very quick point Oh, sorry, of privilege. before I call the next, sorry, if I can, if, before I call the next speaker, uh, on a point of personal privilege, I'd like to recognize Councillor Layton. So in an effort to speed up uh, some of the proceedings later in the, um, in the meeting, if there are members of the public for to, here on items TE 32.31, 32.32, 32.33, and 32.34. These are all, for your information, okay. patios in Ward 19 on College Street. Um, if you are, if you could just meet me at that back door, I'm going to try to save your time and this committee's. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor. That is uh, very efficient. Okay, so I'd like to call Jennifer Hunter. After Jennifer will be uh, Karen Gorsline. Welcome, Jennifer. Thanks. Okay, so uh, you'll have five minutes. The clock is on your left hand side. I, I just want to make it absolutely clear that if I depute today, I will have another chance if, in fact, we do come back in, in a month. That, so That's, I'll just stop the clock. Uh, yes, you will have another chance. Uh, there's a very good chance that this item is going to have to come back with a series of supplementary reports. Okay. I, I'm taking a guess into the future. I don't know for certain, uh, okay. but um, my, I think, smart money would be yes. Okay, does that make sense? If I was a betting woman, uh, yeah. yes. Um, I, I'm not a gambler myself. No. Uh, I'll, I'll start your clock now. Okay, per, can okay. I, may I approach and pass? A uh, if you can hand it to our, our clerk staff, uh, we will ha be happy to distribute that for you. You have to share. Okay, not, not a problem. This group can share. <laughs> when you're ready, five minutes. Thanks. Um, Thanks for having us, me. Uh, I'm Jennifer Hunter, I'm the chair of the Seton Village Residents Association. Uh, I do apologize because I had a, uh, a family that was that was here this morning who had to leave, um, and they, uh, they live behind a, a, a laneway house in our neighborhood um, that, that has some, some uh, problematic issues. So I'm gonna slightly shift what I'm gonna say just to, to kind of reflect some of the things that they've said to me and we've dealt with. So Seton Village is a neighborhood in Ward 20, for now, bound by Bloor, <laughs> Bloor, Bathurst, DuPont, and Christie Streets. 
there are 45 lanes in Seton Village and approximately 40 existing ancillary buildings ranging in height from one to two stories and with varying depths and other conditions on those laneways. Some are currently used as non-conforming residential suites while others are work studios. I'm not going to tell you who they are because I don't want to get them in trouble. Uh, artist lofts, storage and or other types of live, work, commercial spaces. At least two of these structures were former stables that house horses on the main floor and hay and supplies on the second. So in our neighborhood, lot size vary, but the average hovers around the 16 to 90 uh, foot range. Um, and like the rest of Toronto, home types vary. Uh, so, uh, um, some of the, uh, the anomalies in the neighborhood, wider lots at once contain abattoirs, auto mechanic shops, bakeries, and other commercial ventures, but a few of those have been converted into live workspaces off the laneways, and in your package you'll, you'll see one, uh, two of those, and, and they actually work really successfully as a laneway home. But they're, um, you, you, in the package there, the two, you, they're really similar, they're, they're brick, two-story, kind of nicely set back off the side. Um, so what I have to say is that best known for his service as White House Chief of Staff to President Richard Nixon, and for his role in events leading to the Watergate burglaries and the Watergate scandal, R.H. Haldeman famously said, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. The SVA believes Toronto can and should benefit from other cities like Vancouver's process, including their process challenges and revisions. I want to be very clear that we do support laneway housing. Absolutely we do. Like Sita said, we want to get this right the first time. We also know uh, far too much neighborhood planning already happens at the Committee of Adjustment and the OMB and now T-Lab. We have repeatedly experienced how this process pits neighbors against one another and how it results, this results in the erosion of relationships within the neighborhood. Many of our concerns with this final report have to do with the room left for interpretations, the permissions in these uh, recommended policies allow. So briefly and without refinement, our specific concerns include the as of right permissions. Uh, we think the streamlined process is, is, is great, but there are some uh, good and problematic aspects to this. Uh, we believe uh, existing buildings uh, sorry, that existing buildings will be exempt and can simply be approved regardless of their size, massing, GFA and FSI. We believe the density of the uh, AD, the accessory uh, dwelling, should be included, not excluded. Uh, we also believe that NEF GFA, what happens, you'll see in the package, one of the last, uh, the last pieces in the package is a house that was, was uh, significantly developed in our neighborhood. So what's going to happen with overdevelopment of the main building or the house? Like what if it's already overdeveloped and how is that measured or considered when, when somebody goes on that lot to create a laneway dwelling? Uh, are there controls for limiting the amount of development in the main house with the laneway suite? And please note, this is not about density, it's about massing, loss of green space, the tree canopy, shadowing and privacy concerns. We also believe basement suites ought to be included in the GFA of the main building. Uh, there are, as you'll see in our package, there's a, a house, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't for privacy reasons list um, any of the addresses, but there's one at the beginning of the package that has, uh, I don't have it, you do. <laughs> um, so it's, it's at the beginning, it's, it's, a, it's a really great looking laneway house. Uh, oh, thanks. We would just put it on here, Mike will turn it on. Hey, Mike. Therefore, you're going to be out of time very soon, just okay. so you know. Okay, well, split. So if you, it's, it's this house. Jennifer, if you want to put that, if you want to put the image onto the screen, we'll just amplify that and just have the image looking, look at the image as if it was directly in front of you. There you go. Okay, and I'll just give you 30 seconds to finish your remarks. I can do that. Um, so what we see in this backyard, you know, as, as, uh, as Councillor Davis pointed out, one of the things that we're really concerned with is how certain encroachments are going to affect the backyard. And in this backyard, we have, um, AstroTurf, basement stairs, stairs leading up to the uh, suites of the main building. So, so 
agreeing with Sita, uh, Ram Kalawan Singh, uh, and, and other residents associations, we're not saying no. We're asking to, to really, really consider the details. Okay, thank you very much. Are there questions for the speaker? Uh, Councillor Davis, go ahead. I just want to understand. So your position is the GFA should include the second suite? We, we think that the GFA of the accessory dwelling of the, the suite ought to be ought to be considered. Like it should it should be uh, it, it, the as of right permissions without the GFA could be problematic depending on the size of the lot. And and those and some of the where we think we see the loopholes is uh, is with some of the setbacks. Can you show us some of the other pictures that you were using to make whatever points? These Councillor, is your microphone on? Yes, oh. my microphone is on. Thank you. So, would it help if I showed you one that's great? Sure. Okay. I know you you did a lot of work to prepare these, and they're not they weren't. That's okay. You're Have not the all image, seeing them. Look at the image facing you. Turn it I apologize. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So. This is, uh, wouldn't we all love this? Um, this, is, uh, this is one of the staple conversions, uh, and I did get permission, so uh, not that I'm that nosy, but um, this is one where uh, that the, it, the, the, you see the rear of the dwelling, uh, and then, uh, but the overlook and privacy, the height is not really a concern. The setbacks from the side are pretty great. There's, there's actually access to the rear yard. I didn't take it from the, the laneway, I apologize, but um, I did, this is the house, the backyard, and you can see um, how, in this instance, the conditions are really, are, are, are very, are, are optimal, right? Um, same way with the, uh, with the walkthrough to the backyard. It's got all of the, it, it, this is sort of like, to, to me, this seems like the best case scenario for, for supporting laneway suites. And then you've got other instances, and there's another one just like that. And then you have other instances where something like this, where uh, this is an existing, this structure is actually larger than the main house. And this is the backyard I took from the fence, because. That's the one you showed us before with oh, all the... Oh, no, this is, a, this is the third example. So this is one where there's no access... There's no access from the lane to the rear yard. Uh, and there is... Uh, there's a number of... Uh, the house is smaller than the laneway house. Uh, and there's a number of... I mean, look at... There's a lot of trees because the house north... This is a, an east-west facing house. So you can see the house to the north is significantly developed. Um, so they do have, I, I don't hope that's not a dead tree, but um, it's a tree nonetheless, and the cedars help to, to create the privacy. But whether this is good, bad, or indifferent, it's just, it's an existing, it's an existing condition. That's all we really wanted to, to be able to show you. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you, you very much. Um, are there any other members with questions of uh, the speaker? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much, Jennifer. I'd thank like you. to thank you. I'd like to care, uh, call uh, Karen Gore's line. Uh, following Karen's deputation, hi, Karen, welcome back, uh, will be Glenn Smith, just to prepare you. Oh, you're going together. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Karen and Glenn, are you splitting your time or are you just combining them? Five and five. Okay, so have a seat and uh, I'll start your clock. We'll let it run for 10 minutes. Do I have to do anything with the microphone? Uh, sorry, just uh, hit the button so the light is on. If the light's on, it means your, but, uh, your microphone is hot, ready okay. to go. Okay, thank you very much. I always get confused. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here and speak with you. Uh, Glenn and I are from the ABCRA. Uh, Karen, if you can just hold on. Um, if I can ask uh, all the uh, extra chatter in the room, just come to a, just, uh, just drop it a little bit. We want to be able to hear members of the public. Um, we're going to try that again. We're going to Okay, go ahead. I'm going to start restart. You started it. Okay, thank you. Uh, appreciate that. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Glenn and I are from the ABCRA, which uh, is a residents association, um, and we're not here to speak whether laneway houses are good or bad. 
Uh, we're really here to talk about the submission, uh, the report, and on the specific details. Um, and uh, we'll be speaking uh, to our outstanding concerns after having gone through the consultation process. So I just wanted to set that context uh, before we start. We have done a submission. Um, there are two, there's some policy uh, concerns we have. In terms of the provincial policy, we really would hope that Toronto would express and respond to provincial requirements in ways that are both consistent with provincial policy, but also make sense with our urban context and enhancements as a premier world city. Is, and, and this is anticipated in the provincial policy itself and the Golden Horseshoe policy. Um, the other thing is uh, we are concerned that the neighborhood uh, policies in the official plan, policies two, three, and four, um, and also uh, are acknowledged and confirmed to apply to laneway houses, even though they don't specifically in those policies recommend speak to laneway houses as being a possibility. We want those same provisions to carry over and apply. Uh, the, second, the other thing is we want secondary plans and site-specific policy and obviously heritage districts to have standing with respect to um, uh, these and not be overridden by the provisions of the laneway houses. Um, so, and then um, um, the other thing is, so from that point of view, what we would be looking for is assurances in those regards and also assurances or amendment to the OPA 403 to make sure that this is absolutely clear, that this is subordinate to those other policies. Uh, so that's uh, sort of our, our, our one point. Um, also, and when we look at the downtown plan, we look at the description of laneways. And one thing we do know is that there's different kinds of laneways, sizes, shapes, dead end, curves, commercial backing, uh, and the thing is we to ask all laneways to do everything may be a stretch, so what we are saying is we think that laneways should be looked and considered into their, in terms of their own individual appropriate use. There may be some that can support all, all uses, there may be some that can only support a few uses, and we do elaborate on that in terms of, of that particular point, in terms of you could have food carts and little re, uh, retail carts and others you can barely get through a car th through, maybe you have a laneway house, but maybe you can't take bikes. So there's, you know, there's a number of things to be taken into consideration with that. Um, and then, uh, so, fine, so that just is from the policy context, wanting to know that those securities and perfections and there's, uh, uh, those protections and there's full clarity on which takes precedence is, is up, up front. Um, why are our neighborhoods important? Uh, we often hear that them referred to as the lungs of the city, but we think they're much more. We think they, we already provide a diverse a range. If you go walking down the streets of our neighborhoods, they're encircled by large buildings, and they're in the context of very high density in some cases. They're a respite. If you walk through one, you sort of, you, you feel like you're in a different era, a different place, a snapshot of the historical periods, and they're a differentiation for the city of Toronto. Uh, so from that point of view, that's uh, uh, some of our specifics in terms of a policy context. In terms of broad issues, we have concerns about accountability and balance. Once uh, lane ray, uh, laneways are, laneway houses are as of right, some owner is conferred with rights and benefits and those come from another owner adjacent to them. And so um, many, uh, so right now people would have access to being aware of a structure usually and, a, and be able to look at CO committee of adjustment. Uh, many properties are not even aware, um, but, and it's unclear how they will respond and whether, to what extent they will call you when someone starts building in the neighborhood. Uh, the other thing is if someone wants to build an, a, an addition to an existing house, uh, they would have to go through the full process. Uh, there's another point in terms of what benefits are given to individual laneway houses and are those applicable to other people doing affordable housing or in the neighborhoods uh, in the mixed use uh, level three and four. Um, so there's a number of things along that line uh, that are um, uh, outlined. I think one of the key things is uh, similar to the toothpaste is it's a lot easier to grow it and build it than to t try to mitigate three years later and try to, you can't do a take back. Affordability, we've talked about that in terms of, I've heard conversations on that. It, uh, the question is whether you feel that this is affordable and whether the pilot is appropriate. Uh, accessibility, we, we feel that it's a, a missed opportunity not to be more aggressive on the accessibility. 
And finally, in conclusion, uh, we feel that and, uh, uh, open uh, streets and service and privacy and overlook have not really been well uh, supported, in particular the privacy and overlook, which was the main, one of the main reasons it wasn't allowed before. And there's a few other things in my submission, but it's now Glenn's turn. <laughs> Okay, and I'm here to address specifics that are, in, that are in the draft guidelines right now in the bylaw proposals. There seems to be a pressure to move on without actually discussing specifics, and I'm kind of concerned that in a lot of the meetings, including the meetings and the consultations, a lot of specifics have not been discussed. Our goal in part is, if this gets implemented, and when this gets implemented, is to make certain it's done right. Um, it was argued that, you know, this initiative and initiatives like it can provide opportunities for people to live in ground-related housing and for residents to live close to where they work, shop, and play. However, the current official plan amendment and zoning amendment proposal is limited to the implementation area of TEYCC and not being implemented citywide, and it's not being considered for implementation citywide. The current official plan amendment and zoning amendment proposal also does not address garden and backyard units on properties with no lane access where there may indeed be significant width and depth on properties. These ignored opportunities have eliminated a wide range of properties and neighbourhoods from offering the benefits that the initiative was intended to bring to the city. It's led to the consideration of building secondary housing on lots as narrow as three metres in width while disregarding intensification opportunities on much wider properties merely because those properties don't back onto laneways. A study of other jurisdictions show that neighbor cities such as Vancouver and Ottawa, backyards on properties that do not back onto laneways are often ideal properties to secondary suite development. And those cities have implemented the program simultaneously and looked at this as a combined effort for intensification, not for laneways now, backyards later, but as a city as a whole. Um, I'd argue the current proposals provide a single-minded attempt to shoehorn suites into narrow lanes and properties while ignoring greater and other intensification opportunities. A um, couple of issues I want to address. One is overlook. The focus on laneway only secondary suites and the narrow lots in which they can be permitted has led to potential privacy and low overlook issues. The proposal at present allows for as of right permission to build secondary suites of up to six meters. If these units are indeed meant to be subordinate to the main building on a lot, the maximum height should not be allowed to exceed the height of the main building on the property. If this main building is a bungalow, a six meter secondary unit may become the dominant structure on the property. When we permit six meters, which is 20 feet high for, for those of us who are not metric oriented, when we prevent six meters to be built as of right, we're also potentially adding substantial shadow and overlook on neighboring, neighboring yards and when we, build on the, when we do build on the narrowest of possible lots. A six meter or 20 foot tall secondary unit can have major overlook impacts on neighboring properties. Um, according to the planning amendment, uh, second floor window and fenestration guidelines cannot be enforced. Thus the allowance of six meters as of right should be reconsidered. Uh, we, uh, we propose that single story units of four meters should be permitted, could be permitted as of right, and that two story six meter units should be subjected to review based on their impact on neighboring properties. I also know that second floor dormers are permitted in the proposed planning and zoning amendments, and these dormers can present significant overlook from second floor suites if they're allowed as of right. The proposed amendments also lead to substantial reduction in open yard space in many neighborhoods. A five meter minimum setback has been amended today to four meters in the bylaw plan, uh, setback from the main house, which means a one story suite can promote shrinking of the backyard sizes in some neighborhoods, can reduce a seven meter deep yard by 30%, and for the new guidelines, by up to 40% shrinkage of yard. Even a four meter high secondary unit will cause light sun issues with neighbors who want to maintain a yard. 13 feet is an imposing height. Uh, we suggest a 7.5 meter, 7 meter setback as a minimum for all suites. The proposal also allows for roof canopies to be, and awnings to facing the backyard to be up to 2.5 meter, 2 meters in length. This means yards can be as small as two meters, green spaces not covered by canopies. We don't think two meter deep lots, open spaces, should be acceptable. When you're out of time, your final thought? Um, 
the one thing I didn't talk about was uh, how traffic may impact the laneway. For example, no matter what we say, deliveries, services, taxis, Ubers, grocery deliveries will be through the laneway, not through the front of the house, front property of the house. It just doesn't make sense. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions for the uh, for both the speakers, uh, Councillor Davis, Councillor Fletcher? Mm. I just want to ask for you to repeat again the how you came up with two square two meters could be. Uh, the yard size? What's left over in terms of the yard size, that's if you take into consideration canopies. Yeah, right now, the guidelines as of this morning, because we only saw them when we got them this morning, the revised amendment suggests that the space between the original house and the unit, the new unit, can be as little as four meters. Bay Up, I don't want to talk about that. Uh, four, four meters. The secondary unit is allowed to have a deck with a canopy, root, and it's also called roof or canopy of up right. to 2.5 meters or 50% of that yard space. So if we have a four meter... percent of the yard space. So if we have a... F whatever's the smaller. If we have a four meter yard space, mm -hmm. we're then allowed to cover two meters of that with a canopy for a deck on one of the units. And that deck could be four meters high, causing shadow on neighborhood properties and basically allowing two meters of yard space if the actual house it's backing on doesn't already have and it's amazing how those covered decks just kind of get walls and yes they, windows, they, they just show uh, up a year or two six later six months yes. later yeah so so okay. what, I, what I'm saying is today basically when we take a look at these rules I don't think people have really taken a thought of saying what's this going to look like in the real world let's go to some properties let's go to a range of neighborhoods and actually look at this and measure this so one of the first things I did was go out and measure my garage my carport uh, my carport's taller than I wanted it to be. You know how you get designs and you just tell the designer, yeah, it's approved, go ahead and do it. Well, my, 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 uh, my garage is only three meters high. And when it was built, I was, and it's actually taller than most of my neighbor's garages. When it was built, I was surprised on how much sunlight I lost in all but the peak of summer in my yard. I would have liked my garage to be shorter. Now it would cost me a small fortune to lower it. But I lost a lot of sunlight with a three meter high garage. And we're saying, um, we're going to allow four meters as of right, and it can be four meters away from a house. Mm -hmm. That strikes me as a not great way to add lungs to the city. I'm not opposed to this process in general. As, as I started my, my discussion, I, I said very much that we should be looking at all kinds of properties, not just lean abutting properties, because there's great opportunities to build. But I don't think we should be focusing as step one on the narrowest possible properties properties as narrow as three meters in width right. to be building secondary suites well, we before we look at how people who have you on that, really right. large yards. Yes, so um, of course if you you could use a narrow uh, very small property and get this extra density um, just because you're on a lane but you don't even have to use the lane you can use the front whereas there could be much larger properties no. Pardon me. I wasn't sure that was a question. I oh, was just asking uh, if it was. You well, maybe if you'd listened longer, okay. I would have okay. gotten to it. Sure. So, if, it is possible then that you could ha be using some of the poorer candidates, for lack of a better word, small yards, um, and giving them permissions that would have excessive coverage, whereas be only because they have a laneway. Yes. Whereas there might be other properties, bigger, more appropriate. Yes, where, where that the impact are not of the on secondary a, suite would not be significant. That are not on a laneway, but would be much more appropriate because they have larger lots. This, this to me is a one-size-fits-all solution that tries to shoehorn units into anywhere you can possibly get one in. And also, when you look at other jurisdictions, I do not recall seeing other jurisdictions that allow for such narrow spaces to be used. Uh, the Vancouver and Ottawa uh, proposals uh, seem to suggest properties should be much wider. Now I know Toronto is very different, so we shouldn't be using their guidelines because they're not implementable, but we can learn from them and why start with the narrowest possible properties, the first go round as a test, when we can, ex we can at least explore maybe three meters isn't the right width, maybe four meters from the house isn't ideal, or maybe it changes by neighborhoods. There are some neighborhoods 
where people don't have yards already. So building a, you know, replacing a garage with a secondary suite may be fine. But there's other, other neighborhoods where there's seven meter or eight meter deep yard, yard space plus garages. And why should we allow some reduction of space in yards because of, because of these guidelines? Now I realize this is all puzzle pieces you have to build into a property, so I may be suggesting a worst case scenario. But I do see, if I was to apply it to my yard, I could reduce my own yard by about six or eight feet right now, legally, according to the guidelines. Um, and that doesn't even get into the issues like how wide the lane is and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Councillor Davis, Councillor Fletcher. I, I just uh, wondered, and I missed that, where your residence association is located and the nature of those homes. It sounds like you have tiny lots where you are. Well, we, <laughs> we have a mix. Uh, ABC is bounded in the south by Bloor Street, on the north by the CPR tracks, and we're between Avenue and Young. So we're all of the Yorkville, Hazleton, all the, all the high intensity development along Yorkville um, at, at the CPR. We have three neighborhoods. We have uh, the, uh, I can't remember the names, uh, the Ramsden, which is north of Ramsden Park. We have Asquith uh, and Yorkville. Yeah, and some, and so of, our, are some of our streets have very narrow properties and some of our streets have fairly wide properties. And our laneways are extremely lane, dead end and sharp curved. We have mirrors. Because it's a very old part of the city. Mm -hmm. So well, I'm hearing one of your concerns is just the um, size of the lots. And I also heard you mentioned something about the width of the laneways. Are your laneways fairly wide or narrow? Very narrow. Very narrow. I, mer I measured one at 9.6 feet. So you're suggesting As that to within the, if you can, thank you. Pardon? I'm just, you're suggesting that in this report, we should be considering the nature, size of the laneway and that, ex are you suggesting we would exclude a certain width of laneway from this or certain lot width based on the impact of being so close and losing sunlight, which I've heard you talk about? Let or me speak. Do you feel that's been looked at? Let me ask you this. Do you feel that's been considered enough in what's before us today? Did Let me speak to one piece and then I'll pass it over to Glenn. In terms of the laneway, um, the city rec looks at five meter wide laneways. Um, if uh, laneway houses would be going in, the, we would have to factor in ex the expansion of the size of the laneway, not necessarily immediately, but permit that in addition to any setback for the for landscaping or bicycle parking or whatever. So we would want to have that factored in as part of it and maybe- but I guess, I guess that, that, sorry. sorry, that said right now, the plan does not allocate to have minimum five meter wide lanes plus setback for the units. There's just a total setback number from the lane, no matter how narrow the lane is. So I'm, I'm just gonna go after my question. Was that something, obviously you've had these conversations as part of your consultation, yeah. correct? Yes. Do you feel that your concerns are reflected here today in what's in front of us or that that's something that we need to do a little bit more work on to look after some of the situations you're describing to us today and I think probably are in some of the really, really old parts of, of the City of Toronto compared to some of the newer subdivisions where the lanes may be fine? I, I've seen lanes in the city that are bigger than our street, our, our public street. Oh, you're suggesting um, I, I, that we I, I, should. Honestly, that what you're suge I'm just suggesting to clear up need, what you're asking us for here. I'm suggesting we need to do some more work to look at appropriate uses. Yes. Thank, and width of laneways width, uh, and width of lots uh, to be factored into some of the conversations. Yes. Is yes. that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, thank All you. Right. I just wanted to be really clear. Fair. Thank you. And yes, we have brought these points up before. Yes, but now you're talking to us. Exactly. So thank you very much. I want to be clear much. what you're thank asking. You. And thank you for your question and making us be clear. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Councillor, for the questions. Anyone else? Oh. Okay, seeing none, thank you very much for the residents, uh, for their deputation. Um, technically on the list uh, next is Mike Collins, but I believe that there's been an arrangement to allow Michelle Sanaya to speak first because Michelle has to leave. Um, Michelle Sanaya, are you here still? Oh. You're still here, so uh, let's get you in here. And Michelle, you have five minutes when you're ready. All right, thanks so much everyone for jiggling around the schedule. I know that that can be hard sometimes. Um, my name is Michelle Sanaya. I'm co-founder and executive director of um, the Laneway Project, 
we're um, a not-for-profit planning and placemaking organization, and, and we're focused on unlocking the potential of Toronto's laneways as complete public spaces um, that are fully integrated into the public realm of the city. Um, so I'm here to speak specifically sort of to that angle. Um, and we do that through um, demonstration projects, through um, planning policy impro improvements, and also through the development of public planning resources. Um, so over the last three and a half years, we've worked with local communities um, to improve laneways in more than 25 neighbourhoods throughout the city, running sort of the length and breadth of that laneway network. Um, and, and we do this because, um, and you know, as we've heard from various people today, and I'm sure through some of the other, the other items that, that you're considering, um, we know that neighbourhoods with a range of tools and options um, which can help them to tailor growth to their particular context, um, are more able to grow as unique and livable communities. Um, and, you know, a livable community to us is one that has, along with, you know, as we've heard today, a diversity of high-quality housing options, um, also a diversity of high-quality public spaces available near to where people live. Um, so it's noted sort of variously in the Toronto Complete Streets Guidelines, the upcoming Public Realm Amendment to the official plan, um, and the upcoming TO Core um, proposed downtown plan, that laneways in particular um, are well placed to, to augment the city's pedestrian network by providing additional safe and accessible walking routes, and that where possible they should be designed with consideration for safe, accessible and comfortable pedestrian and cyclist movement. And then focusing on residential laneways in particular, um, it's noted that they have the opportunity to become attractive public spaces that support informal play and social interaction for surrounding residents. And sort of the reason that this is relevant to today's discussion is that laneway suites can really help to unlock um, this potential. Um, inherent in our city's laneways as safe and appealing public spaces um, and routes by activating them with, you know, routine everyday use, passive surveillance, um, and also de design features um, like lighting and greening um, to improve the attractiveness and also the public space amenity of those laneways and their usefulness to local residents. Um, so I guess that, that's sort of it in a nutshell. I like to keep it short and sweet. Um, but, but I'm here um, to strongly recommend that the Toronto and East York Community Council adopt the proposed um, OP and zoning amendments um, to help to, to add this tool to the toolkit that the city has to work with. Um, and, to, and to help to unlock the potential of our laneways to help, to help us as we grow to foster sort of sensitive growth and a vibrant public realm in our neighbourhoods. Thanks. Michelle, thank you very much for your remarks. Are there any questions for the speaker? Okay, seeing none, thank you. I'd like to call Mike Collin Williams, Collins Williams, Ontario Home Builders Association. Mike, welcome. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Mike Collins Williams, and I'm the Director of Policy for the Ontario Home Builders Association, and I'm also a registered professional planner. OHBA represents 4,000 member companies organized into a network of 29 local associations across Ontario, with our largest here in Toronto known as BUILD. I am pleased to be here today to speak about gentle density and laneway housing. A couple of years ago, through the GTA Housing Action Lab, the Ontario Home Builders Association partnered with the Pembina Institute to produce a joint report. I have copies here that I'd be pleased to leave behind, make way for Laneway. Um, this was a unique partnership, as you don't often get a development industry uh, partnering with an environmental organization. But I think in this particular case, the public policy rationale to support laneway housing is simply so strong that it makes perfect sense for a wide variety of stakeholder organizations such as home builders associations and clean energy environmental think tanks to work together. We received a number of endorsements and positive media about laneways following the report. In the brief time I do have, I'm going to hit on a couple highlights of the report. We are in short supply of affordable housing and walkable, amenity-rich urban neighbourhoods close to rapid transit. These desirable residential streets are comprised mostly of detached and semi-detached houses with purchase prices and rental rates beyond the reach of most residents. People often see a binary choice of single-family versus high-rise condos. 
but there's a whole other universe of housing options planners often refer to as the missing middle. Today, I want to address a specific segment of that, the so-called small-scale housing options. The old city of Toronto and East York has a huge opportunity to promote and increase the supply of what planners call gentle density. This means providing more housing supply in established neighbourhoods without changing the look, feel or character of these communities. As a housing solution, laneway housing creates invisible density. You don't actually alter the look and feel of these existing neighbourhood streets by adding housing to underutilized laneways tucked in behind existing homes. And these established communities in Toronto and East York are typically in transit efficient neighbourhoods, which contrast sharply with much of the rest of the GTA. Laneway is an innovative public policy opportunity for established and typically very expensive transit efficient neighbourhoods. The latest census data actually shows that many established so-called stable hoods, neighbourhoods are anything but stable. Back in the 1960s and 70s, a lot of these neighbourhoods actually had higher populations. Families typically had more children and a lot of our older housing stock was split up with more secondary suites and ancillary apartments. Through demographic changes where families are having less kids, an ageing population and through the slow but steady process of gentrification, the fact is that some of our most well-connected transit accessible neighbourhoods are actually declining in population. One way to address this is through innovative small-scale housing options such as secondary suites, small-scale infill and laneway housing. I'd also like to point out for home believers that small housing options are typically more affordable for people to rent than entire homes or condo units even in purpose-built rental units, buildings. This is a great way to very slightly increase densities near transit and offer more ground-oriented housing, as not everybody wants to rent in a high-rise tower. In the time I have left, let me quickly just mention some benefits. It reduces car dependence by locating more housing near transit and amenities. Laneway housing will help retail on our main streets. As I mentioned before, some of these neighbourhoods have declined in population over the last couple of decades, and we can support local retail with local population. Laneway housing can help cover the primary lot owner's mortgage. We've seen it with secondary suites and hopefully soon with laneways that in an expensive city like Toronto, a secondary source of rental income will actually help with affordability for the primary homeowner. Laneway and other small-scale housing options will provide local ridership and support local transit. And finally, of course, we need to keep providing housing supply and ground-oriented housing options um, as this will ultimately reduce pressure for urban expansion in the suburbs. I'll close by mentioning some other jurisdictions. Vancouver's zone, uh, zoning allows for laneways behind most, almost all singles, limited to um, one and a half storeys, 500 to 900 square feet. California's Bill 1866 requires local government to consider second unit applications and promote accessory units in existing and future single family lots. Seattle has made accessory dwelling units legal through a permit process. The city has removed parking and ownership requirements and other barriers such as height, setbacks, max square footage and min lot size requirements. So we aren't alone in Toronto in exploring this. There are other North American jurisdictions doing this as well. So thank you for listening to my presentation uh, and I'm hopeful that um, you'll adopt and move forward with, uh, with this package. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions, and as noted earlier, I did bring copies of the joint OHBA Pembina Institute report, Make Way for Laneway, which I'll leave behind. Great. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the speaker? Seeing none, thank you for that very thorough presentation. Um, your, our next speaker is Sarah Klimahega. Uh, Sarah, are you still here? I saw her earlier today. Actually, my name is Deborah Mesher. She, uh, Sarah uh, Kleinman-Hager had to leave and she asked me to read her deputation aloud on her behalf. I think that would be permitted. Uh, you'll have five minutes. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to voice my support for the Laneway Suite final report. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't stay to give it in person. I would like to state my strong support for this official plan and zoning amendment that would allow Laneway Suites as of right in Toronto and East York. I support this for two reasons. First, I have neighbours around my home that are interested in laneway suites and I'd be very happy for them to convert their sheds to a laneway house. I myself have a garage that is mostly unused that I'd be happy to create as housing one day in the future for my children should they wish to stay in Toronto, assuming they want to live in their mom's backyard. 
The laneway in my backyard is an untended litter strewn space. I believe with laneway housing, the laneway would be safer and more vibrant, so I say yes in my backyard to laneway housing. I also support laneway houses for Toronto East York and hope to see them widely used as one of the housing solutions in the rest of the city. It's the type of gentle density increase that has big potential for both providing additional housing and for making our laneways attractive, cared for spaces. I appreciate the hard work of the staff and all involved in the creation of this report. I fully support the adoption of the staff report and look forward to it being passed both here and later on council and hope you'll move ahead with this important and promising initiative. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions for the speaker? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Leah Maston. Leah, welcome. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Leah Maston, and I'm an architect and the owner of Firma Architecture. My uh, architectural practice is focused on laneway buildings, and I have been since 2011 really dedicated to designing laneway buildings. And because of the city's initiatives recently to promote laneway housing, I've been approached by about 100 Torontonians that are interested in building laneway homes. So what that's given me is a sense of um, what is um, what people are looking for, what people are needing and wanting in, in laneway houses. And before I begin, I'd like to say that the progress the city has made in reconsidering laneways has been remarkable from the consultations and studies by Lanescape to the campaign by councillors McMahon and Bailao to move the issue forward in council to the final reports by the Urban Planning Department. And I very much support the current proposal for laneway suites. However, I'm asking for uh, amendments to two items. So we're gonna look at those two items on slides. Um, and they're both regarding the design uh, criteria that's stated in the, the current proposal. So the first one is about the 45 degree angular plane restriction. So this is a slide of the 40, 45 degree angular plane restriction and what that means in terms of interior space. Um, that can mean the, the equivalent of a bedroom, like cutting out that area because you can't walk under, it's not like you can't, if it, it's too, the, root, the ceiling level is too low to walk, walk under. Um, it also, and an extra bedroom can mean an extra, housing an extra person in a laneway house. So this is one reason why we think you should consider not including the angular plane. Another issue that, that comes up with the angular plane restriction is um, that it makes construction more complex because there are two types of roofs, a flat roof and a sloped roof. And what that means is you need two kinds of roofers. It makes construction more complex and that can add costs to building a laneway house. Now we realize that the, the angular plane is a result of a shadow study um, and that in terms of the lost space, uh, there's a proposal to make the laneway suite larger, but that doesn't actually apply to most sites. So um, what we would be asking for is to omit the angular plane requirement, which would allow a greater number of people to be housed by laneway houses, and um, it would make construction more efficient and affordable. Um, my second point is about the enjoyment of laneway suites. So this one is, is gonna be about roof terraces. Um, we think that roof terraces are one of the great advantages of, of the, that you can design in, in a laneway suite and that they should be allowed as of right. Um, this is, an, it, it adds additional green space. Um, and if you have a flat roof on a building, why not use it as a garden? I think that's something that people really desire in, in laneway suites and it should be considered part of good laneway suite design. Um, there's a concern about overlooking neighbors that that issue can be mitigated by setting back the guardrails on the roof garden. Um, and regarding these two points, we created a petition um, that was based on the March 29th changing lanes document. Um, there was also a third point on basements, but that's already been integrated, so we're happy about that. Our petition has over 270 signatures. So the signatures that you see in the petition are people who've been involved in the laneway 
um, in the laneway debate since since the beginning. Um, they are laneway advocates like Effie Carson. They're respected architects like Bridget Shim and Howard Sutcliffe. They're journalists like Jeremy Freed. They're people that have built laneway homes like Rochelle Rubenstein. They're people that would like to build uh, laneway homes like Henry Fletcher. Um, there are 273 people that have uh, also kind of concur on these, these issues uh, that relate to good laneway building design. So in summary, um, we'd like to say that we support laneway suites, um, but we'd recommend not cutting into the buildings with the angular, angular plane setback and also allowing uh, rooftop gardens. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. Are there any questions for the speaker? Seeing none, thank you. Our next speaker is Sue Dexter. Sue, welcome. Thank you kindly. So the first thing I'd like to do is to reassure the councillors who have, uh, have brought this change into our purview that we want a good policy that's right and that laneway suites should occur as a result of it. We, do, we don't have a problem. We have a problem with rush. We want to get it right. So here's, here's the, kind of, the kind of thing that we've been facing this morning. We got a, a, the, the um, most recent version uh, in which on page three we have a minimum of 60% of the distance between the rear main wall of the residential building and the front main wall of the ancillary building containing a laneway street must be for soft landscaping. This is a net loss. It's 60% now of five meters on a one-story building. It was five meters until this morning, except there was a problem raised saying there were ancillary buildings and we had to, we had to take those into account, you know, sheds and all that sort of stuff. We, we have a real problem with these kind of changes. There's another change and we, we kind of don't understand what the impact would be. We had a change, eight by eight was the original one. Then it became eight by 10 meters, 10 meters. There's no garage that I know of that's 10 meters in the city of Toronto. If you're talking garage replacement, bravo, but, but let's really sit down and talk about the consequences of this. The other thing is the exclusion of floor, plates, floor space index. The gross, listen to the, uh, laneway suite interior floor area. The interior floor area of an ancillary building containing a laneway suite must be less than the interior floor area of a residential building on a lot. By how much? By how much? A square centimeter, a meter, five meters? What are we talking about? We've always talked about the ancillary build at the laneway suite being less than the main house, but now we're talking about it can really crowd the main house. So we need standards in this to ensure that we get, we get a really good bill coming out of it. Okay, you know where I'm from. I'm the old neighborhood. Exactly, uh, Councillor Fletcher has it on the money. We got narrow lanes, we got this lane, those lanes. We're a growing area in the city of Toronto. We have more housing types than can be counted. We've got triplexes, duplexes, basement units, rooming houses. For us, a laneway suite would be a tertiary or a quaternary use, okay? I think it is, they use it in geology all the time. So we're no stranger to density and we're no enemy of density. Our objective today is to ensure the plan is clear and watertight, that the objectives the city desires are met and that the official plan's stable neighborhood policies are respected. That's not too much to ask, we don't think. We analyzed our lanes, you know all about that. 
what have we got? We've got affordable, the biggest question mark in the world over affordable units. These are the ones that are really critical. This is the, these are the folks that are really, really suffering in our town, and we have to do something about that. Thank you. Density. Why would we lose GFA? It's, it's, it's the easiest measure of infrastructure demand, including schools, hospitals, parks, parking, among others. Green space, five meters for a one-story, 7.5 meters, and you're now digging basements. So we have to look at that because the city also has policies to increase the, the, uh, the, the canopy. They're going to put the sewer and water lines through the yard into the suite. My trees share their root system with my neighbors. So you're not only impacting the unit tree, you're impacting potentially its growth, its growth uh, space on both sides. We're not against it, but let's get it right, okay? So, appeals. We're going to have appeals. Sue, I'm very sorry, but we've run out of well, time. Perhaps someone may ask Somebody you a may question. ask me a question about appeals. I'll ask a question. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Councillor Bailao, then Councillor Fragedakis. <laughs> so let me see. So, believe so you're me. Not believe against, me. Okay, we're not against it. But for right. example, yeah. one of the reasons why we need all the servicing connected to the main house is. Uh, it was key in order to get this done. That, yes. Is, yes. that is key. So if you are against that... No, no, not against. We're raising it as a concern. But how do you solve the concern? We, we put in special rules where this is how you trench, this is how you do it. Okay. On a rezoning? On an official plan amendment? It's not an official plan. We're talking as of right. I, I understand, but the guidelines can deal with stuff like that, absolutely. But, yeah, but we're talking about a zoning bylaw, an official plan amendment right now. Yeah, but we've got regulations that you're talking about. There's a zoning bylaw attached. And you think that the zoning bylaw should specify how people do the drainage to the unit? It, well, it's, if you, can't, you can't hold one good and, and create a policy that negates the good. I understand, so but is there any zoning that? in the city that talks <clears throat> about how we do a drainage to a building or a house? I have no idea. I'm raising I, it as a problem. I, 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 I understand, but I, I think we need to be straightforward. And, and when we're talking about raising problems, and I understand, and, I, and, and you've, all these residents' associations have been very helpful in, in working with the city and brought very important issues to the table. But there's, there are issues that are going to be key and that might be a point that we're going to have to agree to disagree. Well, we may right? have to, but let's, let's really so, have a good conversation about it. Can you do anything? If we're getting policy on the morning that you're discussing something, policy but, changes, regulation changes. But, but this regulation, for example, with the drainage has been day one for you, because the first condition about creating laneway housing is that it was not severable and all the servicing We're had to come from a, the main house. We have a concern and we would like to discuss it. And maybe at the end of the day, you'll say, go dig. Okay. But, but you need to, you, we need to, we have to speak for the trees. They're not, they can't speak for themselves. So it is a concern on what, what will happen. With respect, I mean, I'm, we're not saying kill it because of the trees, but boy, let's try to get that right. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Bailao. Uh, Councillor Fragedakis. Thanks, Sue, so much for coming out uh, and speaking on I just wanted to follow up on, on your question um, towards the end there about trees and servicing from the main house to the laneway suite and root system. So are you aware that the private tree bylaw, if you apply to do work on your property, the private tree bylaw does not... Damage your entry, exactly. Yes, okay, so you are aware of that. So yep. I'm just wondering, so if they can cut down the tree as of right to do the construction on their property, um, then well, it's a, it's a problem and there's wiggle room in all the policies, and, you know, in our experience dealing with C of A stuff and this, uh, the, when, when trees entry and, and death comes to council, council always says don't do it. But those ones that come to council mostly are, are ones on the... Private. Some of them are private, a lot of them are city. Yeah. Okay, so you just want clarity about 
how you get the services to the laneway suite that doesn't actually damage another um, policy that we have, which is That's to right. grow the tree canopy, not diminish it. That's right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, Questions yes, of the speakers? Yes, Seeing none, thank you, Sue. I would like to invite uh, Chris Spoke uh, to come and speak. Nice to see you again, Chris. Hello. When you're ready, you have five minutes. Sure. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Spoke, and I'm a member of Housing Matters. We are a group of Torontonians who advocate for increased housing supply to address the housing availability and affordability crisis that is pricing many renters, young people, and middle-class families out of our city. We take very seriously the common sense notion that if we want more people to live in Toronto, we're going to need to build more housing. I appreciate being granted the opportunity today to comment on the city's review of Laneway Suites and would like to start by thanking planning staff for the diligent work that went into this file. As many of you know, our rental vacancy rate at 1.1% is now the lowest it's been in 16 years. This metric, which we use as a measure of available housing units, points to a clear supply problem in Toronto. It is on that basis, and to keep this brief, that we as an organization are enthusiastic supporters of Laneway Suites. The city has estimated that we could see up to 300 laneway suites constructed in Toronto were they, were they to be allowed. And to make that a little less abstract, that's up to 300 homes for up to 300 households per year in the city. Laneway suites on their own will not solve our supply problem, but they take us in the right direction, and frankly, they're long overdue. For the sake of those 300 potential households per year, we urge you to please say yes to laneway suites and to vote in favour of adopting this package. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your deputation. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Mahevic? Yeah, I'm not familiar Councilor with McMahon. Housing Matters. Who, who's Housing Matters? So we're a group of uh, Torontonians, mostly renters, who advocate for uh, increased housing availability and affordability. So you're not for profit? Uh, agency? We're a not for profit organization, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor. Councillor McMahon? Thank you very much. And just following up on that, so your membership is at. Um, People of your generation or all generations or? All generations, it skews younger, it skews renter, um, and it skews aspiring homeowner. So you, this policy is very important to you, as you mentioned. This is very important to us as a first step and a signal that council is serious about uh, addressing the supply issue in Toronto. Right, and um, would you like us to, to um, pass it today or defer it? Pass it today, it should have been passed 100 years ago. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. Uh, our, our next speaker, and I believe maybe our final speaker, is uh, Bridget Shim. Um, she, will be no subject, she will be no stranger to this matter, but I'm not sure if she's in this room. I don't see her anymore. She must be working. Um, Bridget Shim? Okay. Um, okay, so Bridget's not in the room. Are there any, member, any other members of the public here to speak to this matter? Okay, seeing none, we're ready to bring it into Community Council for some questions of staff. Who has questions of staff? And if I can just see an indication of hands, councillors. Um, you had lots of questions for the deputants. This is your chance. Don't be shy now. Otherwise, we're going straight to motions. Okay, I'll, I'll go. How's that? How's that? I've got some questions. I haven't asked any questions as of yet. I'll just start my own clock here. Um, with respect to uh, some of the, the comments that we've heard today from the deputants, and I, I appreciate there was a range of, of opinions. Um, uh, the, the affordable housing question for me is, is, uh, is, is a very curious one because there wasn't really some clarity on the costs uh, per square foot uh, and, and including how do you ensure that there is some uh, way of obtaining even a, a modest uh, number of affordable housing. Can I ask staff to provide some, some clarity on their position on this? Uh, this is not really going to be a tool to, to bring forth a, a wide range of affordable housing options given the, uh, the very expensive uh, cost to build these single f f household dwellings. Is that correct? Through you, Madam Chair. Yes. The, we look at these as uh, an additional type of rental unit, not necessarily uh, a solution to the provision of affordable uh, rental units. Um, I believe Sean Gadden from the Affordable Housing Office uh, is here or was here and had indicated he may have uh, something to say on the matter of affordability as well, okay. unless he is no longer here. 
That's, that's okay. I think, you, I think you did answer the question, and I base, I, um, so that's very helpful for me. Uh, with respect to the uh, neighborhoods that already have um, a, a layer of, uh, of planning protection that dives into it at a more detailed level, uh, for example, secondary plans, heritage conservation districts, uh, how will this new OPA and zoning bylaw uh, amendment affect those existing documents? Uh, will those documents be a good standing? Uh, will they be um, uh, sort of uh, given a luster reading? Uh, how will these four pieces layer on top of one another? So one of the policies in the proposed official plan amendments states that any secondary plans and existing site and area specific policies will prevail over the policy that is proposed. So in areas that have policies which would preclude the construction of laneway suites because in either a secondary plan or a site and area specific policy area, they contain wording that prevents the creation of new units that for instance, do not represent the prevailing character, and if that prevailing character does not include laneway suites, then those policies would prevent the creation of laneway suites. Those policies would prevail over what is proposed today. Okay. We aren't aware of many of those, but we are certainly looking into the uh, policy that was raised uh, in the APCOR communication. Okay, so any existing document already in place and registered and recognized by the city, they will take precedent before this new uh, application on top of it. In terms of secondary plans and site and area specific policies, that is correct. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. So there are a number of technical uh, opinions out there, and I heard a wide range of it, uh, with respect to the amount of height, the angular planes, the setbacks, the stepbacks, the amount of green cover, um, how you perhaps uh, enter and uh, egress the, uh, these new suites. Um, lots of opinions out there. Um, have you considered any modeling to ensure that any concerns that are out there um, perhaps could be um, either confirmed or debunked? We have. Uh, we actually looked at several neighborhoods across the study area with different lot patterns and characteristics in the application of the, the guidelines, the zoning standards uh, that you see before you today. And uh, our urban design staff did a considerable, considerable amount of work modeling these on both an area-wide and a site-specific basis. That work informed our recommendations. And can we have access to that work? Uh, I could provide uh, that information, yes. Okay, that would be wonderful, thank you. And with respect to, um, I think every, you know, every four years our bills, our tax bills get reassessed and, uh, and sometimes we are surprised to see the, 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 how much the homes are worth. I'm a, I'm a renter so I really don't know. Um, but for those who are homeowners, uh, can I ask uh, the uh, every four year assessment, um, a, a, a new addition, let's call it an addition or, or new density, uh, measuring the quantum of five, six, seven hundred square feet and perhaps larger, uh, how, 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 how much more will the CFA um, uh, be projected into the future? Like, do, did you folks get a sense of um, how much more there will be for the, for the taxpayer and then how much more there is for the, uh, for the cost of service delivery uh, by, by way of, uh, of government services? So with regard to the assessment of the property, um, it's not something that we would typically look into with a policy uh, initiative, but we did, my understanding is that if you're constructing additional floor space, either via an addition to the house or a laneway suite, um, MPAC or the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation, which you know, would review the assessment, would consider that additional floor space uh, either on a periodic review or when the building permit was uh, was submitted and they would make their assessment on the value of that property. Uh, I, we don't have any estimates of what that would look like uh, on, in one way or another. Okay, so I've run out of time, so I respect the clock. Uh, Councillor Perks, question? Um, so first, uh, one of the deputants raised the issue of uh, yeah. it saying that it may be a residential use. My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that that allows the same kind of in-home commercial activity that are currently permitted in houses in neighborhoods like a, a home hairdressing salon, that kind of thing. Through the chair, that is uh, my understanding, yes. Okay, and would the same, there are restrictions about that in terms of what percentage of the overall building can be the business. How does that figure in here? 
That's correct. Um, the home occupation provisions are uh, similar to those that exist for the main house on a lot in the parent zoning bylaw. So this isn't allowing like a, a storefront type commercial operation. This is, I do some work at home and there's a written category that's always been there for residential and that category is the one that will be applied here. That is correct. Okay. Um, over to forestry. Uh, I was looking at the report and, you know, I was, I was listening to some of the deputants, the concerns around trees and on page 37, uh, it says city planning staff suggests the approval of the removal of any tree under the private tree bylaw continue to be at the discretion of the general manager of parks, forestry and recreation. So how will that discretion be applied? What, what will the guiding uh, ethos or principles of the general manager of parks, forestry and recreation be if someone comes in and says, I want to remove a tree in order to get my laneway house built? Maybe on the microphone. And if you could just introduce yourself, please. Um, hello, through you, Madam Chair. Um, in this, uh, the, in, in yes, my name is Vojka Melodinovic. I'm the planner with the City of Toronto Urban Forestry Policy and Planning Group. Um, <laughs> sorry, the obviously, this is my uh, first time talking here. So anyway. Um, the, the discretion of the general manager is, um, would reflect through the fact that we are not obliged to issue a, under the uh, tree protection bylaw, we are not obliged to issue a permit to injure or remove, to remove a tree if the construction is uh, uh, warranted as of right. Um, so when it comes to the laneway suits, Urban Forestry will actually review the applications and reserve the right to refuse the application to remove a tree. Um, and in those cases, the applicant would be required to revise the proposal in such a way that uh, the tree would be protected to our satisfaction. Okay, so in the event that they come to you and they say there is absolutely no way I can build this without uh, injuring or removing a tree, Will the general manager protect healthy trees? Um, in most cases, we would uh, protect, but if it's impossible to protect the tree, then we would look for compensations. Okay. All right. I think I understand better how that's going to work. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Are there any other questions? Hold, hold on. Uh, Councillor Perks, are you, have you concluded your questions? Thank you. Uh, members who are interested in, in asking questions, just indicate and I will put you on the list. And then we are going to channel it to our next speaker, which is Councillor Fragedakis. I, I may just add something to the sure. urban forestry question. Uh, just to highlight policies within the uh, proposed official plan amendment that speaks specifically to chapter 813 of the municipal code which deals with bylaw trees and uh, this actually is, is something that is raised for laneway suites or proposed to be raised for laneway suites but not for any other type of development within neighborhoods so in our view the contents of the report and the official plan amendment that is before you actually goes beyond uh, what the current requirements for development in neighborhoods are with regard to tree protection so just for context so if I could ask a follow-up then, yes. um, given that there seems to be uh, a little uncertainty around this one, uh, would it be possible to have some clarifying language provided either if this gets deferred or if this goes on to council so that we can understand that a healthy tree will not be removed to build a laneway suite? In a subsequent report, if that is requested, we could certainly provide additional information that will help clarify the practice of uh, building permit and tree permit uh, issuance or not. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Fragedakis, questions? Um, yes, thanks. I see building staff in the house and I have a question because um, this is a proposal for the Toronto and East York district. So in East York, we have um, coverage um, that we deal with um, on applications that go to the Committee of Adjustment. And I wanted to get some understanding from you and for the benefit of others in the room around how like, we treat coverage if, if laneway suites get permitted as a right. I mean, secondary suites are something that people in East York 
go to get legalized. Um, and then the accessory building, otherwise known as a garage in some instances, has a certain amount of coverage attributed to it. And the house has a certain amount of coverage attributed to it. So I'm just wondering, like, um, if they're permitted as of right, how does that, how does that work? So through you, Madam Chair, so should an application come before us, then if there is a bylaw that's permitting laneway suites, whatever the requirements or the prescriptive requirements are in the bylaw, we would apply that in reviewing building permit applications for a particular lot or a spe specific development. Should the application not comply with the performance standards in the bylaw, uh, such that it's over in the permitted coverage, uh, we would identify that as a variance, and of course then the applicant has the ability to apply to Committee of Adjustment to seek approval of that variance. If the variance is ultimately granted, that would uh, legalize it in terms of, or normalize it in terms of a zoning, and a building permit could be issued. Subsequently. So this process isn't actually going to be eliminating that aspect of the process by which people go to the Committee of Adjustment to seek variances to the um, existing bylaws that are in, in effect, in particular around East York. I realize that other people are in this if, chamber and our members of council are not councillors in that area and subject to that particular bylaw. So, so again, anybody can seek a variance to the bylaw, the, the performance standards in the bylaw, and those are going to be uh, reviewed by the Committee of Adjustment based on the four tests in the Planning Act, and I'll let my colleagues in planning speak to that. But yes, yeah, somebody can certainly apply for a variance should they not comply with the performance. Right, so what I w all I was trying to say is that we are not actually through this process eliminating that step in the attempt to make, legalize this kind of housing type. No. So in, in instances where um, a proposed laneway suite does not meet the requirements and the criteria in the proposed bylaw, then uh, the owner or the person looking to build the laneway suite could make an application, as is their right under the Planning Act, for variances to the bylaw. Uh, if an application to the building department is made that meets all of the standards in the proposed zoning bylaw amendments, then that suite could be constructed as of right without a trip to the Committee of Adjustment, as no variances would be necessary. So, so for the coverage aspects, so I mean, let's say 35% in East York uh, for the lot, if they come in and, and their garage um, is combined with the house at 35%, then they don't need to go and seek any variances at the Committee of Adjustment. They can just do it. However, if the proposal includes a, a structure that is larger than what is permitted, um, that is an accessory building at the moment, um, separate from the main house, then they would have to go to the Committee of Adjustment. No, I, I, believe, I believe the intent is that, similar to uh, the comments about density, the, the coverage would be exempted for the construction of a laneway suite. Um, I believe that is the intent of the bylaw, and I would ask my colleagues in um, the zoning team to clarify if, indeed, the, both of those provisions apply. If they do, then, then you are correct. Again, as uh, um, Mario suggested, if there are a... Uh, areas where the proposal is not in compliance with the bylaw, whether it's this bylaw or it's the parent bylaw that this is proposing to amend, they may seek variances uh, in that regard. So, sorry, you were deferring to somebody uh, else to answer your question, who I don't know who you're speaking Carolyn, to. Carolyn, um, over in the, uh, the zoning team there, my colleague Carolyn. I'll respond. It's Klaus Lehman from the zoning team. I'm the hey, manager. Close. Um, currently, that uh, exemption for lot coverage is not in the bylaw. We, we were not directed to include it. So it's not there right now. FSI has been addressed, but not lot coverage. Oh. Well, then I guess it's a good thing that we're going to be deferring this item for a month so we can speak to what do you mean, that as well. Thank you very much. Mm. Okay. Um, our next uh, councillor to question is Councillor Layton. No Thank you very much. I know that this... The, there's, there was some question as to changes that were made with the supplemental that was submitted today, and I'm wondering if we could just get that, a Cole's notes of what changes those were between the bylaw and the report, specifically around the, um, uh, the setback from the primary building, just so we get some clarity. Sorry, to confirm, the, the question was uh, a summary of the changes that were made to the zoning bill. So in... Uh, 
in my opinion, the changes that were made to the zoning bylaw were uh, largely for clarification's sake. What we tried to do was uh, respond to the, a lot of the questions that came up in the correspondence that was being received over the last few days with regard to uh, certain provisions within the bylaw. So that's why we look to change the wording, not in a substantial or material way, but in a way to clarify the intent of the report. Uh, as staff would normally do, uh, making technical or stylistic amendments before the bylaw proceeded from uh, community council to uh, council, as the case often is. So I can certainly provide a list of what those are. Um, Quickly, please. <laughs> well, there, there were a number of specific changes. The one regarding the separation distance uh, was intended to address the amount of landscaped open space that was required to be provided between the main house and the laneway suite. And the intent of the report is that that space not be diminished. The amount of space that is required to be provided in the rear yard should still be provided in that space. So what it means is a higher percentage of that area, because it's a smaller overall area, has to be landscaped open space. Uh, we can certainly take a look at the bylaw and ensure before any zoning bylaw gets to council that it implements the intent of the report, which is not to diminish uh, the requirements in the zoning bylaw to provide open space in neighborhoods, in rear yards. So, but the, with respect to the setback from the, the, between the two structures? That has not changed. That has not changed. Um, the uh, monitoring and enforcement of the hardscapes and landscaping provisions, do we have any advice to how, because right now we're doing a pretty terrible job of it. Um, I don't see how, I don't see anything to suggest that it would get any better. We have people paving over front yards not for parking pads and mm -hmm. we, we, we can't make them change. So I'm just wondering if there's any provisions that you've suggested. Well, the, the tool that we have to secure landscaped open space on a lot is, is the zoning bylaw. And if there are uh, lots which are deficient or uh, if a, a permit application comes in and it's deficient on the required landscaped open space, then uh, the building department will raise that uh, as a deficiency with the bylaw. Do you have any idea how many we actually enforced last year? Uh, personally, I do not. Yeah. Um, lighting and laneways, for laneway safety, have, have we evaluated what we can get Toronto Hydro to do to improve the, the lighting of laneways with, uh, with laneway housing? So we've met uh, several times with Toronto Hydro throughout this process. Uh, they currently provide uh, what I think they consider vehicle level lighting uh, within laneways and through the monitoring pro uh, period we're going to continue to work with them uh, to assess where the uptake is for laneway suites and whether there are any necessary improvements uh, to laneways with regard to lighting. Though at the moment um, there is nothing precluding pedestrians or cyclists from accessing uh, the laneways, but they do present an opportunity for improved lighting. But once we have more people actively using the laneways, there may be a need for us to address the safety issues that come with the amount of lighting that I would agree. Is in the, the other side is on uh, of the public safety side is sidewalks, sidewalks and laneways and laneway quality, the, the quality of the um, uh, of the pavement. Is any of that indicated in the report that that would have to get reviewed in some way and improved or upgraded in the event that? The transportation services may want to weigh in further, but the report does talk about the current service provision and maintenance of laneways and that at this time, uh, again, it, it's difficult to estimate where the uptake will be uh, of laneway suites. Uh, any specific improvements to areas related to laneway suites are not planned at this time, but as uh, they are constructed, as you said, there may be a need uh, to improve or, um, well, improve the surfacing and maybe other characteristics of lanes. Um, but I would defer to my colleagues in transportation services if they have anything further to add in that regard. Uh, if, if they don't, because I have one more question okay. for planning. Who came up with the name of the report? Uh, that was my partner, Eleanor. She has all the good ideas. Thank, El thank Eleanor very much for yet again another good name for one of your planning reports. This is not the first. Uh, well, the next West thing, uh, the cask force. Shall I go on, Greg? Y you can. <laughs> thank you very much, Councillor. Our next uh, Councillor to question is Councillor Davis. I did just want to ask again about trees. And I think I'll ask buildings if what is the relationship between the building code and our 
private tree bylaw, which has which prevails? Yeah, the private, the, sorry. Tree protection bylaws, both city and private tree bylaws, are not applicable law as listed under the Building Code Act and its associated regulations. Therefore, a building permit will be issued despite the fact that it may need that the resulting construction may injure or damage a protected tree. We do not have the ability to withhold a building permit for uh, tree protection bylaws, as they are not listed as applicable law. Having, so, said, having said that, building permits are not the only applicable approval when developing a, pro a property, and of course the owner or developer or whoever's building the project still needs to comply with any associated city bylaws that may be applicable. So but they the could get a building, be... you're saying they could get a building permit, an as of right building permit, and forestry will say no to injuring a tree and they are left with what remedy? Uh, I can't comment on what forestry will or will not say, but oh, no. I cannot. Well, I, we just, I, sorry, I if what we heard is that they would, my uh, understanding. But if my, they should not my, find a solution to redesign and avoid, which I know they do, which avoids an injury of removal, and they choose not to approve a removal or an injury, and it conflicts with you issuing a building permit, what remedy does an applicant have beyond so, so as part so as part of the building permit process, we inform applicants and educate them with respect to the private tree bylaw, give them information about the need to protect private and public trees, and ask them to work closely with forestry, in urban forestry, in terms of having a design that that does protect trees. Ultimately, however, if a building permit application complies with the zoning bylaw and applicable law, it must be issued. Forestry then can consider whether or not it will issue a permit to remove a tree or ask for some mitigating compensation such as uh, additional tree planting. Okay. This is no different. This is I no different. I understand this. This is no different than any situation when someone is building a single family dwelling or any type okay. of dwelling that complies. So it's entirely the same as what happens now and right now. There are many, many permits issued for the removal of trees in order to build. So what we're talking about is status quo, except I understand there's now some provision you're proposing to put into the official plan policy. If this has some kind of teeth, why have we not done it before? I'm, I'm not sure who that. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> well, okay. Planning to whoever put in the official plan provision there. The intent of the official plan provision was to acknowledge that we had heard concerns about the removal of mature trees in neighborhoods through the process. And in that urban forestry is one of the many divisions that are participating in the monitoring process as laneway suites you know may be constructed. We want to ensure that the policies reflect the fact that okay. city planning and urban forestry staff will work together on any changes that may be necessary to a laneway suite design to save a mature tree where possible. Okay. The policies also uh, consider that minor variance applications that allow for the saving of a tree and changing of the building envelope will be considered by staff. Okay, it's basically the same. Um, what I did want to ask you, it had to do with the comments that were made about narrow lots and with the changes um, that are proposed about setbacks, distance from the house and so on, and canopies uh, and porches on suites and leaving behind potentially two meter lots. Um, it, first of all, <laughs> that's a possibility with these zoning standards, is that correct? I don't know that I agree with the interpretation necessarily, but we'll certainly take that back and look further at uh, what the provision would mean in practice. And if I heard Last the, previ my, the previous question from Councillor Fragadakis, then the coverage provisions in the existing bylaws are still in effect, and so if the whose coverage provisions are not met, current coverage provisions not met, 
with the addition of secondary suite or laneway suite, they would not be as of right um, buildings and they would need variances. The intent of the bylaw, in my view, is we added a coverage uh, provision for laneway suites, which I think maxes out at 30% of the size of the lot. The intent of adding that provision was so that the laneway suite would not be subject to other provisions related to coverage no, in the bylaw. But it is. Law. So if that's, uh, that in my view is a clarification that would be, that could be built into the bylaw uh, before it advances. Thank you very much. Our next uh, councillor to question is Councillor Matlow. I was just sharing some of my questions with my, with my colleague. Um, I want to begin with um, tenants protection because um, I've heard some debate over um, uh, the protection of the trees and I've heard uh, uh, certainly Evergreen submission regarding public realm improvements. Uh, and I've heard the submission about the impact on affordability. But um, is it fair to say that the preponderance, if not all of these, uh, uh, these suites uh, are going to have fewer than uh, seven uh, units? They're going to have six or fewer units. And if that's so, um, is it not true that, th that these tenants who would be welcoming in to these new units would have few to no protections under the RTA. The, what the report proposes the, uh, to permit the construction of an individual rental unit on, uh, on a lot. Uh, so I believe it is correct that that one unit, if it were proposed to be removed, would not be subject to the policies, uh, the city's rental replacement policies. But if there's anything to add. Um, Maybe through a lawyer? Or? Actually, I'll Let's refer to our, one of our housing experts. Sure, yeah. Certainly. So through the chair, uh, yes, the Residential Tenancies Act speaks to protecting uh, residential complexes of five or more units, and our official plan policies speak to where there's six or more. Yeah. Yeah. So if there's, there could be, the main property may have three units and the laneway suite could, or may have five units. It, it could reach that level, but, but it's likely. most likely that it would not. So if... If the owner, that, the owner of the property says, let's say they've got a tenant and they say, we, we're, guess what, we're move, our, our, our daughter is coming back from college and we want to move her in, um, they can just boot that tenant out really whenever they want. The Residential Tenancies Act has provisions related to personal use which state that they need to compensate a tenant up to one month for one month's rent and it has to be a dependent or yeah, someone associated. So much the same as if you had a basement apartment yeah. and you wanted to move in your parent into that unit, the laneway suite would have those same provisions. Yeah, but they don't have secure tenancy. That's correct. Um, thank you. Um, I'll be moving a motion with regard to that priority when I speak later. The other question, another question I have is, um, so I think all of us agree that there is an affordability crisis in our city and that we have far too many people who can't even live in our city right now due to that fact. Um, candidly, what impact does staff believe if we move forward with the laneway housing initiative, what real impact will it have and I you know be, I've heard you know some people have said it will have no impact I'm just talking like rhetorically some people have said ah this is nothing what are you doing this is and then other people have said this is like a panacea this is one of the big answers I'm not su suggesting the champions here have said that but that's the rhetoric out there candidly what are we doing here with respect to affordability in, in your own words I don't know that permitting laneway suites will have an impact on the provision of affordable rental units within the city uh, in my view, it will have some impact on the provision of rental units generally in the city uh, as one. So it'll increase supply, but it, it won't necessarily mean that it will be affordable. I'd say that's an accurate characterization. Yes. Okay. Councillor, are you done? Okay, thank you. Okay. Actually, sorry, one other, one other thing. Um, if we're... we're where there are residents right now, like we've got different types of lanes in the 
Toronto and East York Community Council area. Uh, and there are some lanes that have more of a, for lack of a better uh, term, you know, more of a kind of a, you know, downtown urban feel with the graffiti and the, you know, uh, those kind of lanes. Uh, you guys know what I'm talking about. And, and then you've got, <laughs> and then you've got, then you've got other lanes in, in other parts of, you know, certainly in Midtown and even in, you know, Cancer Bylaws Ward and others that are sort of on the fringes of the downtown that uh, have, you know, I would even call it a buconic feel where there's like, it's, you know, some tall grass growing out the sides and it kind of feels like a rural, a rural lane. Um, has there been much discussion about sort of, about the, 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 the usage currently right now? Because some of these lanes are used as like sort of everybody's backyard in the neighborhood where kids are riding bikes and it, it, it's very low traffic and, and you know, they kind of use it as like a quasi park in a way, ball hockey, et cetera. And with more, I've heard the argument about more eyes in the street and that, that's, I think that's, that's valid. But what about the impact to people who sort of use it the way they use it today? Um, has that been considered and what have you heard and you know what I mean? Because I have had questions about that. Uh, yes, I think um, laneway suites can contribute positively to the way that communities use laneways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that of course, having more people, you know, eyes on the laneway, having more activation of the laneway uh, can be a positive thing. Certainly you referenced that um, in describing some, some lanes. Uh, I think this will contribute to that. Um, so you, and, and, and I imagine safety as well, I suppose, if there's the eyes directly on the lane. Yes. But what about the, the adverse effect that some have suggested? Is there any, do you believe there's any merit in their, in their concern or is it just a worry or is there something real there? Uh, which specific adverse effect? The one that I just described. Councilor, currently it's sort of used Councilor, your a, time is up. Well, but I, the but question let's, get, let's get the councilor an answer. Yes. Um, I, I, in my view, uh, Laneway housing will contribute positively to the environment uh, on laneway suites generally. So, I, I don't know that I necessarily agree that there are more. Okay, so you don't. You drawbacks. disagree with them. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you both. Any other members with questions for staff? We're gonna. Yes. Oh, sorry, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you. Um, I just wondered about one of the deputants. Uh, I think from Harvard Village indicated, and maybe this has been answered, but. I didn't get it quite clearly, that there were a number of changes that hadn't been anticipated or that they found when they reviewed this document, which wasn't available, wasn't available last week, was it? Was it available a week before the meeting? Let me put that to you. So the, some of the changes noted um, by the deputant from Harvard Village uh, were contained in the staff report, specifically the change of uh, proposed permitted laneway suite depth from eight to 10 meters. Uh, and a few other changes. Those were detailed in the staff report, and those changes were made following our most recent community meeting. The and uh, when document were they made public. The doc. Yes, those were made public uh, along with the report. Uh, the document that was posted last night um, was the zone was uh, some changes to the zoning bylaw that, again, in my view, were more for clarification and are not material uh, to the intent of permitting laneway suites. They were provided for clarification, really in an effort to address some of the comments we received from the so community. So you're saying that that eight to 10, eight by eight to eight by 10 was in a report that was published. I'm just interested in when. The question is when. It was on the agenda. It was on the agenda uh, when it was published. It there was, were on the agenda published last week. Okay. Correct. Um, I just want to be clear on the C of A and trees, which we've gone over and over again, and we've had a report here i would come to understand that the OMB and uh, T-Lab have jurisdiction over a tree in a planning matter. Am I correct? Final decision rests there. If it's shown on a plan, like a site plan, and they make a decision that approves yes. the building on that site plan, then yes. Correct. So if you have a building and you go to the OMB or you go to the C of A and it shows that you have to take out a tree that's a private tree, the C of A can make a decision and approve your site plan and approve the removal of any tree in the city that's on private land. Is that correct? Uh, yes, the C of A, it's the tribunal, but yes. The tribunal, yes. if you appeal it, that's correct. So there's a, the city forestry actually has limited jurisdiction when it comes to a planning matter over 
trees because the OMB and the T-Lab have the final say if it's a site plan application that's been appealed. I think I'm right on that one. Um, I just want to know about the um, issue around our laneways and we're looking at the state of good repair. So would we be, would it be right to think that if we could prioritize uh, lane ways for state of good repair, repair that would have a laneway house. So if we're gonna introduce homes, which I think is a great idea if we get this right, as one of the deputies said, I'm gonna expect that those laneways are going, to, we're gonna have some budget there to make sure that they're not living on the pothole ridden things that are all throughout my ward. Sure, that's directed to me, yes. you, Madam Chair. Um, it would be one factor that we would look at for state of good repair. Um, we know that some of our laneways aren't in great shape. Uh, but we'd have to increase our transportation budget. It would, it, would be, it would be necessary, yes, I believe so. Would you be able to let us know, uh, there's 100 applications now that are in for a laneway house. People say they're ready. So on those lanes, can we make sure that, number one, they're going to be good and number two it's not taking from a street somewhere that we are able to ensure there's enough of a budget to bring those up to a standard that one would expect on a street that has a house so i think we'd have to review the lanes on a case-by-case -case basis and see where the applications are so we could ask you to trans to actually comment on that in a month um there are Yes, basically, um, I just wanted to know about the impact of affordability because I read recently in the Globe that this is, while we're looking at making these affordable and affordable people to move into, that there has been an overall impact, I understand, on general house prices in those neighbourhoods so that houses, the whole prices of whole neighbourhoods have gone up because of the introduction. Does anyone know anything about that from the real estate market? Has that been something you've looked at? No? Not currently? Um, we, I don't think we have that data um, specifically. I don't, I don't know if, if Sean wants to comment on affordability at all, but... Um, it's not about the affordability of the units. It's about the impact overall on uh, assessed value and entry level, etc for this nature of this housing, not adding a third floor or whatever. If that might be possible to find out a little bit more, it could have been wrong, but I thought that was interesting. We should be planning for that. Last question. And um, I guess, I guess uh, I'm done. I don't need to ask another one. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor. Any other Councillor to, uh, are interested in asking staff questions? Pardon? Okay, Councillor McMahon. Thank you very much. I just had, because uh, Councillor Cressio, he's not here, but he had a motion with some items in it that he was going to move. And I, I'm not sure if he, I think he's spoken to you about some of the items. I just wanted to kind of go through them with you. Um, there he is. Councillor yeah. McMahon, would you like to ask those questions sure. once the, the motion is actually moved so we can all be aware of what you're asking questions about? Well, um, Okay, well this, uh, yeah, I guess first of all, uh, the first one is about affordability and was this ever the goal that laneway suites would solve uh, the affordability issue in the City of Toronto? Uh, no, I don't believe that was the intent at the outset of the study. And, and what was the intent then? The intent of the Changing Lanes Initiative was to provide a framework that would allow the construction of a new type of rental unit in established neighborhoods that represented a different size and form than what currently exists to provide an additional option of rental accommodation. Okay, and you feel that this proposal does that, this report does that? Yes. And you've had extensive consultation across the city to, just, to solicit ideas? In my opinion, yes. And, um, what do you feel there's been overwhelming support or 
Um, there hasn't been. There's been a lot of opposition or... To clarify my previous answer, the uh, consultations took place in Toronto and East York, primarily. Um, and we heard generally uh, Positive. There was a mix of opinions that were uh, provided over the course of the project, but it was a generally positive reception to what we were proposing and the direction that we were headed. Um, what about the mechanical equipment associated with the laneway suites? So there's been some uh, questions about where it should be situated. Well, the uh, permitted projections that are proposed for things like uh, mechanical equipment in the zoning bylaw are, I believe, uh, the same, if not very similar, to what is permitted currently for a, a house in a residential area. Uh, there's also an opportunity for um, the basement to accommodate a furnace or other uh, mechanical equipment that might be necessary in a laneway suite. And with regard to your outreach, so you have... Um You've outreached to the residents and you've also outreached to the councillors, right? That is correct. And you had individual sit-down meetings with every councillor way back in the day? We extended the opportunity uh, to meet. We ended up meeting with a number of councillors in the study area. Right. And then councillors were invited to the consultations? That is correct. And uh, it's my understanding that you have been emailing the councillors to update them on, on what? Where you're at in the report at key, at key milestones we uh, updated the councillor's offices along with uh, the RAs via email okay thank you thank you very much councillor McMahon uh, any other councillors final call for councillors to question councillor Bailao um, I just want to uh, make, sh uh, make sure I understood correctly. You said that there were no changes that were made public only yesterday, that all the changes, that the changes that came after the community consultation were part of the report? The changes that we made following the consultation uh, were included in the report. The document that was published last night were uh, technical amendments to the bylaw that was previously published with the staff report okay. for the intent of clarity. Okay. Um, and can, if, if I, um, I build a garage and I need a variance from my garage, do I have to ask for a rezoning process or can I just go to committee of adjustment? Uh, typically that would be considered through a committee of adjustment application. So today there's something that is as of right to build my garage and I have the right to go to committee of adjustment and ask for a variance for that, correct? Yes. So what we're saying here is we're creating guidelines as a right to have this, these suites, and if there's variances, we're suggesting that they go to Committee of Adjustment. Exactly the same process that we use for cars today, we're going to use for people in the future. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, did you do shadow studies, privacy impact, as you're developing the guidelines? In collaboration with our urban design staff on the team, we modeled uh, various options for laneway suite designs on the site. We had a look at shadow, overlook, and other impacts, yes. And can you report on the, uh, the setbacks and the, how, how are we maintaining green space? Because I thought that in certain circumstances, we were actually doing better than our current standards uh, require. Can you explain that a little bit more? We, uh, we can certainly provide more information to that effect. Uh, the way that we attempted or the intent of the, the zoning bylaw uh, is to not diminish the amount of green space on these lots. So to require really the majority of space between a house and a laneway suite, as well as space within the laneway setback to be green space in the bylaw. So that, that's, that's what we're we intend with this bylaw and that's what we have in front of us. That's the intent, yes. Again, we'll take a look in light of the comments raised to ensure that any bylaw that, that it's clear council, that is clear and that it represents the intent of the report. Okay. Um, how many families live in our city uh, today in secondary units? Last question. I, I don't have that information uh, available, but I can certainly look into it and provide it later. I think somebody does. Through the chair, uh, as part of our census data and looking at demographics in the city, we estimate there's anywhere between 70 to 90,000 renters within secondary dwelling units. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think that brings us to the end of any councillors with questions. 
Uh, councillors to speak. So far, I have Councillor Mahevic, Councillor Layton, Councillor Fragedakis, now Councillor Perks, uh, Councillor Matlow, uh, Councillor McMahon, uh, Councillor Bailao, I'm sure you'd like to speak. Yeah, okay. Uh, Councillor uh, Cressy, uh, you are number three. Anyone else? Okay, and then I'll add myself at the end. I'll be your sweep. Okay, Councillor. Might want to speak after. I think I, I've got it. I think uh, there's going to be a series of amendment, and what has uh, what uh, the, the advice I've received from 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 clerks is that you can all table, and it will we will sort it out. Be one big pile of soup, um, <laughs> not pile, pot of soup. Sorry, I'm a little tired, and I'm just eating my breakfast and lunch right now. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, folks. Um, okay, so Councillor Mahavik, you've got uh, five minutes. Take less time if you need. It's okay. But, and, and as much as five, if you want. Spoken so much. Yeah. Um, so well, let, let me say this, uh, Madam Speaker, and I'll try to be as brief as I can, but I do have a, a fairly long motion. Maybe I should present it first. There it is. I'll go through it. First thing, though, I want to do is uh, say thank you to Councillor Bailao, Councillor McMahon, uh, for uh, prodding us to think about uh, laneway suites in a different kind of way than we have historically. I think it is a good initiative. I really, 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 really do. Um, and uh, I want to find a, a way to, uh, to support it. Thank you to staff as well for under, uh, undertaking the negotiations and to community and groups that, uh, that uh, have uh, provided input. Um, I do think that uh, laneway suites will provide animation to laneways, will increase safety. Uh, there's nothing like living on a laneway to basically have that laneway look cleaner. If nothing else, they'll pick stuff up that is uh, sometimes phantomly dumped. I think it will help local retailing, uh, and I think it will reduce uh, car dependency. But mostly, and this is what the very first speaker, George, spoke to, was that it, it will allow us a different form of housing. There are so many folks that have come to me saying, and you know what, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. If we had laneway housing right now, my parents would be, who are 95 years old, would be living in that, in that, in that unit. They live way too far. I want to keep them under my watchful eye, but they can't because uh, we don't have uh, this possibility. If you go to every city, uh, every continent on this planet, probably save North America, multi-generational and extended family dwelling is the norm and has been the norm for us as a species forever and ever. Uh, whereas we've gone in, direct, in the direction of nuclearizing and creating smaller and smaller family units, uh, this allows us to say, you know what, we can have a little bit of a well, whatever, not compound, but we can provide more housing opportunities for extended families in one site. That, I think, is the big sociology of what this proposal does. So um, I, I am supportive, and in fact, one of the motions says, not only am I supportive, but you know what, we really need to get on to phase two, uh, which is to look at not just laneway housing, but for those lots where it is appropriate to say we want it there as well. So that's, that's the first point. The second point is, and you know, from some of the questions, I hope people do not take offense to a deferral. We do it all the time. This is our second crack at it. We want to get this right because if you don't get it right, there'll be all kinds of appeals and you're going to get the calls. We're going to get the calls. We're all going to get the calls of how this is not working. So we got to get it right as right as possible. So waiting a month or two months, whatever the timeline is, to get it right, I think is a worthwhile investment. Uh, one of the other speakers, our former city councillor, Sita Ram Singh, I had made exactly the same point. The devil is in the details. The devil is in the details. For me, the big devil, and it was promised uh, at the beginning, there were a lot of speeches made on how this is going to help with affordability. Well then, let's make sure that it helps with affordability. By both, by both, perhaps, and I, I've had the opportunity to talk with uh, Mr. Gadden, uh, with the program that the city offers, and also, in my humble opinion, I can't see why, if it's going to be your family, you're not charging rent. If it's not going to be your family, why can't we have a list of uh, properties and say, if, if you are on that list, 
And if you are renting, then it has to be 80%, 90%, whatever it is of the CMHC uh, average. Why can't that be? In a city that is absolutely desperate and we need to use not one tool, not two tools, but 10 tools to increase the availability of affordable housing. We need to do this. We need to find a way to introduce strong affordability mechanisms uh, in this, uh, in this uh, project. Um, it is better to go a little stricter at the beginning and loosen up later than to just leave it wide open and pretend that the market is going to solve all our issues. The rest of the motions there are things that uh, people have mentioned, deputants have mentioned. Uh, I would note that we're the Downtown Community Council today in about six months. We're not going to be the Downtown Community Council. There might be two Downtown Community Councils. So I think we want to, um, with the new council after the elections, we want to give some consideration to how we basically uh, figure that, uh, that piece out. We can ask staff to do that uh, uh, in the next uh, month as well. Thank you very much, Councillor. There are questions. Uh, Councillor Bailao. Uh, Councillor, just a couple of questions. On the um, zoning, so um, one of the things uh, that we kept hearing from people that built units and um, was the expensive process associated with these kinds of units. And that's why only people with a lot of money or an architect or planner builds laneway suites or houses right now, yep. houses in our, in our city. So we, we tried to bring this to become more available. The same way, like I said, like I asked staff, we have garages that we, we, we can build a five meter high garage, we go for a variance, right? Uh, why would we have the, that process if we wanna have a five meter garage, which is outside our uh, variance, our bylaw, what, right now we can build a four meter height garage and if you want a variance to that you go to committee of adjustments so why are we requesting people to in, enter into a complete rezoning process uh, frankly that uh, that was a report request we, I think we want to consider that um, you know so these are for re I considerations have, have, and you want to hear what staff have to say about yes, these. I haven't landed on that on that on that okay. myself on that piece I'm uh, faithfully trying to combine some of the things that other people have have uh, said, I think there might be some merit for the first year so that we establish some patterns to take it, bring it here, uh, so that we know, uh, you know, when to allow uh, variances from the bylaw. So maybe for the pilot, we go uh, council, community council, and then take it to committee of adjustment. There's a lot of ways to think that thing through, but I think we want to walk before we run. So I, I'm not fixated on that uh, right now. Okay. and. What is the goal of limiting the GFA? So we have already well, all kinds note, of... It's to note the GFA. Oh, so... So, so, it's, so, so if, I, if I have a, a, a laneway suite, um, and, that in, and, and right now it's not included in the calculation, and I want to build a, a, an additional floor on, and I want all kinds of variances for that, and I already have the laneway, uh, sometimes that's a bit much. So I think the Committee of Adjustments should at least have that noted, that on that piece, I think it should at least know that you also have a laneway suite and that, you know, but this you is are, not an intent to preclude that from being an added GFA. No, but I think it should be, uh, well, I think it should be part of the calculation. And if it's separatable out, whatever, I don't really care how it's done, but it should Every committee of adjustment application that includes a laneway suite should have a notation that, that it's, you know, 1.0 coverage, but 2.20 of it is a laneway suite. Uh, sorry, my apologies. Um, questions have concluded oh I've got, uh, yeah no I have a question I do see you um, Councillor Layton please go ahead thank you very much just further to that to that point around this 3a because you say it's to note it, that's not the language that's in the motion at least the one that w the clerks just printed for me it says include the density of laneway suite in the calculation of density GFA of the property which would to me suggest that it's when the planners are doing their review of a committee of adjustment application or the planning examiner is doing the PPR that they're going to say, we'll take the square footage, just like basements were recently added. They would just add this in and all of a sudden uh, uh, a 0.1 density increase because they add in the GFA of the 
uh, of the laneway suite all of a sudden ends up a 0.5, um, and that, that it wouldn't be teased out. I, and, and maybe this is something that we can have, when, when the, those that are reporting back can take note that the intent is not to have it added in fully. I would just, work, it doesn't say note. Well, it's, it says report back on it. Uh, the way I would see it happening is, um, so if it's as of right, it's as of right. So I put a laneway unit in the back of my, it, I don't have a laneway, by the way, but I, just to use this as an example. Where are your, uh, where are your parents going to stay then? In the chicken coop. Oh, in the chicken coop. In the chicken coop. No, he's going into I'm the, going the into the chicken coop. Suite. I'm going, you're right. Uh, if, if I had a laneway, um, it would be as of right. But then if I wanted to make an addition onto my home, then density considerations come into play. And I would think that a committee of adjustment would want to know that, that if you have, if you're going from 0.8 to 1.0, plus you've already got the benefit of a laneway unit, that that's important information for that. Sure, I, I get, I get, I, I completely understand the intent and I think that that, that is a reasonable request. It's just, it's, I don't see that the language is reflected here, but it is for a report back. So yes. given that this isn't changing the bylaw, perhaps uh, the, the planners could take that into consideration. Great, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Layton. Um, you, Madam Speaker. Any other questioners? No? Okay, so next person to speak is uh, Councillor Layton. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to staff and for Councillors uh, McMahon and, and Bailao for, uh, for, for pushing this. Um, to this point, I, I, in, in my community, most, most streets have laneways. I, I think I, I can probably count the number of streets that don't. I know because I can't remove street parking on those streets to put bike lanes because they don't have any parking at the, at the rear, although I haven't yet. Um, there, are, there are a few streets that, that don't. In fact, the, the laneway that I back onto also has uh, laneway housing on it already uh, from uh, a pre-existing condition where there was a, um, a, a garment washing factory that got flipped into, um, uh, into a, a row of townhomes. For that reason, when, when I knew this was coming, I did a little investigating on whether or not it was possible on uh, uh, where I live. Um, and the reality is it is. It's, a, it's an ideal candidate from probably from any measure. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, it's a cost is like enormously prohibitive. Uh, in particular to run the utilities. And so when we did our number crunching in my household, irrespective of what came out of this, we kind of just said, this, is, this can't happen. Like even if the little bit off in DCs aren't gonna get us the delta that we need to make it work as a nanny suite, which is what we were thinking um, as, uh, as, as my, my parents age or as my partner's parents age, uh, really whoever needs it first will get in there. At one point in time, it was Councillor Cressy that was gonna move in it. We talked about it, um, but the the reality Under is our uh, our uh, our finances wouldn't be able to uh, to to accommodate that. Not to say that it's the same uh, for every household, um, but that speaks to just I think one important clarification. And I did go back to the original letter that Councillor Bailao and McMahon put forward, and it didn't reference affordability. And I think that that's important to acknowledge. Although we have heard it a lot, and we can't we can't ig ignore the fact that it it, it continues to come up. Uh, but, but this will probably do very little beyond adding a little bit of housing to the uh, 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 rental housing to the market. A little bit, I say that because after again, in ideal circumstances at my own, pro at, at, at my own home, uh, where all the stars were aligned, we don't own a car, it's a two car garage, so it should work, it's just unaffordable. Um, that being said, if people choose to, I think there are some 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 considerations that need to come with the evaluation, lighting and uh, and 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 pedestrian safety for for individuals in the laneway, uh, monitoring and enforcing the hardscape component. Uh, these are things that are very real in the activities of a uh, of of people's day to day lives that need to be addressed, and they're they're not to this point. Fortunately, laneway project is also doing some laneway lighting in in Ward 19 and in Ward 18, I believe. And th this is a, another one of those projects that could, uh, that, that could activate laneways and make them uh, a, a safer place to be and, and more accessible place. Um, on, the, uh, on the referral, 
Uh, I think some of these are very, uh, very minor in nature. I, I certainly wouldn't take it as uh, uh, take offense to it as if I were the planner that wrote, wrote it or, or those that were driving it forward. Um, it's just sometimes there needs to be a second look. That's why we're here. If we weren't, then we would just issue Greg and Linda a giant rubber stamp, and they'd get to pass all the bylaws that they wished with that rubber stamp. I'm sure they might like that. That's not the case in our in, in our democracy, and 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 there are things that we identify as councillors that are valid points. Uh, that, that we should have the ability to uh, uh, to work into bylaws. Sometimes uh, it can be a good thing. A couple on here that, that concern me, um, and, and I, I should state quite clearly that I will support the recommendations. Uh, I support these recommendations, and I will support them uh, when they come back if uh, if it gets uh, if it gets deferred. Um, the two on this list, though, that 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 they pique my attention a little bit, and I'm very conscious of the language that it's just to report back and not give direction to change it. Uh, one being this request to change the as of right zoning permissions through a zoning bylaw instead of a minor variance. I do think that um, sometimes there are there are instances where a little a little thing doesn't work here or there in a site specific nature, and that the committee can be a good tool for that. And then the second is 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 this very specifically including the GFA. Uh, density on projects. I think that, that, uh, uh, that that's a complication that we probably don't need, given that most houses within uh, uh, within my ward, at least, are, are quite a bit over the stated uh, and allowable GFA uh, because of historic additions to the rear um, <laughs> and uh, second floor additions that they just far exceed the 0.7 or 0.8, that the, 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 the 0.6 that a lot of these lots are. Um, I know that because we also identified putting a third story on as the nanny suite, which is also prohibitively expensive for, for, for us, so we just won't do anything. Um, but, uh, but the language in, in this referral is quite clear. It's to, it's to examine it. Um, I'm still debating whether or not I should pull those out just to vote against them so it was, it's clear to the public that I'm not supportive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Layton. Councillor Fragedakis. Um, thanks very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a, a motion that could be put up on the screen, and it's that uh, it amends uh, Councillor Mahevic's motion and adds the following instructions, and it's that uh, we request the Acting Director of City Planning for this district to report to the June meeting on an update of the second unit's a draft OP amendment public consultation meeting that's going to be held next week across the city as the city is holding, like I said, consultations on second units across the entire city. And we're being asked today, or we were being asked today, to consider carving out a piece of the city and introducing changes in one district on a particular kind of second unit. Personally, I would have preferred that we looked at all second units across the whole city. Um, I would have thought that that would be a better way to conduct this um, to conduct this process. However, that's not how it's happened. So I was a little surprised last week that when I got the agenda for Toronto and East York Community Council that this item was on it, and then in the same breath received an email from the planning department about this public consultation that is going to be taking place from May 7th to May 10th um, across the entire city to get people's thoughts on uh, second units. So um, anyways, that's my amendment. Um, I, in reading uh, some, of the, some of the specifics of this report, um, you know, around on page 25, it talks about building height where the, some of these suites um, could be six meters tall, um, that the length of some of these suites could be 10 meters long. I'm wondering what kind of the backyard is going to be left um, when you already have a house on that lot that is um, covering a lot of the property. Um, and given the price of real estate in this city, uh, most people that are going to the Committee of Adjustment at least in my area that I have observed, are basically trying to cover the entire lot from line to line. That's what uh, I've been seeing in my area. I don't know what you colleagues have been seeing in your area. So because of real estate prices, that's what we're experiencing. And so introducing this um, new aspect that is a bit of an overdevelopment of the site, in my mind and perhaps in the minds of others, uh, that in the community that I currently represent, but um, that come to the Committee of Adjustment to speak to what they perceive to be the overdevelopment of the site. Um, this might 
be part of that, but uh, I guess we'll see next month when, you, when we come back with some more answers. And the other thing that I was particularly interested in is the uh, page 26 comments around parking and that no parking spaces will be required on a lot that includes a laneway suite. Um, and so that in areas where um, we have parking that is so coveted um, and we don't have enough of it, and we have yet to develop an app, some kind of application that lets you drive home, fold up your car, put it in your pocket, walk into your house and carry on with your life. Um, we actually have some really serious issues in the Toronto and East York District uh, as it relates to parking. So I'm concerned about that and I know I speak for the people that I represent around that because we actually had a permit, a permit parking consultation in, in uh, the East York Civic Centre on the 23rd of April and uh, many people have been writing into me with their concerns around parking issues. So this is um, a little troubling if we're going to be potentially stripping away parking uh, requirements on, on sites um, and then wondering where people are going to park in areas where some of the streets are and some of the permit areas are at 110% capacity and people are waitlisted. So those are just some of the concerns that I have. I look forward to seeing this again in June. I look forward to hearing what comes out of the consultations that staff um, are going to be hosting uh, across the city next week and hope I have an opportunity to pop by on Monday evening to Metro Hall to, uh, to hear from, from folks and, and see, see where th this goes. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, our next speaker, Councillor Perks. Thank you very much. Um, let me begin by saying that I'm not going to support deferring this item. I think it's time we got this done. Uh, on a, a few of the items that have been raised today, uh, first, let's, get, let's dispense with the red herring of affordability. This has nothing to do with affordability, never had anything to do with affordability. These will be either mid-rent or luxury units. I mean, my God, uh, a separate detached dwelling at grade in a stable neighborhood in the city of Toronto is not going to rent for the average rent in the city of Toronto. It's going to go <laughs> for a lot close. more than that. I doubt I could afford one. The, so it, this has nothing to do with affordability. However, some members of council believe that we should be looking at uh, programs to uh, support getting affordability in a range of building types. And that's important, and, and that's a great thing, but the way, deferral is not the way to get you to that. I would ask you to look at recommendation number seven in the report in front of you that directs the general manager, or sorry, I forget your title all the time, Sean, directs Sean to go look at, to go look, housing czar, Gadden, to go look at laneway housing as part of the housing opportunity 10-year review that's due to happen next year. So just as we will be looking at, at whether rooming houses are part of our strategy, whether expanding co-ops is part of our strategy, whether the city buying land is part of our strategy, we will be looking at laneway houses to see if they can fit into our housing affordability strategy and if it makes sense fiscally for the city to try to incent that portion of the housing market to be where we put our egg, our affordability eggs, or does it make sense to go somewhere else? So there's no reason to defer this to find out anything about affordability. We want to do that as part of an overall strategy. What this does do, though, is answer a dilemma that I think is in front of the City of Toronto. The dilemma is foundational to how Canadians think of themselves. We've always told ourselves that to be middle class, you have to own your own home. And we're discovering in the city of Toronto, that's not possible. We can't provide a detached home for everybody who aspires to be part of the middle class and wants to live in the city of Toronto. It's just not possible. And in fact, we're gonna become more like many large cities in the world, particularly those in Europe, where the middle class lives in rental housing or some form of social housing co-ops, not-for-profits, government-provided affordable housing. This is actually, to my mind, the key to what this issue is. This is the City of Toronto recognizing that people with reasonable incomes 
or complicated family arrangements and who consider themselves middle class are not going to all be homeowners in the city of Toronto. That's actually the essence of what's in front of us now. That's actually the, the dilemma we're dealing with. Now, we've heard a lot about existing policy and our official plan and so on and so forth. And yes, there was a specific exclusion for this. But our official plan specifically states that within our stable neighborhoods, we want to see some population growth as long as it reinforces the existing character. In my ward, I'm forever having to explain to people that yes, a four-story apartment-style building inside a neighborhood is good planning. It's good for the neighborhood. We're seeing actually in some of our, our stable residential neighborhoods, we're seeing population shrink because we're not finding more solutions like laneway housing. Because we're not telling people who live in our neighborhoods, yes, a four-story walk-up is a fantastic attribute in a neighborhood. We're not telling people, towns are good, semis are good, laneway housing is good. This is part of what makes a vibrant neighborhood, particularly in the downtown where we already have some of that. I am concerned about the trees and I understand Councillor McMahon is going to be moving a motion asking staff to clarify that we can prevent an as of right laneway house going in if the builder can't find a way to do it without demolishing or without destroying or injuring a healthy mature tree, a healthy tree. I want that I want that one locked down. I expect to see it by council if this makes it to council. Those are, are my comments, but I, I really think, you know, let's not get distracted about this being something else. This is about the, the future of the City of Toronto where we're going to live in all kinds of different arrangements, where we're going to live in all kinds of different forms, and where we haven't shrink-wrapped our neighbourhoods and said, send all the development to Liberty Village and Eglinton and Young. And King Spadina. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, church and, church and young corridor, but uh, yes, who's counting? Um, thank you very much for those comments. Uh, our next speaker, Councillor Mallow. I, I have a motion um, with the expectation that there is a deferral motion, but this isn't um, for a lot. Is the motion up? Or can Councillor I, yeah. Mallow's motion, please. So essentially, um, I, I believe that it's important for us to have information back to see how we can better ensure, and this is, by the way, material to this debate, but it's an overall concern that I think all of us share, who care about the, um, the security tenants should have, no matter where they are, uh, no matter what they live in uh, throughout our city. Um, I've seen significant concerns that uh, under existing provincial legislation, there are two two uh, standards that, uh, that tenants live under. You know, one, if you live in a building with uh, more than six units, you have uh, a number of protections under the RTA. Um, if you live in a, in a building that has uh, fewer than six dwelling units, the city can't prohibit or regulate uh, demolition or conversion. Uh, and it's not just the fact that the city can't regulate or prohibit uh, demolition or conversion. If you are, if you are living in, in a building, uh, a small building with few units, and even the threat of the possibility that you could be subject uh, to your landlord deciding just to uh, move you out in that way means that then you don't even have the uh, confidence that you can defend the rights that you have. Uh, and I've heard too many stories like that throughout the city. So currently, even without laneway housing, we're already losing affordable apartments and apartments in general uh, that are under, uh, that, are, that are in buildings that are under six units. Um, and I don't wanna see us make more, I shouldn't put it as more mistakes, but I just wanna make sure that we're going into this with our eyes open to ensure that we do our due diligence and do everything we can to work with the provincial government to make sure that any bu existing buildings 
have those protections for those tenants, but also if we are going to move in this direction and incent and, and create more opportunity for small building types that will have fewer than six units, that we recognize that this is a priority, that we want these tenants to have protections. And that's why I'm moving this motion. I hope that we ask for that information to come back. I want to make it very clear, this in no way enables or disables or impedes or any, you know, it, it's, not about, it's not about that. It's about whatever we do, we need to make sure that this is a priority. And, I, and I've been asking for this regardless of this debate, frankly. Uh, on this debate, I'll speak very briefly to it. Um, I, I actually think this was an incredibly thoughtful conversation that we've had today. And um, I recognize that, you know, councillors Bailau and McMahon have passionately worked on this and they, they really care about this as, as a priority that, that they've been working on. And they've worked with a lot of other people, including Evergreen and, 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 and a number of other organizations that do remarkable work and contribute to our city all the time. Um, and that's why I totally understand that when you, are, when you love what you have done and you believe in it strongly, that just the idea of people coming and saying, wait a sec, there's a whole bunch of problems where we want to do anything to pause it, is, is, can go anywhere from frustration to, to being hurtful because you deeply care about what you're doing. Equally though, there are people, and I've heard from, you know, Councillor Rem Kalawan Singh and Ms. Dexter and others who, who are, are city builders, who, like, who are not the types who just come and say no to things. They, they're always saying, like, how do we make things work? How do we solve things? Like that, these are the people who we're hearing from, who are expressing some, I think, genuine and sincere concerns about specific issues that they're not saying they want to work on to stop, they're just saying they want to work on to resolve. And so I would submit to us all that that, 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 that sweet spot, as Councillor McMahon was, was referring to earlier, is not so much about finding something that everybody has something to be upset about, so therefore, and I know you didn't mean to say it that way, but you know, so therefore you found the, the right answer. But actually, if we have a moment here, just a moment, to work together to resolve as many issues as possible, then actually the sweet spot is, is resolution and finding something that people feel genuinely comfortable moving forward with. And, I, and that's what I'm hearing from everyone today. So I think, you know, Councillor Cressy's uh, potential request uh, to work together to achieve that, I think is very reasonable. It doesn't stop anything. It actually helps it move forward in the right way. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor. Our next speaker is Councillor McMahon. Thank you very much. And I have a motion that I am going to charm you into supporting <laughs> um, instead of Councillor Mahavix. And that is, if you'd like some time, we will give you time. Absolutely, we want to get this right and get it right um, the first time. And so let's move the report to council um, and uh, without recommendations so we can work on, on the things that you are not, uh, that you have questions about and, and concerns about. And also we are addressing what came up primarily today was we wanted more clarity on the, the lot coverage, the density and the landscaping, primarily the trees. So there you have it um, for that. I'm, I'm going to take Gord Downey's lyrics and say this has been a long time coming. I can't sing that, but it actually has been. We've been asking for this and talking about this. Actually, prior to me getting elected, this was obviously brought forward. But we've been working on it uh, since um, for years, but I've been asking about it from planning, and, and it was always, no, well, not now and whatnot. And here we are. Like, how great is this day that we're actually so close <laughs> to, to adopting a laneway suites policy for the city of Toronto? Long overdue, for sure. And I want to just give a shout out to, to city planning and the work they've done. George <coughs> and Greg primarily I need to go on a Hawaiian getaway uh, in an hour, really. <laughs> but <laughs> they're going to have to wait a little longer. <laughs> Lanescape and Evergreen have been working hard, as, as have all residents of Toronto, as they come out to all these community consultations. And I'll tell you, they're not the usual people who come out, who we saw at these um, workshops and walks and, and presentations and consultations. They are totally, they are some of the, the usual people who come out, which is great. And then there were a ton of new people who had never come out to something before, but this is really important to them because they want to stay in their homes, they want to age in place, they want intergenerational living, they want uh, what, what Laneway Suites offers. So um, 
I'll say with the deferral, you know, it's tight timing. We got a million things to do before we recess in July. And I think we can work together to, to sort out what's missing before council. And you know what? Yeah, you don't take things personally in this place, but it is a little frustrating to hear just before noon today that all of a sudden there's going to be a deferral when, you know, we're all around to have con the conversation well ahead of, of, of community council. But this is the closest we've ever been. It's the most creative and innovative housing option, I think, we, that's been before us. And uh, city builders want us to be bold, and residents want us to make a decision. So let's do it. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor. Any questions of the mover? Okay. Uh, our next speaker is Councillor Bailao. Right away. Okay. Thank you. Um, I um, I want to start by uh, thanking staff and and the. Th Thousands of people that actually have spoken on this issue and gotten involved, from the residents' associations uh, to uh, people that have just responded to emails and sent us letters. So thank you. Um, it's been an interesting conversation that the city has been having um, and uh, that other cities have had for a long time. I mean, Vancouver has had this for 10 years. Ottawa's had it. Other cities have had it. So we're not being that bold, to be honest with you, by having this conversation today. We're not being that innovative. I think it's about time, and that is why I can't support a deferral. Because as I look to this motion, I don't see anything in this motion that can't be deal dealt with from now to council. I honestly can't. I respect a lot of uh, the concerns that were brought in here. I think that we do this all the time. We bring in the stakeholders, we bring in the residents associations, we bring in the councillors, and we have the conversations. And we have three weeks to have these conversations. And, and there's probably going to be some stuff that, you know, we're going to have to agree to disagree. But two things we need to make sure, that yes, that we acknowledge these concerns, and that's why I think we need to have these conversations and we have three weeks to have them, but also to make sure that we're not trying to create a feel-good policy. I have this term for the feel-good policies, those policies that people can say that they pass laneway housing, but they will not produce one laneway housing in the city because you kill it with a thousand cuts. And so as we make sure that we are passing this policy, we need to make sure at the practical side of it, with all those respect, you know, the same way that people were asking for rooftops and not having the angular place, we're trying to find that middle ground, that middle ground that is actually good planning that I think our, our staff have, have put in front of us. And, and that's why I will not uh, uh, support this, this deferral. I, I want to pick up on something that, that uh, Councillor Perks uh, said because I think he was brilliant on what, what he said. When I came to Canada, I, I, I came to the area that I represent today, and, I, and in my area, to be honest with you, I can't remember pe people not having two and three families living in, in there. I was shocked, because I walked into my house, I went up the stairs, and there, there wasn't even a door dividing my family home from the neighbor downstairs. They called that a flat. Right? That's what, that, what we had. It was a blue-collar neighborhood that we had. Right now, what is happening is people buy the homes, million-dollar homes, gentrification comes, and off we go. This is about the missing middle. Missing middle in terms of physical, but also missing middle about that people that are being pushed out from these neighborhoods, that they might choose to rent. They might not afford, but they might choose to rent. They might be able to, you know, go move into their parents' house because they have parents still owning there, but they won't be able to buy a house in, in my neighborhood even though their parents live there. And so if they have the opportunity to do this, it, they might be able to live in there. This is about acknowledging that we have challenges in front of us and that we need to think differently. We need to think outside of the box. That the house with the car in front of the house, the big garage, the big three-room house, it's not going to fit our society. This is what we're talking about. It's, 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 so, you know, it's, it's, it's not only about the laneway housing and the overlooking over my... This is... And the affordability. No, this is about us embracing this concept. And that's why so many urbanists are saying, get on with this. It's not that it's going to build thousands and thousands and thousands of units, but it's about time the city of Toronto gives a sign to the to, to, to people out there that we're ready to embrace this, that we're ready to take a step and to have these difficult conversations and, and to move forward and to say, you know what? We're going to have to do things a bit differently in here. 
And so that's why I think that we, we, we have to acknowledge people's concerns. We have three weeks, and that's why I think we can do it from now until Council and move on with this. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Cressy to speak. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so 2006 was the last time that uh, City Council considered in a fulsome way laneways. So 18 years ago, City Council at the time said no to laneway housing without a rezoning. How many years ago? Okay. Uh, without a rezoning. So that, it's a rather significant, important, and worth noting change over the course of 18 years that we've now seen here. And in that light, I think it, it's worth, I would start off by thanking uh, Councillors McMahon and Bai Lau for, for pushing uh, the issue forward, uh, to the city planning staff and across many divisions for their exemplary work, from walkabouts with residents in my community to consultations to one-on-one -on -one briefings. I want to thank them and single out Greg Ewens and to the many, many, many residents and stakeholders who've been part of that. And I would say on this basis that after 18 years, we're almost there. Uh, laneways are, and I believe this, certainly in the old city of Toronto, the TYCC, but across the city, a tremendous untapped resource for the city of Toronto. If I could talk just about my ward and Ward 20, uh, with a couple examples. Rush Lane, where Rick Mercer does his rant, we currently have a Rush Lane pilot project that we've initiated with the local BIA and the Residents Association to transform that lane into a cultural space with new lighting, opening up patios on the back, uh, and embracing the graffiti. In Huron, Sussex, just today, earlier this morning, we approved two laneway houses through a rezoning in Huron, Sussex, as part of a comprehensive neighborhood plan and housing strategy. And in the Harvard Village area, we've had a greening plan and I'm working on Croft Laneway for years. And so laneways can become so much more, and that includes housing. So the principles for me as I'm approaching this debate here on the housing co context is who are we designing our neighborhoods for? I'll build on Councillor Bai Lau's comments here in terms of who we're designing them for, but how I think we can do a better job in this. Uh, our established neighborhoods, of which I was privileged to grow up in one and live in one today, can handle more intensification. And they can, in large part, because our neighborhoods are changing. Many of the single family housing units, houses I see today were former rooming houses or former multi-dwelling units. Uh, and our neighborhoods, despite our best efforts through basement apartments and others, can do more to ensure that we have a diverse housing stock in our areas to support, support diverse incomes whether that's rooming houses, walk-ups, uh, or laneway houses. I think that's an important part. But here's the thing with established neighborhoods. Given the exceptionally scarce supply of low-rise housing, which is exceptionally scarce, we have to do everything we can as a city when we consider who we design the, the intensification for to ensure that there are a mixture of incomes. Just as in the 60s and 70s when we purchased through City Home houses in established neighborhoods to ensure that they were mixed income, as we look to develop an as of right zoning permission for laneway housing, we must do it now to ensure that we are designing this, yes, for the missing middle, but also for those who can't afford what will be above market rent rental properties. Because as Councillor Perk said, make no mistake, these will be above market rent. Now that's not to say we don't need low rise above market rent properties. We do. We do. But in this moment right now, let us make sure that we do everything we can after 18 years to ensure that if there is 12 years, sorry, 12 years, I apologize. Thank you. But let's make sure that we do everything we can because if there is a way that we can approve as of right housing in our laneways with increased measures for affordability, why on earth would we not do that? When we have a paltry objective of 1,000 new affordable housing units a year and a waiting list of 181,000 units, I'm not prepared to say after 12 years of waiting, let's pass this today if we can wait a month to see if we can add to that stock. And so it's for that reason that I am supportive 
one of as of right laneway housing. I am. And I want to get this done this term. But two, I also support Councillor Mahevic's move here because I don't think we've done everything we can. And I think if a one month delay helps to improve our opportunity to ensure we have both as of right but a stronger commitment on the affordability side, then I want to do that. And I think it's worth the wait. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Cressy. I'm going to bump myself uh, and uh, allow Councillor Davis and then Councillor Fletcher to speak. Anyone else? No? Okay, Councillor Davis, go ahead. Uh, th thank you, um, Chair. Uh, I will be supporting the deferral. And uh, I'm sure, um, based on some of the questions that I raised uh, during the question period, um, I still want to make sure, as many others have said, that we have this right. Um, what we're about to do is give as of right zoning. That means your neighbors will not get notice, neighbors will not have any right to comment. It means that that particular new house behind a house is going to go in um, without uh, any process that neighbors can engage in. And I know there'll be people who say, yeah, that's good. Uh, and people are calling it streamlining and uh, various other, using various other terminology. But it is a big step. And uh, I know that, well, in my ward, I don't have a lot of lanes. So this is not going to affect our, our neighborhoods um, as it will in the downtown area. Um, but there are 34,000 lots that now will instantly um, have a right to a laneway if this goes through, a laneway second suite if this goes through. Um, you know, at the beginning, and I, I do, I should have started as everyone did, to thank our councillor colleagues, McMahon and Bailao, who have championed this from the beginning and who have worked with uh, an incredibly talented group of young, somebody used the word, urbanists. Um, I have a 20-year-old, 25-year-old son uh, who I would categorize in, in that cohort. Uh, and uh, they've been very good at having their voices heard. Um, uh, I, I ha have had concerns about making this as of right without us making sure we have absolutely got it correct um, because there will not be a process where our neighbors will have a voice. So we've got to get it right. Uh, Councillor Bailao said it's just like a garage if it's bigger than, a, if it's bigger than the zoning allows and you go to committee of adjustment. This is not just a garage. Um, it will, however, though, offer rental housing in the urban core. And, you know, my 25-year-old son, who is hoping to live in the downtown, because that's the urban environment he likes, appreciates, his friends are there, and he does want to live in that environment. And maybe one day um, he'll be able to afford the rent uh, of one of the secondary suites downtown. But as Councillor Perks and others have pointed out, it will not be affordable. And uh, the 34,000 people who have a lane way lot, they won the lottery. They will win the lottery when this goes through. That means that your properties instantly a higher assessed, will instantly be higher assessed value, whether you put a second suite on it or not, because that neighborhood is gonna go up in value. It is not gonna make those properties any more affordable for anyone else to be able to purchase. So as we Manhattanize the downtown core, and it's happening, of course, um, we will, through this approach, provide more options for rental housing. And that is good. Um, but I do believe that the stable residential neighborhoods 
have been told and expect that their stable residential neighborhoods are going to stay stable. And there is the potential to destabilize our residential neighborhoods. And while the official plan says they're stable but not static, um, the potential here is huge for seeing the loss of green space, for seeing uh, the character of these neighborhoods change significantly. And so I do think we have to get it right. Uh, I'm not sure these standards are right yet. Um, and so I think we, well, first of all, because as someone else pointed out, we're all looking at what got changed overnight. I'm circling and trying to figure out what was changed. Councillor, your time's up. So I think we have to get it right. Everyone has to understand truly what the bylaw was and have this a democratic process where they have a chance to actually familiarize themselves with it. Get a further report back on clarification. Councillor Fragadakis pointed out coverage is not so your time is up. This is an East York issue for sure. And I look forward to engaging in this discussion again next month. Okay. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Councillor Fletcher? Yes, thanks very much. Um, I uh, say so this is a really big idea whose time has come. It is very exciting. And I think everyone's worked hard, and I as well want to congratulate the councillors, the staff, the entire community that's been thinking about this, um, and others. We've got architects, developers, people that are thinking and considering how this is going to work in the city of Toronto. I have people come up to me all the time that say, well, I really want to put in a, a, a laneway house because I, my kids, I want a place for my children. We've heard about Joey wants a place for either his father or himself out there. Or, and um, that those are really important personal things for everybody when they're thinking about what are they going to do in this city that gets less and less affordable every day. And all of us, all residents who have kids realize, wow, where's your chance to live in the city? And, um, but this is like a big development. It's this huge development, but this big zoning bylaw that's in front of us. And those who aren't used to that, who've come today, I just want to say to you that's how we're thinking about it. It's massive, it's important. If this was a big developer coming in, we would want to spend this same time. Although we have a pressure there that the developer says, we're taking you to the OMB and so you better figure it out quickly. So as someone said, let's get this right. And those who have dealt, and I'm just going to say, have uh, Sue and Sita and others. I mean, I met, first met Sita when she was dealing with the Grange and development in the Grange. There are people that have long history of getting development right under tremendous pressure. So I don't begrudge any time where we would want to see how we can make this better and look at what the impacts are, the same way as these folks that came in front of us for Honest Eds, that come in front of us for the AGO, say, well, what about this, 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 and this? This isn't about do we like these or do we not like these? We all like these. It's a great idea. It's what are the circumstances since we're dealing with an as of right uh, zoning permission that they would be introduced? What are the issues that we need to be very thoughtful about? And those who have that expertise, from the community side, not the staff side, have come forward to say, here's issues we want you to think about. And I think we do have to think about that. We always come to some kind of compromise or agreement. I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about extra time here. I'm worried about rushing when we have people very eager to start this and those who've managed and dealt with huge developments saying we really want a little bit more time so we get it right. I also just want to add that affordable housing is the biggest issue of our day. The mayor says that's what he's planning to run on. We had a huge uh, Easter Sunday, the Easter Friday, the night before, 130 people about housing affordability, inclusionary zoning. These are huge issues. And so how does this add to affordability and if it doesn't, then how do we make sure that people that are modest income, middle class families, those who want to have this for their kids, for their families and others at a decent rent, that we can try to guarantee that. That we're not setting up in neighborhoods 
um, developers coming in, building something, and someone renting that out with no social good for adding this into our laneways. I believe we can make it better. Those kids that wonder, where will I live? Will I ever live in the city of Toronto? Will I have to move out? Kids raised, born and raised here. I think this is very important for that generation, and we have to think about them. Affordability is very important for everybody. And taking some extra time does, does not bother me. And anyone who thinks we're taking extra time in order to somehow turn this back, I want to assure you that our job, our job here is to be thoughtful and get things right. And I appreciate the ability to do that based on all the excellent work that's gone into this to date. Thank you very much, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, if there are no other councillors, uh, I would like to speak as well. Uh, and I do have a motion, if I can ask the clerks to put it on the screen. Um, and uh, the motion is before you. One is to take the correspondence from the ABC Residents Association and, and uh, ask staff to report back on that, uh, the co communications portion, and uh, an analysis of laneway suites as constructed on lots with row houses. Uh, the second part of the motion is uh, to specifically uh, ask for written clarification around the site area specific policies as they uh, perhaps may butt up or complement the uh, secondary plan and in particular uh, OPA um, uh, 403 that uh, uh, that sort of rests over the uh, the upper area of Yorkville. Um, I want to thank um, the, the local uh, the councillors, uh, Councillor Bailao and Councillor McMahon as well. Um, and I have to say I'm a little bit uh, 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 envious largely because uh, I have been a huge supporter of laneway housing and laneway uh, revitalization along commercial streets beyond uh, laneway housing uh, for a number of years. Actually in 2010 I actually uh, was a very naive young politician uh, and I actually created a series of policies. Uh, each policy was a position paper from harm reduction, safer injection sites uh, to pedestrianization of Young Street to public banking and so forth including one on laneway housing and laneway um, uh, commercialization as a, as a facade improvement program. Uh, I didn't get very far on some of them uh, and I have gotten much further on others. Um, so it's actually a, a fantastic, fantastic report that's before us and I embrace it with a lot of enthusiasm. Um, I also know uh, the history of 2006 because I actually invited the councillor who initiated that uh, report to a conversation with myself and that of course was Councillor Giambroni and I asked him what was went wrong in 2006 and how do I actually introduce it in 2010 or 2011 and he essentially said to me uh, the city of Toronto will never be able to wrap their heads around it largely because the conversation at that time was led by waste management <laughs> and um, <laughs> and that's because how do we service the, the, uh, the laneways uh, if they become front yards and front uh, doors, uh, if they need to be serviced with uh, garbage trucks and so forth. Um, so that was one reason why it didn't go through. Another one was a severance of lot and, and so forth and so forth. So, But he really was discouraging of me of even trying to tackle it again. I don't think it was he meant to sabotage my enthusiasm per se, but he was just cautioning, you are going to run up against a hill. So so hats off to the councillors who ran up against that hill um, and thank you to the community of, uh, of, uh, of urbanists as well as just citizens who don't even consider themselves urbanists for embracing the ideal of, uh, of uh, laneway housing. Uh, but really I think we need to thank planning staff and the reason being is because if you were not able to help us get to a yes today which clearly you've gotten us to a yes. Not everybody is in, in agreement that it's the full yes, um, but you're worth so much closer than we have ever been before. I would like to see, as a, as a councillor that's ending the term, I would like to see this term of council approved laneway housing uh, with the modification, the refinements that are required. A neighborhood association that I represent, and I believe that they're probably one of the most sophisticated uh, in the city, which is the ABC Residents Association, along with those who appeared before us, uh, provided a 12-page letter of technical review and amendments. Attached to that 12-page letter was an appendix with six pages. Attached to that was appendix number two with 11 pages. And every single one of them was around technical um, considerations that they wanted a little bit more information on and clarity. The one thing we did with the tall buildings um, guideline in the city is that we passed it. 
and there wasn't nearly the same level of review not the same level of energy and certainly not the same level of feedback nor technical feedback as we watch the city intensify around us, I would say one of the things that probably we could have done was add that much more intensity to the review because so much of what was a guideline has been blown up very quickly afterwards because it was left for interpretation. So I certainly have no problems making sure that it does get passed in this term and that we do fill that missing middle. But it's also important to note that the missing middle is much more than just laneway housing. It's about duplexes, it's about triplex, fourplex, multiplex, courtyard apartments, and so forth. So if we're gonna have a conversation about filling that missing middle, then we might as well start at some point, probably in the new term, start thinking about what does as of right for those built forms look like beyond laneway housing. Now that is gonna be a conversation that'll take tremendous courage, probably more than laneway housing. Um, but nevertheless, it's a, it's, it's a good, very good place to, for where we are today, um, but I do think that it requires more refinement, um, but I don't want it to stop, and I want the councillors and everyone in the room to hear these remarks, is that I want this to be approved this term, uh, and I think we can get there, but we're going to have to trust each other that we want to get there together, and I've heard that right across the room from all the different councillors. Thank you very much. So now we have to make sense of all these motions. So we will begin, I believe. So what uh, we should do is um, do the amending motion to amend Councillor Nichols. So Councillor Frank Dan, she can vote it in, and Councillor Matthews, and then Jim Bruce, they're amending, and then Councillor Nichols. Okay. So thank you very much. I'm going to. So there is going to be a sequencing of the motions. Uh, I feel like we're in. Yeah, no, this is great. Yeah, you won't have to write it down. I'll just let you know what it is. Uh, Councillor Fragedakis' motion will be moved, uh, will be voted upon first. And if the clerks can just put that on the screen, it'll jog our memory. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, do you want a recorded vote or just let it go? Okay, okay, uh, that par carries. Thank you very much. Our next motion is from Councillor Mallow. Uh, oh, wait till it get, goes on the screen. All. Okay. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you very much. Uh, the third motion is my own. It's coming onto the screen shortly. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. Uh, our fourth motion is Councillor Mehevic's original motion, uh, as now amended by the, uh, the three uh, preceding motions. And it's the long one, so just wait for it. Yeah, if, if, if I could just, uh, on, uh, I guess, a question to the clerks, that the motion number two, review and reconsider, doesn't direct staff to actually change something specific. Um, on Councilor Mahevic's motion, point two says review and reconsider. This isn't providing direction to come back with this as a requirement. Is it? Can we, okay. provide counselor, can we provide okay. Councillor uh, Layton an answer? How will it be interpreted by, by staff is what... You, you could just ignore point 2A, or like you could review it and come back and say it's not feasible, right? The way, the way we would interpret it is that you've asked us to, to look at all of these issues and come back and give you your advice okay. on all of them. Fair enough, that's fine, thank you. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so Councillor Mehevic's motion is before you. And oh, then there was a request for a recorded vote. Yes, okay. Uh, all those in favor, indicate your support. Uh, Councillor Davis, uh, Councillor Mehevic, Councillor Fletcher, Councillor Cressy, Councillor Wong-Tam, Councillor Frajidakis, Councillor Layton, 
Councillor Matlow. Those opposed? Councillor uh, Perks, Councillor Troisi, Councillor uh, McMahon, Councillor Bailao. Thank you, that carries. And there should be one more. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. So that uh, now carries. We'll have the opportunity. So, your, uh, sorry, Councillor McMahon, your uh, your motion is ruled as redundant. Um, we will uh, look forward to seeing everybody back in this room in approximately one month, uh, hopefully with every single wrinkled ironed out. So this is a very positive, uh, big step forward. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, why don't we just take a two-minute recess while we organize the room, but don't stray too far. We, uh, we will lose quorum shortly. That um, includes me, so thank you. Yeah.
Could we get the members of the Toronto and East York Community Council back into the committee room, please? So, I believe there are some councillors who are interested in clearing some quick items, but I also recognize the time. It's, five, it's quarter to six. I want to make sure every deputy who's been sitting around all day has a chance to be heard. So, I'm not going to uh, deal with the quick items right now. What I'd like to do is, uh, is make sure that the, the deputants have an opportunity to be heard. Which brings us to TE 32.20, 18 to 32 Eastern Avenue, 1 Galeed Place on 2 Sackville Street. Official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications request for directions report. Um, we have our first speaker, uh, it's been numbered for me here, Isaac Tang. Isaac, welcome. Uh, we are uh, item 20. 20. your time. Um, I'm here representing York Condominium Corporation 389. That's the condominium corporation for the property at 465 King Street East. And that's the site that's located immediately north of the subject property that's being proposed to be developed. I am also represent Catherine Bray and Alan Potts, who are owners of Unit 20 in that condominium. Now, if there's a case for city planning to draw the line on what is appropriate in terms of development in Corktown and what is not, this would be the case. The words in the city's own secondary plan document, the King Parliament secondary plan, directing where growth is appropriate and where it is not, must mean something. Now, we are parties to the uh, local planning appeal tribunal, that's the OMB hearing. Uh, we have a pre-hearing conference scheduled on June the 4th. We are prepared to support the city should it decide to oppose the proposed development. We have party status and we expect the city to be there as a strong ally. Now, I've highlighted the concerns we have in the five-page letter that I've, I've sent late last night, um, but I just want to highlight three main concerns. The first is that Corktown, it's a stable area. It's known for its small-scale development and its heritage attributes. When you take a look at the secondary plan that's prepared for King Parliament, small scale is mentioned five times and four times it's in the context of Corktown. In planning terms, the proposed development is designated mixed use area A, Corktown. It's the, let's see if this shows right here. See, Corktown is the area highlighted in, in yellow. All the other areas around it here, this area here, that area here, these are regeneration areas. Now, these are areas targeted for significant growth. Corktown is not, and that is specifically stated in the secondary plan. And what I see here also is that when council made its decision to pass the secondary plan, it created a boundary. It, it creates a boundary right along this line. This is Eastern Avenue. The area north of Eastern is designated mixed-use area. It's supposed to be stable, small-scale development. The other area is south of Eastern and essentially west of power slash parliament um, is designated for significant growth. And so our position is that tall buildings, which is what is proposed in this case, a 12-story building is not appropriate in, in court town. Now that's self-evident in the planning documents itself, but we would like to bring council to the ground. Now Eastern Avenue is a 20-meter right-of-way road. What's being proposed is an over 40 meter building. And this is the staff report that um, curiously supports development admits that by definition, it's a tall building. We're putting a tall building in an environment that's meant to be stable. 
Now, city staff mentioned that this development is better than the initial proposal that was put forward, which did not comply with the 45 degree angle plan at all. It proposed a zero, a zero meter setback to the north and essentially a giant rectangular building that was 12 stories. Now they've cut it, they've shaved the back of the development so they meet the 45 degree angle. But in all other instances, it's relatively the same development. The height is still over 40 meters. The scale is basically the same if you're taking a look at it from Eastern. It's gonna be the first tall building in Corktown, and it's gonna set the ground floor for future developments in this area. Now this completely undermines the direction of the secondary plan that separates Corktown from the West Dawn lands over here and Jarvis and Parliament. So that's completely contrary to the intent when council passed the secondary plan for this. The third issue I'd like to raise is just the severe lack of street parking in Corktown. Now, the citizens here have been dealing with uh, under, I guess, not enough street parking for many, many years. The last occurrence that happened was because um, there was an approval of 90 Trinity, right, the, the uh, northwest corner of Trinity Street in Easter. Now, that was approved only with 61 units and 36 parking spaces. Now, what's being proposed here is 331 units with only 91 parking spaces. So that's less than one parking spot for every three units in an area that's already underserved by parking. So the concerns that I'm raising here today, they're not new concerns. So they're the same concerns that have been raised by community consultation meetings for the development and same concerns raised by the city it's in, in its own secondary plan. Now, when we're dealing with a conversion from industrial lot to residential, the secondary plan states that the building should not exceed the height, the zoning permits 12 meters, they're proposing 46. The density massing and the scale must be consistent and reinforce the physical character of the area. Altaria is proposing a precedent 12-story condo building. Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there may be questions for you. Um, any questions for the speaker? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Our next speaker on this matter is Catherine Bray. Catherine, hi. Hi. Okay. You have five minutes. The clock is on your left-hand side. When you're ready, I'll start your clock. Thank you. I'm ready. Thank you, okay. everyone. Um, and thank you for your attention at, after such an interesting debate on the laneway issue. My name is Catherine Bray. I'm an owner and a resident at um, York Condominium 389, as Isaac mentioned. We are uh, directly north of the proposed development, and my unit is the southernmost unit, um, so I'm the one having the pleasure of looking at uh, 12 stories outside my bedroom window. Um, this area of Corkdown is all two and three stories, so this is a shot of King Street going, uh, looking eastward. You can see the heritage character. You've got Little Trinity Church here, Enoch Turner's just down here. This is heritage. It's all heritage along King, heritage on Trinity, heritage on Sackville, and we care about that nature. The other thing I wanted to show you to give you a sense of the low scale. Can you see from this all of these buildings are under the 12 meter height? Uh, the only exception is a little bit off the corner of this and that is 90 Trinity that Isaac mentioned. Um, so this at uh, 46 meters is a huge departure from the rest of the character of the area, which as Isaac mentioned, has been identified as an area of special identity to preserve this special nature. We are not against development. We understand the city wants to intensify. As Isaac mentioned, the city has identified areas immediately west and south, and we've got west on lands to the east of us, which are undergoing greater intensification. But it's inappropriate in this area that the city already made a policy to keep it small grain and lower. Um, we have met with the councillor. Um, there are different community groups that are meeting with the councillor. Our community group was residents from Sackville, Trinity, King Street, and our condominium. Uh, we've met with the councillor twice um, uh, to, with planning staff to discuss our concerns. One time if we facilitated with the developer, about 12 to 15 residents attending those meetings. I also have a petition 
that we went out. Remember that cold snap we had in the middle of after Christmas? We went out, got 120, walked around, got 121 signatures from the immediate streets in Corktown Special Area, all opposing the scale of this development. There are approximately 120 residences in this Corktown area of special identity. Yeah, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Can I ask you to take that down? Yes. Thank you very much. There's some personal data that we want to. Oh, I apologize. Sure that's okay. not uh, um, publicly seen. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, there are 120 residences in this special area, the special identity area of Corktown. At 331 residences, this building alone will almost be triple the size of the existing residences. This is not small grained, sensitive introduction of gradual change. This, is a, this will completely change our area. Um, and also, I think it's interesting, with 120 residences, we figure about 80 businesses. We got 121 signatures. Two people declined to sign. One works with the City of Toronto and felt that it was perhaps inappropriate for them to sign a petition. And the other one said they were too busy, they couldn't, they couldn't talk with us. Everybody else that we asked signed the petition. So as I said, we understand that development is going to happen. We just think this is just too massive a scale. Um, in terms of my residents, So this is our condo. Oh yeah, put it up. This is our condo. Um, it's a three-story with uh, commercial units at grade and then two-story residential above, which actually mimics, it was built in the 1970s, it actually mimics the heritage buildings in the area, which often had a commercial and then a residential up above. My particular unit, this isn't a particularly attractive picture, but I think it shows the point. My particular unit is here at the end. Those are, that's my sunroom, which will now, the new development is right here, right at this end, at the end of the parking lot. My sunroom, it's got angled windows all across the roof. My bedroom, my bathroom has angled windows all across the roof. We're not talking small windows here. These are four by 14 feet, and I've got three sets of them. I will now have all these people in this unit looking at me. So I'm certainly concerned about privacy. I'm concerned about the use of my outdoor deck, which interestingly was not on any of the developer's materials. Your final thought, please. Thank you. Um, I'm also very concerned about shadowing the impact on the whole condominium and on the neighborhood park, which will now lose at three hours of daylight in the mornings all through the winter. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any members with questions for the speaker? Okay, seeing none, I'd like to call our next speaker, Alan Potts. Alan, welcome. Thank you, and thank you for all of you who've been waiting so patiently. You'll have five minutes when you're ready. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of Community Council. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Alan Potts. Um, I have been an owner at 465 King Street East for 20 years. I'm also the president of our small three-story uh, Corktown Condominium, York uh, Condominium Corporation 389. And we're directly north of the proposed development at 1832 Eastern, 1 Gilead, and 2 Sackville. We are, as was said before by the two previous speakers, we're in favor of development in our area. We live in the city, we get it. But it's gotta be development that's appropriate. As you heard from Isaac, the proposed development is completely inappropriate according to the King Parliament uh, secondary plan. This massive development is four times the allowable height and will adversely affect our community due to privacy issues, shadowing, lack of parking, noise, and excessive uh, street traffic. We strongly rec reject the city planning's recommendation to move forward with this development, and we ask that City Council reject the recommendation and direct City Legal to strongly oppose this proposal at the Tribunal. Thank you very much. Short and sweet, enough's been said. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions of the speaker? Okay, seeing none, thank you. I would like to call Elizabeth Jones to speak. Elizabeth, are you here? 
I'm actually speaking for Elizabeth Jones. We checked with the clerk. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you have her remarks, right? I have her remarks, and I'll read them. Um, Liz ahead. Jones is also an owner and business owner, uh, landowner and business owner and resident at uh, 465 King. And she asked me to speak to um, the development issue that Isaac also referenced. So this is Eastern. This is King Street. This is our condominium. This is the proposed development site. The sites that are whited out are all surrounding us, and those have all been assembled and are ready for development. Some of them are underutilized with parking. Some of them are single story that have been vacant for periods of years. And one of our concerns, so I'll read from it, um, his, any development in historic cork towns should be small scale, infill developments or building conversions in keeping with the characteristics of the neighborhood. This proposal does not, the, the submission from the developer does not meet these criteria in any way and sets a precedent for future development. Um, the white portions, as I said, are areas that have been assembled that we uh, believe are ready for future development. If the proposal goes forward for 18 to 32 Eastern, we feel that it will not only in itself will destroy the character of the neighborhood, it will set the precedent which will mean that these other sites will then get similarly developed with large scale tall buildings. And we request that you reject the proposal by recommendation by planning and that uh, you join us in the appeal at the uh, board. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any members with questions? Seeing none, thank you. Our next speaker is Caroline Lemos. Caroline, welcome. Good evening. Um, my name is Coralina Lemos, and I live at 461 King Street East, which is right here. And I'm one of the four set of row houses which are actually listed on the City of Toronto's inventory list. So within the block of this development, I own one of the properties that is on the inventory. Okay. I've been in the area for 37 years. I am <clears throat> a property owner and business owner. Okay. So regarding this uh, uh, development, I find that the massing is inappropriate, the height and the setbacks. The setbacks are suggested to be at level seven. I believe they should start at level three. The last thing I want to speak about is that I was a participant in the initial meeting focused at putting together a workable King Parliament plan that was put together by our deceased councillor, Pam McConnell. During that meeting, the St. Lawrence Association, the Citizens for the Old Town, the Corktown Association, and the Queen Street East Association were present. The outcome of the meeting was that it was important to maintain the low-scale framework for future development in order to not take away from the industrial and residential heritage that is included in the area. And this includes re, um, commercial residential row houses, which are on main streets such as King Street, and, and, and um, row houses that are on side streets and cul-de-sacs. To approve this development will go against all that our deceased counselor helped to establish. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions of the speaker? Seeing none. Um, our next speaker is Peter Naismith. Peter, welcome. Thank you. Uh, excuse me for a uh, ad hoc speech. I wasn't going to speak, but uh, in the presence of democracy in action, I felt I should. Um, I agree with all the previous presenters. Uh, I'm a resident on Sackville Street, an owner for the frighteningly long time of 40 years. Um, I agree with everything they said. Precedent is a big one for us. I won't go into it any more than that. You know what I'm talking about. Historically, same thing. It's a big one for us. Other people have talked to it. 
It's important. It's old Toronto. On our street, we've had meetings talking about what's going to happen. One of the biggest problems we have with this development, other than height, which goes without saying and has also been dealt with before, is the loading of all the traffic from this building of 331 units plus the businesses along Eastern Avenue. All that traffic is loaded onto a, I would say, small scale, one block long, one way residential commercial street. All of it is loaded. Their main entrance is off Sackville across the street from a public, the longest, I think I'm, I may be wrong, the longest continuously running public school in Toronto, Inglenook School. The entrance is directly across the street from the school. If, in fact, we get multi-family or multi or family residences in this building, eventually that school is going to be required. There are no schools, no new schools in that area. So you're potentially going to have a lot of kids wandering up and down where trucks are delivering, where garbage is being offloaded, uploaded, where cars are coming and going, and particularly where Ubers and rental cars and everything is all trafficking, trafficking, excuse me, on Sackville Street. Um, that is the main thing that I would like to get across today, is that for some reason, a small residential state or residential commercial street is being loaded with all the traffic when it has frontage on a four-lane city street, Eastern Avenue. Why? I don't know. Obviously, there are reasons, and we've discussed some of them, but we're going to end up with all that traffic, on top of which there is no commercial or no public transit on Eastern Avenue. All the foot traffic is going to be tra traversing our street up to King Street. If, King, if the King project line for st streetcar extends to us, it'll be great, because then that'll reduce the, the traffic as well. But everything is getting loaded on Sackville Street. Um, a judge once criticized me for saying it's just not fair. But in this case, I don't think it's very fair. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for your deputation. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, I'd like to call our final speaker, Stephen Quincy. Great, welcome Stephen, Hi, you have five you. minutes. Thank you, councillors. Um, I know it's been a long day and listening to residents complain about development is not much fun, but we would really appreciate your uh, attention and your consideration because we, as a neighbourhood, think this is really, really, really important. Um, I wrote down some of my comments, so forgive me, I left my glasses at home. Um, my name is Stephen Quinney. I'm an owner at 465 King Street East. I live there. I'm also a business owner at this property. My building sits immediately north of this proposed development. The residents in this neighbourhood are in distress about this proposal, and I mean that. So much so that many of us have given up our day to be here to talk to you and we've waited because this is really, really important. The residents of this block of historic Cork Town asked the councillors to oppose this application on the grounds of its inappropriate scale for this small block. The King Street secondary plan was put in place to provide a framework for growth in this neighbourhood. Current zoning, as you have heard, permits a 12 meter high building. This proposal is 46 meters. It bulldozes over the secondary plan recommendations for small scale structures that will respect the history and the scale of our block. Residents are concerned with the height, the mass, the increased traffic, which believe me is already extremely concerning, the impossible parking situation, and the shadow impact amongst so many other reasons. We've heard talk today about a need for housing in Toronto. This block is not big enough, nor is there sufficient infrastructure to support a building of this size. And a proposal that needs to build 
a massive building on a small lot because it does not make financial sense otherwise for these developers is not an example of good planning in my opinion and in the opinions of the people who live here. We are concerned with the precedent that a building of this size sets for the neighborhood and it's bigger than anything else we have to live with right now. We live in a historic neighborhood, Little Trinity Church, the Enoch Turner Schoolhouse, as well as the remaining worker cottages that define this neighborhood. People come here because of this. The building would cast shadows across Sackville Park at certain times of the year, causing an impact on the precious little green space that we have in this neighborhood. We have one tiny park that right now is being renovated, and thank you, City of Toronto, for that. I would like to stress that we are not opposed to redevelopment. This is a dynamic city, but we expect developers to be sensitive to the existing neighborhoods in which they wish to build. I bought my property knowing that the city had a plan in place to protect the heritage character of this neighborhood based on the King Street secondary plan. The residents of this neighborhood oppose this proposal in the strongest terms, and we ask that the city oppose it at the tribunal. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much for your remarks. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, final speaker, you would like to speak? Uh, sure. We're also going to get you to uh, check in with the clerks afterwards and make sure we have you on the public record. Um, please introduce yourself and you have five minutes. Great. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of Council. My name is Calvin Lance. I'm the lawyer for the applicant. And uh, I'm here to speak briefly to members of Council. Uh, firstly, to thank staff on the efforts that they've undertaken uh, through the process of this application. Um, staff have been instrumental in uh, conducting meetings that go back as early as 2014. There were meetings in 2016. Uh, we had meetings with the community many times. We've cataloged them. I counted as many as 14 to 15 meetings in all between city staff and council. So I think the message here is that there's been healthy communication with the community. And on behalf of our client, we would be uh, interested in continuing those discussions in the event that we can't find a resolution before the hearing that is scheduled uh, to occur. I think one thing that needs to be kept in mind is that this is a, it is a large site. It's an industrial site. It's a contaminated site. Uh, it was formerly um, cadmium uh, plating. Um, so there's an opportunity here to clean the site. Um, great work has been done with staff and responding to comments of the community to revise the application. It's resulted in the application becoming smaller, shorter, fewer units, uh, increased step backs. And, and I'd like to go back to a comment that was made by my friend, um, Isaac Tang, when he said that the developer in response to these comments shaved uh, a little bit off the development, but essentially it's the same. He said it's shaved a bit, but essentially the same. And if I can just illustrate what has occurred as a result of the discussions, um, you'll see the demarcation of the 45 degree angular plane and the loss of a significant amount of density. Uh, the stepping uh, has occurred. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to flip to another image just to illustrate the kind of uh, shaving that occurred as a result of input from the city. So there's been an effort here in a, in a, in a good faith effort on behalf of our client to respond in a meaningful way to these comments. So in, in closing, uh, I would just like to also point out that we have 12% three-bedroom units, more than the 10% that's uh, you know, usually sought by staff. Um, these are going to be larger units in the range of about 1,000 square feet, um, so sizable three-bedroom units. And um, so in closing, um, I would just like to, again, uh, express our thanks to staff and again to invite the community to carry on with the discussions we have been, uh, that have taken place over the number of uh, years that this has been uh, with staff and uh, I'm open to have any questions. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your remarks. Are there any questions? Seeing none, okay, thank you.
Oh, it's question. The secondary plan is so clear about the nature and height and character of the neighborhood. I'm a little surprised that your um, client would come in with such an egregious proposal. Yes. The, um, well, our client... Is there a reason why they would not work within the secondary plan? Well, we, we are, in, in our view, is working within the secondary oh, plan, you... and I recognize there's a disagreement, um, but there had been a number of pre-consultation meetings with staff. Uh, the original consultation had a much higher building. Um, so that this, definitely wasn't in the secondary plan? Uh, yes, and definitely. And now you're saying we since you brought it down, you're trying to yes. say it's in the secondary plan. Yes. Okay, thank but, you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Any other ones? Any other councillors with questions? Uh, councillor Davis, go ahead. It, Twelve stories, yes. And the original application was thirteen stories. It was thirteen. Is that what you're saying is a significant reduction? Well, it's a combination of things. So it's okay. partly its height, uh, partly its drop in unit count. Uh, there's been the introduction of a number of step backs and setbacks to reduce uh, the, you know, the impact and also to create a better transition to the north. The massing of the building's been moved closer to um, uh, Eastern. And you know, it's, I think this is really an example of the, the line that you know, I'm sure all councils are familiar with, which is for something to be compatible, it doesn't need to be the same. And I, and I believe city staff have been looking at this development in terms of what is a compatible fit and transition. So you're prepared, however, I heard you say, to continue to have further discussions. Y yes, absolutely. Yes, we have in a date. Words, we have a date at the at the tribunal, but uh, absolutely, our client is willing to carry on discussions and reduce the size and impact. <laughs> well, we have Why not? to have those I mean, discussions. You, you put it out, you're willing to make further changes. I, what I was saying is we're prepared to have these discussions and see where they go. We're doing the discussions in the context of a positive staff report. Well, we all understand that. Uh, but we're also all familiar with Corktown. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Mahevic. Very quickly, as I understand it, the secondary plan it's not older than 10, 15 years, something like that. Yes. And that's when 12 meters as a height limit was established and you're going to 46. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now if it was a 40, 40 year secondary, 40 year old secondary plan, um, I would get it. But if it was analyzed within the last decade or so, uh, okay, that's, All right, thank you. That brings you to the end of the question, correct? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Calvin, for your questions. I don't believe there are any, sorry, answers. I don't believe there are any more questions for you. Great, thank um, you. Let's bring this inside. I don't believe there are any members from the public. Uh, members with questions of staff. Okay, Councillor Troisi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Planning, can you outline the relevant built form policies in the of official plan that apply to this site? So the, uh, through you, Madam Chair, the policies, it's within a mixed use area. Uh, in the parent official plan, it's within a mixed use area, which is one of the areas that um, is expected to absorb growth in the city, both, both employment and residential growth. Um, it is, the policies do require transition to areas of different intensity in the parent plan, and also there are more um, performance measures around framing streets and providing uh, appropriate public realm. The, it is also subject to the King Parliament Secondary Plan, which has some more specific uh, policies, still mixed use, uh, but King Parliament looks to encourage investment. Um, it does speak to development being compatible with its context. And this particular site, as has been noted, is within the uh, mixed use area A, which is also known as the Court Town area A. And that does speak to development in that area being uh, primarily uh, small-scale infill development. So those are the sort of range of existing policies right now. Great, thank you. You, uh, you actually answered my second question as well. Thank you. I'm sorry, Councillor. 
Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, members to speak. Councillor Choice, please. Uh, I, first of all, I do want to thank uh, the constituents for staying and the applicant for staying all day, uh, especially on a sunny day, so thanks very much. I've never stood so firm on my position uh, on a development as I have with this. I've met with um, many resident groups, uh, not just one or two, but many within a very small neighbourhood, um, so their voices were very clear in terms of um, uh, the issues that they raised. I'm moving an alternate uh, mo motion to direct the city solicitor to attend the LPAT hearing and to retain external professional consultants as necessary to oppose the revised proposal. I've reviewed, reviewed the comments presented in the report and consulted with planning and legal staff. While I understand the reasons for planning's conclusions, I do not believe the results of the staff report gets us to the intent of the King Parliament Secondary Plan and the official plan. Corktown is a neighbourhood of small, fine-grained streets and buildings. Sensitive and appropriate infill development has been approved in the area several times in recent years. This application does not meet that level of sensitivity. Many more development sites in the vicinity, if approved like this, could compromise the distinct, low-rise character of the interior of Corktown. As well, the West Donlands precinct just to the south is continuing its revitalization. That plan calls for lower heights than this proposal, and we will, be, we will risk disrupting the years of careful planning by the community stakeholders, planning, staff, and Waterfront Toronto. As we have heard today, there is a huge amount of community opposition to this application. The Corktown Residents and Business Association and residents in the immediate vicinity of the proposal are very passionate about the special character of their neighbourhood. However, residents are not only bringing forward concerns and feelings of anxiety, the, the deputations today presented substantial planning arguments based on professional opinion and local expertise. I believe it's important to support community concerns and they also have to be carefully considered with the reality of the planning decision-making process. This application falls under the regulations of the old Ontario Municipal Board and any decision has to be weighed against that framework. From my discussions, there is a sound case to be made to continue to oppose the application and as always, there is opportunity and preference to reach an appropriate settlement before the hearing. I ask members of Community Council to support my motion. Thank you. Are there any members with questions of the mover? I just want Councillor Fletcher? Yeah, just when you've indicated that they'll con negotiations will continue up to City Council. Correct. And there could be, uh, on what basis would there be an agreement at, at City Council that you would accept? I think I would still have to have community consultation with that councillor. So you will fully engage this fantastic court Absolutely. community in any discussions with, uh, for any settlement that might be proposed prior to council? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Any other councillors with questions for the mover? No? Okay. Um, any other speakers? No? All those in favour? There's only one motion before us. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, there's a request for a recorded vote and indicate your support for the motion. All those in favor? Uh, Councillor Davis, Councillor Mahevic, Councillor Fletcher, Councillor Wong Tam, Councillor Fragedakis, Councillor Layton, Councillor Perks, Councillor Troisi, Councillor um, McMahon, Councillor Bailao. Let the record reflect that the vote was unanimous. Um, the item as amended, I believe. Yeah, yeah item as amended. Um, all those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. TE 32.2. Oh, actually, before we do that, we've just got to quickly add. Um, can I please have a motion to add um, 32.94 to 32.98 onto the agenda? We're making it bigger, not smaller now. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. Madam Speaker, Madam Chair, uh, I know there are some people in the audience that have been waiting all day. Um, and there are no deputants. I'm wondering if we could clear the deck so that some people could go. For the items where there are no speakers, no deputations, I, I, and I heard forward. you, Councillor. Um, yep. Unfortunately, and I, and I will say unfortunately, there are... Uh, 
19. I think Your Councillor right. Bailao has one. Right. what? There, there, are, there are about six items further down that actually have deputants, and as we call these items, there may be deputants. I don't know. Um, so I think we need to probably best just go through it. For a few. Okay. She's got, Anna's got a couple here. Uh, I, I can't take any releases, uh, and I'm sorry. I actually have a, I have a family engagement at seven o'clock, and unfortunately, I'm not even going to be able to get to my own family engagement. So we have we have a duty to carry out, and and uh, here we are to do it. Um, TE 32.21 309 Cherry Street, Phase One and Phase Two Zoning Amendment Application Request for Directions Report. Any members here to the public? That's not a scornful look, just so you know. I welcome you. Uh, come on, come on, come on up. I wasn't disappointed, in case you were. Thank uh, you, Lear. Thank you, yeah. uh, Chairman and Member Go ahead, of the Committee. Please. She's not a man. So Can you please uh, just state your name? Madam Chair, excuse me. My name is Paul Johnston. I am a land use planning consultant. I'm here on behalf of Lafarge Canada. Lafarge is a cement operator that operates uh, a cement terminal immediately south of the subject lands of 309 Cherry Street. I'm here to speak briefly to you to express uh, our support for the planning staff report and to indicate our significant concern with the proposal at 309 Cherry Street. There are a number, uh, a great number of concerns set out in the planning staff report which we support. These include the prematurity of the, ap of the application, the fact that flood works are uh, flood protection is required and other measures needed including uh, precinct planning and obviously the fact that the proposal itself does not in any way meet the uh, planning that's been done by Waterfront Toronto or the city for this site. Uh, I'll simply say however though that there are a number of that our significant concern is that the uh, the applicant has failed to address issues of compatibility with the existing industrial use, the Lafarge use and other uses in the area, that the studies that were submitted in support of the application uh, in fact themselves call for appropriate industrial compatibility studies which have not been completed and therefore it's not possible to know whether the uh, application is suitable from the, this perspective. And so that is the Lafarge issue. I, I will conclude by simply saying that the matter that's not been addressed in the staff report is one of transportation impact. The city and its uh, studies of the area, its extensive study is of the area, has indicated its intent to do a traffic management plan for this area so as to allow industrial uses such as ours, such as the salt operator, to continue to be able to access this area for industrial purposes. There are safety issues uh, that um, need to be addressed. We look forward to that study being completed and certainly that would be a necessary precursor to any and all development in this area. So, so I conclude by urging you to uh, accept your planning staff report uh, and to oppose this application. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Any questions for the speaker? Okay. Seeing none. I don't believe there's any other members here to the public to speak. So we would like to open this up. Questions of staff? No. Questions of uh, councillors to speak? Councillor Fleck. Sure. Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, move the staff recommendation to refuse and note that it's a gigantic building way outside of the precinct planning that was developed for um, Villiers Island. And I'd like to have a recorded vote on that, please. Okay. There's a request for a recorded vote. All those in favour, please indicate your we support. We ask the councillors to sit in their seats. Yep. Thank you. Councillor Fragedakis. Fragedakis, we're having a recorded. Okay, I'll start on this side, give you time to get into your chair. Councillor Davis, indicate your support, please. Councillor Fletcher, Councillor Wong Tam, Councillor Fragedakis, Councillor Layton, Councillor Perks, Councillor Choisey, Councillor McMahon, Councillor Bailao. Let the record reflect that the vote is unanimous. Thank you very much. We are on item T 32.22, Main Street, Zoning Amendment Application Request for Directions Report. Members of the public, anyone here to speak to this matter? Seeing none, we'll bring this inside. Questions of staff? Okay, Councillor Davis. Um, so this, this, this went to the board when? Or, or it was appealed? It hasn't been to the board. It was appealed by the applicant. When? 
Maybe that's, for you. it's not relevant. It just felt to me like they went instantly. It was pretty quick. Fairly quick, yeah. Like the day they were eligible? Um, a three year Madam Chair, I don't believe uh, the day they were eligible, but um, it, it was appealed uh, after the uh, that time frame attributed in the uh, Planning Act. And prior to the preliminary meeting, public meeting. Um, correct? Yes. Yes, so, that is correct. So in fact, before they even met the community, they'd already gone to the board, so, or were, had appealed to the board. I just want to be really clear what the things are that you are, it, it, currently it's very clear that you do not support this application in its current form. And uh, I take from the report that um, you're concerned that it is too tall, and I wondered if you could talk about the shadow impacts on the north side of the Danforth. Uh, th through you, Madam Chair, uh, yes, the report does speak to uh, concerns that planning staff have uh, with the form proposed um, that is reviewed in this uh, uh, staff report, um, issues of, of height, density, uh, shadowing, and transition to the adjacent neighborhoods. Um, the proposal, uh, as, as mentioned in the report, the proposal um, uh, does uh, maintain some shadow impact on, on neighborhood lands uh, on the north side of Danforth Avenue, uh, approximately between 918 and 1118 on the uh, spring and fall equinoxes. Um, that does speak to some um, of the concern related to height. Uh, on, on mass, though, uh, there are significant concerns related to uh, the proposal. Um, I, uh, which we did, which uh, we do address in detail in the staff report. Okay, I just wanted to ask about shadow, which is it's going to hit the block north of the Danforth, the residential neighborhood north of the Danforth. Correct? Uh, yes, well, that's, beyond that's the correct. Beyond the buildings on the Danforth. Okay, secondly, the, the proposal has no three story, or sorry, three bedroom apartments. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, Council. And what would we expect that they should have? Uh, based on uh, Council's adopted uh, Growing Up TO guidelines, uh, we do work with applicants to attempt to achieve um, uh, multiple two and three bedroom units um, of a, a size that can support um, family uh, sized units. Um, zero percent is certainly not something that we would be supportive of um, and uh, looking uh, to uh, looking for the proposal to be revised to address um, the recommendations of the Growing Up TO guidelines in full. And that involves um, a clustering of the three bedroom units on the first and second floors and uh, provisions in the design to accommodate families and strollers and play spaces and things like that? Certainly the guidelines do speak to um, the position of, of providing family size units on the lower uh, floors um, uh, closer to amenity and closer to the street. Uh, streetscape. Um, so, uh, you know, zero percent units as proposed again does create issue that uh, staff have noted in the in the report. Right, and the public realm. There's inadequate setbacks and um, improvements or proposed improvements to the public realm. Uh, yes, through you, Madam Chair. Um, the uh, proposal uh, provides for uh, set setbacks at grade between 3.3 and 5.9 meters. Uh, the tall building design guidelines that the city maintains for uh, reviewing tall buildings does um, uh, typically look to achieve uh, setbacks at grade of about six meters to provide for uh, appropriate sidewalk widths um, to ensure accessibility, uh, to ensure good walkability, street trees, uh, city, various city infrastructure. So there's a a standard, a substandard uh, sidewalk condition proposed in certain areas of this application that uh, again cause uh, concern for staff, which is uh, again detailed in the staff. So this report. is going to the board in June before the next council meeting, and you are expecting to continue discussions with them until council, is that right? Yes, there's a, there is a, a pre-hearing scheduled on uh, June 12th, uh, 2018, um, hence the report asking for direction to proceed to that pre-hearing uh, on this basis um, uh, and the issues identified, uh, to discuss the issues identified in this staff report. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any other members with questions? Just to clarify, I apologize, there is no hearing scheduled at this time, uh, again, just a pre-hearing in, in mid-June. Uh, members to speak. Thank you very much, and I move uh, staff recommendations. 
and um, thank staff for working uh, together. We, you know, we we were surprised at this kind of um, height for this area. I, I mean, we know Maine and Danforth, and I share with Councilor Davis is a mobility hub. It's you know fantastic that way, but we were uh, nevertheless surprised at this kind of height, and we've made that uh, quite clear to the developers and uh, trying to get them to work with us. They've also heard from the community as well, and uh, so I'm, I think this is smart to have this before us, so if you'd like to support it, that'd be great. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, all those in favor of the recommendation before us? Any opposed? Oh, sorry, I apologize. We did not conclude that vote. Uh, Councillor Davis to speak, go ahead please. Very quickly, it is an inappropriate development in terms of size massing and uh, lack of affordable housing, lack of three bedroom units, and it absolutely needs to come in differently and has huge impact and will set precedence for the rest of that neighborhood. So I hope that uh, the developer will recognize that and uh, make adjustments accordingly. Thank you very much for your remarks. Um, any others who would like to speak? Okay, seeing none, then we still have the recommendations of the staff report before us. All those in favor, any opposed, that carries. Thank you. T32.24, request for offense exemption to the Toronto Municipal Co uh, Code, Chapter 44. No, what I'd like to do, sorry, I, what I'd like to do is uh, every item that has a speaker, I want to move through those speakers very quickly, and then we're going to come right back, and I believe we can probably conclude the, the agenda. So I'm just moving to TE 32.24, request for offense exemption to the Toronto Municipal Code, Chapter 447. Um, yes, Councillor Fragedakis. Sorry, Madam uh, Chair, the deputants um, have left. The actual applicant had a medical appointment at three o'clock this afternoon and spoke to me and to staff and what said- What would you like to do with this? Uh, to defer the item okay, because they're so not here and they were unable to stay. Okay, so, so I have let me just- let me just read the address for the public record. It's 51 Don Valley Drive. Um, the deputant that was here is Joanna Sable. I believe she's gone, as per Councillor Fragedakis. Um, if there's no other members of the public here to speak, uh, then there's a motion before us to defer. Okay. To the next. All, th all those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. Is it June 6th or June 8th? It says June 6th. Okay. TE 32.25, application to remove a city tree, 209 Rosedale. I'm just, uh, sorry, Councillor Bailao, I see you wanting my attention. I just want to, there's a few items that have one speaker registered. I, what I'd like to do is just make sure we can hear from members of the public and then we'll conclude the agenda. We're almost there. Uh, TE 25, application to remove a city tree, 209 Rosedale Heights Drive. Uh, one speaker, uh, Stephen Smith, welcome. Good evening. My name is Stephen Smith and I'm a certified arborist. I work for my client Gillian Johnson and Martin Shaw and they live at 209 Rosedale Heights Drive. They purchased the house last August and they want to do renovations to their front garden. The house is in great shape but they want to do a lot more with the front garden than what is currently there. The main feature of that front garden is one city-owned European linden tree that is very, very close to the front sidewalk. It's also very close to the city uh, hydro wires that run along the edge of the street. Consequently, hydro over the years has chopped all of the branches off one side of that tree every year during its life. It actually had more branches on it when I first inspected it last fall, and since then hydro has been through again and taken off all of the branches that had grown out on this, this street side of the street, the tree. The owner wishes to remove this and replace it with as many trees as we can fit on the property, trees that could be further away from the street and from the wires so that they could have a chance to grow to a decent sized tree. They have an opportunity to make a slightly larger front yard than they have by doing this also. 
And the city, um, the property is a ravine property with a forest behind it, which is in bad condition. I've assessed it, and it is full of invasive species, weeds, and vines, completely neglected for many, many years. So there's an, also an opportunity to have a net benefit to the city from planting at the front and also doing work in the back. This work would be substantial and expensive and would be undertaken entirely at the cost of the owner. They would remove the tree, plant new trees, and do the work in the back if this is deemed possible. So I'm asking for a variation. I understand that the city wants to maintain as many healthy trees as possible. Do you have the pictures that I sent along? Um, you, do, you should have a file there that shows a picture of the trees. Okay, yes. Um, if you can look at your pictures, you'll see that the tree in question is very, very narrow. It is, being, is growing to the side because of a very large tree on the adjacent lot to the west. And hydro has taken off all the branches on the north side of the tree. The natural form of a European linden tree, if you can imagine an egg standing up on end, with very wide base and quite wide all the way up. This tree has been pruned into a spire, essentially, only about three meters across total. There is very little canopy being created by that tree because of the surrounding trees and the heavy pruning that's gone on. And there is enough room on the lot to plant trees that would essentially fill the whole lot with tree cover. So we're asking that we be allowed to take this tree down and replaced in whatever creative way we can work out to the satisfaction of city forestry. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Are there members with questions of the speaker? Okay, seeing none, uh, members uh, with questions of the staff? Seeing none, members to speak? No? Okay, um, then, oh sorry, go ahead, Councillor. No, go ahead. Oh. Right, or no, no, that, that is fine. I was simply going to move the recommendations in the staff report. I was just going to add something very quickly that we don't cut down a, an enormous tree like this because we don't like the shape of it. <laughs> um, any other speakers? Okay, all, there's a, the motion before us is the rec staff recommendations. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries, thank you. And thank you, Stephen, for your time. Um, TE 32.26, Front Yard Parking Appeal, 19 LeMay Road. It, uh, this matter is in Ward 22. Uh, what I'd at, are there any members of the public here to speak to it? You are, okay, welcome. Um, just so you know, I just want to state, uh, Councillor uh, Matlow suggested that we defer this, that I said I would defer this for him, um, sign he dies, so he'll bring it back when uh, he feels the time is appropriate. Um, so are you okay with that? Okay, great. So um, then there are no speakers. Um, anyone with questions of staff? No? Okay. Um, then I would like to move this, uh, I would like to defer this matter. Um, T20.26, defer this matter indefinitely. I was advised that you had a motion. Oh, you wanted to defer indefinitely? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. We can. Oh, does he have a different instruction? Let me know what it is because I. No, it probably is the same as she said. Okay. Uh, then um, all those in favor of the deferral motion? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. TE 32. Oh, sorry. Opposed? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, it still carries. TE 32.27, Front Yard Parking Appeal, 34 Ellerbeck. Any members of the public here to speak? Seeing none. Okay. Um, uh, all the sorry, I have a motion on that. Okay. Because I'm going to be deferring it because the polling doesn't end. Go ahead. Till Move the deferral motion. So I, yes, thank you. Um, if staff could put up the deferral motion, um, it's Please actually yeah. being deferred till the July meeting. I've been advised by city staff that the polling won't be concluded till the 8th of May, and the report won't be ready 
um, for the June meeting, and in fact, we'll be ready for the July meeting. Okay. We've had to repoll this because of some irregularities. Motion's right there. All those in favor of the deferral motion? Any opposed? Any opposed, Councillor Perks? Yeah. Would you want to oppose? Okay. <laughs> it still carries. I just want to make sure we, rip, we get it on the record. TE 32.28, uh, Front Yard Parking Appeal 161 Linsmore. Uh, st registered speaker, Stephen Clark. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you, everyone, for your endurance today. Uh, I want to begin with I want to begin with a note of appreciation for Nino Pellegrini, who has been a valuable resource in constructing our application and appeal, and I hope he's enjoying his retirement. I would also like to thank Councillor Fragedakis and her invaluable staff, who have helped me navigate the appeal process, which took a complicated turn last July with the amendment to Chapter 918. And finally, I'd like to thank Councillor Bailal, who revised the conditions of that amendment so the act of appeals like ours could be seen through to their conclusion. Before you today is item T3228, a front yard parking appeal for our home at 161 Linsmore Crescent in East York. We are proposing to expand on the sh shared driveway we have with our neighbor to the north. We are, have invested in a property survey and enlisted a professional and established landscaping company that specializes in Toronto parking pads to ensure that we meet all possible requirements put forth by Chapter 918-8, which governs, governs front yard parking licenses. As you can see from our landscaping plan, we meet or exceed all open space, parking area, and soft landscaping requirements. On-site parking is not currently feasible. Our neighbour has requested that we keep our shared driveway clear, as the resident has limited mobility and needs access to her rear entrance for herself and her support staff who visit regularly through the day. There is only one requirement in conflict with our application. It was determined that our application was not eligible as, quote, permit parking is permitted on the same side of the street on an alternating basis. Our application better serves the spirit of this requirement than the literal interpretation does. The curb of our front house currently has room for one car. The available on-street parking space between our existing shared driveway and the driveway to the south is almost exactly 26 feet. As a reference, Volkswagen Jetta or a Honda Civic, two cars that commonly park on our street, are each more than 14 feet long. There is simply not enough room to legally park two such cars on that 26-foot curb. In fact, if you look at the report for action file submitted by the city and turn to attachment B, uh, you'll see a photo of our home that cars typically park several feet forward from the existing curb cut. Now, some councillors here may be concerned that the city may pro put in a curb cut later, but I can assure you that even if the city decides to put one in without us, no parking spot can ever be lost. There is room there for only one car or truck now, but there will always be room for one or car or truck. We currently subscribe to an on-street parking permit. With subscriptions near capacity, it's often difficult to secure a spot near our home. We have two young children, one just, just an infant. Anyone here who's had to unload a car with kids, I hope, can empathize with the struggle of carrying bags and carriers down the block or across the street while keeping an eye open for cars, often rushing down our one-way road. If the alternate recommendations are approved, we will release this on-street parking permit. So no spots can be lost with our application, and in fact, one will be freed up. When presented with this information, even our agnostic neighbors got behind our application. We have gone out of our way to engage our neighbors and in open lines of dialogue to address any concerns. The result of this can be seen in the positive poll conducted by the city. I've communicated with some councillors here who regularly vote against such appeals to again open the lines of dialogue to concern their, understand their concerns that might extend beyond the reaches of Chapter 918-8. Along, alongside this landscaping project, we have plans to remove existing shared asphalt covering much of the backyards. In the, this in combination with adding a second rain barrel at the front of our house means that the alternate recommendations before you today produces a positive result in diverting stormwater runoff in the city. In conclusion, our applica application for front yard parking pad meets all requirements of Chapter 918-8 except where park there is parking on our side of the street on an alternating base basis. We believe the spirit of this item is to prevent a private parking spot from taking over a publicly accessible parking and with this we agree. However, since there is no chance of a loss of a parking space and we would be releasing our on-street permit, the alternate recommendations before you today better serves the spirit of this requirement than the black and white interpretation. I encourage you all 
to vote for the alternate recommendation and allow us to improve the parking conditions for ourselves and our neighbors. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your remarks. I don't believe there question or no question. There's there's a question. Go ahead, please, parking. Councilor. There's more permit parking in your area beyond your block. Yes. Oh. It, it's it's above ninety percent in our area. Yes. Right. But there is more permit parking beyond your block. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think we should have more permit parking available in East York. That would be pretty tight in our neighborhood, but. I'd be interested in seeing the results of that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, any others with questions? Seeing none, members to speak? I, I, no, sir, I just wanted to know, did you know there's a survey underway about permit parking and increasing permit parking throughout the Toronto and East York area? Are you aware of that? I know there's been dialogue about uh, the parking in our area, but I don't know the details of that one. And there was a, con a consultation at the Civic Centre to see about all the streets that don't have permit parking and how they can get permit parking. You don't sound like you know about that. I don't know the details about that. Yeah, so anyway, it's worth looking into. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, anyone else with questions or we move straight to speakers, starting with Councillor Fragedakis. Go ahead, and then Councillor Perks. I believe the clerks have my motion. It's that I'm moving the alternate recommendations to approve the front yard parking pad at 161 Linsmore Crescent. Okay, thank you very much for your motion. And Councillor Perks? I'll move the staff recommendation to deny. Okay. Yes, Councillor? I think it might be really interesting to, um, to, to put our staff to the task of identifying driveways that are no longer used and removing their curb cuts. If they're not used, we could be adding parking into, in, in, into the system. If, there, if two parking cars can't park there, but we have an unused curb cut, what, what's the curb cut doing there? It's a $50,000 curb cut. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's set up a working group to explore that at another meeting, but for now, let's vote on the two motions that we have before us, starting with Councillor Fragedakis's motion. All those in favor to approve the uh, front yard parking, um, please raise your hand, please. One, count. Mary's motion, Councillor, okay, one, two, three, to approve, and those opposed? One, two, three, four, five, Councillor Fletcher? To oppose, six, okay, that loses. Um, and then the motion to approve the staff recommendations, all those in favor? To deny, that's correct. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then to approve, three, that carries, okay. So the parking. That's correct. Yes, right. That's right. So that uh, the application has been denied, sir. Thank you. TE 32.29 Front Yard Parking Appeal 102 Belfair Avenue. Pat Flute. Pat, come on up. Okay. Let's turn our attention to the speaker before us. You have five minutes when you're ready. Please proceed. Hello. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, my name is Pat Flute. I live at 90 Belfair Avenue, and I represent many Belfair uh, residents who are uh, opposed uh, to front yard parking at 102 Belfair Avenue because it will eliminate a parking permit space. There is parking only on the west side of the street. 102 is on the west side of the street. And potentially it could damage the very large uh, white birch tree that's on the front lawn. This was the second time that uh, such uh, an application uh, was denied. Uh, a little while ago, um, we received notice um, for uh, approval for front yard parking. It was denied. Um, and we were notified of that. And also in that notification, it was stated that um, it could not be reviewed for, for quite a length of time. I don't exactly recall the length. So uh, we were quite surprised to get very short notice of this appeal this afternoon, um, which is now this evening. Um, 
the uh, notice hopefully um, was uh, seen by lots of people. I have many signatures here um, in the short time. I only got my notice yesterday morning. It was delivered to my neighbors on Monday. He returned it to me on Tuesday. And um, so in a very short time, I got about 20 signatures of people that are opposed to residents of Belfair Avenue, opposed to that front yard parking at 102. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your remarks. Question of the speaker. Seeing none. Um, members with question of staff. Seeing none. Members to speak. Councillor McMahon. Thank you very much. And um, thank you to uh, Pat for coming down. I didn't uh, see you way back there in the corner, but thanks for staying all day. Uh, I'm, so I'm moving to, um, I'm moving staff recommendations to deny this parking pad. Councillor Perks and Councillor Layton, you will want to know, deny the parking pad. Um, there is a tree issue, so I am denying it, and I can and do deny from time to time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, anyone would like to move the alternative recommendations? Seeing none, okay. Uh, report before us, staff recommendations. All those opposed? None. Okay, that carries. Thank you. T32.30, Front Yard Parking Appeal, 77 Ludi Avenue. We have a speaker, Leslie Grant. Welcome. Hi. We saved you. Thank you, okay, Madam go ahead, Chair. Please. I do have a, a submission. I made 12 copies of a, of a very informal poll, so I'm um, not sure what to do with uh, the, if you The clerks will take that from you, and he will distribute it to us. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the parking pad application that was previously denied was um, from the previous owners of the house that I bought in June. And um, the reason for the uh, denial was a uh, not a favorable polling result from the neighbors. So the letter that you have in front of you is actually written by my neighbor immediately to the north of me who explained the situation why the neighbors objected to the parking pad in the first place. So first of all, I live on the east side where there is no street parking anyway, so the parking pad would not be taking up a spot on the, on the street. In fact, it would be taking my car off the street. Um, I bought the house in June. Um, my husband had died earlier in the year, and so I needed to downsize. I've got four kids in their 20s, uh, all very supportive of, of the move. I didn't think I'd get emotional, I'm sorry. Um, I knew the parking application was in process, but I didn't think it would be an issue because everybody else has parking pads, and um, uh, it, it, that there's no parking on that side anyway. I subsequently learned that the previous owners, um, all of the neighbors knew that they were renovating and flipping the house and that they had no intention of living there. However, they did go door to door, uh, the owner and his pregnant sister-in-law saying they needed a parking pad, they were gonna live in, in the house and they needed it. Um, the owners were offended, or not the owners, the neighbors were offended at this misrepresentation and the poll was, was unfavorable. Um, so since then, I've gotten to know some of the neighbors. They're extremely supportive. Uh, I got the notice here on Friday and um, went door to door over the weekend and didn't receive any objection. Everybody signed the petition uh, immediately and, um, and, and I have all their support. I was called to Winnipeg on Sunday night um, because my father is ill. So I just got back last night so that I could be here today to support the um, the case, um, and I think the letter from my neighbor kind of speaks uh, speaks to it. Um, I don't want to go over time, but I'll just read one section. It said, the application that was made in 2016 was submitted by Mr. Cade Moon, a developer who owned the property at that time. Mr. Moon misrepresented his intentions with respect to the property to the neighbors and ultimately dispatched his pregnant sister-in-law to support solicit support. Anyway, all this to say that the neighbors were offended and, and not happy about it. So they have changed their tune. Um, I want to make the following points. Um, the subsequent change in ownership has significantly altered the view of the neighbors as evidenced by the attached letter. Um, I wish to be a long time resident and hope to have 
grandchildren at some point, um, which means sort of dropping them off on the front porch and then parking my car and coming back isn't really an option. Um, currently, there are 27 spaces on my block and 47 permits. So the chances of getting uh, a parking spot on the, on the street is, is very slim. I have been able to secure parking a few blocks away on many occasions, but um, I, I would like to say that the, that the polling was the only reason the parking pad wasn't approved. Everything else meets the requirements. I am happy to underwrite the cost of a formal poll. I was told that the city wouldn't do it, but I'm happy to do that if, if it would um, bring a different response. Certainly the response I've had from the neighbors I've been able to reach has been unanimous. Um, not a single objection. Everybody just, oh, let me sign for sure. Um, I'm prepared to follow the alternative recommendations to cover the cost of the ramp. Um, anything that's, that's required, uh, I'd like to do. And apologies, I didn't think, it's been a long day. I can't imagine how you all feel. Um, that's it, any questions? Thank you very much for your remarks. There are questions from Councillor Davis. Oh, of staff, sorry. Um, I don't believe there's any questions of you, so you're off okay. the hot seat. Okay, um, thank you. Questions of staff, Councillor Davis. I could have asked this of the applicant, but it says there is an on-street parking permit registered to this address. That's Oh, so you do have a parking permit. Yes, I do have a parking permit, yes. I just can't find parking anywhere near the house. Okay. As I mentioned, there are 27 spaces and 43 permits. Okay, I was worried it was waitlisted and you didn't have a permit. Oh, no, no, I do, I do. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And feel free to ask me anything if it's... Okay. Is it a question of staff or a yeah. question of staff? Okay. Uh, you're still off the hot seat. <laughs> Uh, question to staff, Councillor Layton. Thank you very much. I, I, am I to believe that if the poll came back positive, this wouldn't even be before us? It would to the chair, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any other members with questions of staff? You want to ask another question? Go ahead. Why would this have come back positive when there was alternative parking available? No, uh, because permit parking is on the opposite side of the street, so permit park, it wasn't deemed to be disqualified because of that. So it, it's, it's an application that met all the requirements of the code, short of the positive poll. But there was permit parking available. That is correct, but that's not one of the reasons for denying it in Ward 32. Oh, I see. Right. That is a reason for denying it in Ward 31. Through the chair, that is correct. Okay. Or 14, or 19, or 28, or... Okay. No, so let's let's I... keep this. Let's keep the discussion to a to a minimal to zero, and let's keep questions of staff. If there are no more questions of staff, then I'll take speakers. No more questions of staff, speakers. Councilor McMahon. I will just say that I, that was not a requirement that I put in. Okay. So uh, that was from previous. Uh, okay. So I am moving um, the alternative recommendations. This is a very rare. This is the first time this has happened. Oh, okay. So, oh gosh. So I love your support. Thank you. Because it meets the requirements. Okay. So, um, oh. Motion before us and Councillor Perks, go ahead. Oh, oh, I'm going to move the staff oh, recommendation. Sorry, I thought you were voting for it, so I'd like to just finish. <laughs> <laughs> like you tricked me because you're like, <laughs> you're like, I'm like, oh, you're voting for it. I, so just to finish two seconds, if you don't mind, this met all the requirements. It would not be here except the poll. So I'm not sure why we wouldn't support that. We wouldn't even see this application at all. And um, unfortunately, there's some discrepancy with the originally with the neighbors, and I think it, it stemmed from the previous owner of the house, not the current owner. So it wouldn't be here. And if she goes to reapply, you won't see it again because she'll get support. So, and I know that street, and uh, I know they're supportive. So that was the previous owner. Thank you for your support in advance. Thank you very much, Councillor McMahon, and Councillor Perks has moved the motion to deny. Uh, any other speakers ready to vote? All those in favor to approve? Uh, please indicate your support. 
Uh, no, your motion first, right? Um, so that would be one, two, three, four, five. And then for to deny, two. So that carries. And the other motion is redundant. So TE 32.31, refusal of a Boulevard Cafe permit application located at 582 College Street. Uh, Jameson Kerr. He's, he hasn't been here for hours. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, Councillor Layton, how would you a, like to proceed? I have a, a motion, and it's to approve uh, with a very limited condition of uh, closed doors and windows. Okay. This is the old uh, College Street Bar. Okay. Um, all those in favor of the motion before us? Uh, any opposed? Item is amended. Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. Adam the, Speaker. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. If, if we're done with the speakers, I do have somebody here that I'm not sure if they want to speak or not on um, 3247. 47 or 37? 47. Uh, we also have speakers on 37 still. Okay. 47 is, so, okay, so I'm, you know what, why don't we just jump around two times and one is to just clear the deck of members of the public who've been waiting very patiently to speak. I'm going to jump ahead to item number TE32. We need seven for quorum. Don't you leave. One, two, three, four, five. Joe's at the same place. I have to. I think uh, we have lost quorum. Uh, the, the clerk is going to call for uh, councillors who may be in the building. While that happens, while that happens, then uh, I'm just going to, um, I'll, I'd like to call and hopefully we'll have a quorum shortly, but just to prepare, we're going to jump ahead to item 32.37, impose Operating conditions to a Boulevard Cafe permit located at 444 Spadina Avenue. Um, Mervyn Blaha, Andrew Blaha, but we need to have quorum. Do we have quorum? Yeah, we do now. Seven. Oh, oh there she is. Okay. Um, Marvin Blaha, Andrew Blaha, are you here? And my friend, hello. Um, sorry, I, I just. Long, long time friend. Um, who is here? No one's here? Okay. Um, if that's the case, uh, why don't we just deal with it because it's, it's, are they gone or? There are speakers here, but not here. Okay, so I've just called for item 37. Let's just deal with it because it's now before us. Um, how would you like to proceed, uh, Councillor Cressy's item? Councillor Layton? Yes, thank you. I have instructions from Councillor Cressy that he'd like to move the staff rec uh, move the staff. Don't know how this is written. Is it move amendment? That we need Councillor Davis back in the room. Councillor, can you please take a seat in your chair? This is move amendment Two, three, that recommends five. there's an operating condition on the. Yeah. Okay. I'm reading his sheet wrong, so. Okay. Motion is before us. All those in favor of the motion? Uh, oh, it's, del it's a delete the following from the recommendation and add the following. That's what I have. Yeah. Is that what you got up there? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Yeah. Item is amended. Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. We're just going to jump back to TE 32.36. I've been notified there are speakers. The item title is third refusal of a Boulevard Cafe permit application located at 267 College Street. We have speakers. Good evening. I guess I was too excited when I screamed out my friend. <laughs> I haven't seen this guy in a long time. Sorry. But I will not be prejudiced, I promise. Okay. Go ahead. I to, uh, uh, good evening. I'd like to uh, discuss the refusal of our patio license for our Pizza Nova located at 267 College Street. Um, we have been, I just wanted to note, I won't take up much time. But I wanted to note that we've been a member of that community and in business there for well over 20 years and have had the patio uh, for that entire time. Um, our franchise owner, Martin Tarani, is uh, here with me today, who is, uh, this is, uh, I would like to just sort of strongly and respectfully request that you approve this uh, patio for us. I'm, I'm not sure what the denial 
uh, all of a sudden is about, but I, I'm, I'm hoping we can straighten it out. We have, uh, although our legal address is 267 College, our access point is actually about 40 meters, uh, sorry, 40 feet south of College on Spadina. So we're not actually on College Street. Our in and out is on Spadina Avenue, just south of College. And uh, we uh, depend heavily, uh, heavily uh, on U of T business. And uh, so our sales per week will drop about 35% once uh, school's out. So that patio does help us mitigate sort of the summer months uh, of U of T loss of sales. So it's very important to us to help you have that patio. Uh, we've actually just purchased new uh, furniture and umbrellas to enhance the look of our patio to attract more business. Um, and uh, um, I mean, apart from that, Martin, I think those are the, those are the real reasons that we, uh, we would like to get uh, our patio approved moving forward. Thank you very much. Are there any members with questions of the speaker? Okay, Councillor Davis. So it was refused because it wasn't big enough? It was blocking the sidewalk, correct? Um, they it didn't meet the uh, 2.1, I believe 2.13 meter. So why uh, can't you adjust it so that it will? Um, it will be too small. <laughs> Once we move back to two meters. Yeah, it would, okay. it, would re it would drastically reduce the size of, of the patio to a point where you basically have a tiny table and two chairs and it just, I, like we've had that patio for over 20 years, the entire time that we've been in business at, on, at that corner. And um, what is the separation distance? I believe we're at 1.45, just under 1.5 meters. I think it says 0.95, but I'll ask staff. Okay. Um, any other members with questions of the speaker? Seeing none, okay, thank you very much. Um, members with questions of staff, starting with Councillor Davis, go ahead. Okay, so I, I am a member of the Do you have questions Accessibility or not? Committee, and I, I you know what, you have Councillor? Why is it refused? Does it have to do with the separation? Is is it the separation distance? To you, Madam Chair, it's the it's the pedestrian clearance requirement of 2.13. Right. So the AODA requires 1.5. What is this? This is 0.95. And how long have we had 1.5 as the requirement? We've had 2.13 for a long time in, in the CAFE bylaw, so that's what we go by, but the accessibility right. is, is 1.5. And you have asked them over many years to bring it into compliance, is that what you're saying? We ask any applicant who doesn't meet the 2.13 to bring it under compliance, but they can appeal our refusal, and that's why we're here today. And when were, did they first receive notice? Of the file here, I'm trying to go by memory. It's right. It, so do you move it? You don't know. I'm trying to bring. On the, it looks uh, like there were two or three notices given. The reason I'm asking is there's been inconsistent enforcement all the time, it seems. Were they given notice many years ago? Uh, not sure about that, Councillor. No. Okay. No. Sorry, Vince. Okay, Unfortunately, the, the, the public doesn't get to respond when we're asking questions of staff, sorry. Um, okay, January 26, March 13. Any other members with questions of staff? Seeing none, members to speak, Councillor Layton. Uh, unfortunately, Councillor Cressy asked me to take care of this item as well, um, and his instructions were to the, move the staff recommendations. To deny. Yeah. Okay. All those, anybody else to speak? To deny. Okay, so um, just, I'll, I'll speak very quickly, and I am 
mindful of time. The, access, the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee um, is very clear about their recommendations moving forward, especially in a growing city, uh, crowded sidewalks. In order to have safe passage of two people going in bi-direction on a sidewalk, the pedestrian clearway moving forward, they have requested <laughs> as 2.1 meters at the very minimum. Although not official as of yet, um, that it really does speak to exactly the same rules that are already in place uh, by the uh, uh, by the flankage patio and uh, guidelines. So um, I just wanted to clarify that, so we all know that's that's the direction the city is heading in. Um, so motion before us to, to adopt the staff recommendations. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, that carries. Thank you. You can still have a patio; it's just got to be more narrow. Okay, thank you. So we are now. I believe 47 had a uh, had speaker. Yeah. And, and I think they're, they're okay not to speak and let her, okay. Are they they spent okay? the whole day with us, but they're not speaking. Okay, so then. Um, and I have a, a motion on this item. They just want to be here to make sure that it, it, it clears. So okay, but they're here, mind. but they're not speaking. Okay, so yeah, let me just read it, it into the record. Answer. So it's TE 32.47, 57 to 77 Wade Avenue, zoning amendment application preliminary report. Um, and I'd like to have the expanded notice and uh, just make a note that this is a uh, seven-story employment building, timber, in my area that we're very, very excited to welcome jobs in our community. So we uh, hope that this will be the first of uh, many of this, these projects because we like building residential, but we love also people to work in our communities and being able to uh, build uh, employment spaces. So uh, we're excited to uh, going to the community with this community meeting and, um, and have the project going, uh, going through. So uh, just wanted to make note of that. And uh, if I could ask for your support for the expanded notice and uh, the preliminary report. Great. Thank you very much, Councillor Bailao. All those in favor? Uh, any opposed? Item as amended. Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. So I believe there are no more member. Are there no more public deputations? Yes. Okay. Can I? Are there any members here in that are here to speak to any particular matter? Because if we're you're because we're going to go through things very very Let's quickly. Let's do it. Can I get an update? Yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, Thirty-two. Okay. Are you? No, the only reason I held it was because the counselor wasn't here. Okay, so we are now going to begin. We're going to go back to the 10 a.m. items, and we're going to blow through this very quickly. This is as efficient as it's going to be. Uh, TE 32.5. Councilor Bailao? Yes, 12... Councilor Bailao, 1209, 1232, 1234, 1250, and 1264 College Street Zoning Amendment Final Report. Number five. Bailao, how would you like to proceed? Uh, to uh, approve recommendations. Okay, thank you. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. TE 32.31, which I think we just dealt with. We did 3 1, we're at 3 2. We did 3 1. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I think and so, 3 2? Did we do 3 2? No. Okay. Yeah, Ellen, what kind of list did you give me? <laughs> okay, well, I take sorry. The wrong <laughs> I, I'm relying on you here. TE32.32, <laughs> refusal of a Boulevard Cafe permit application located at 669 College Street, Ward 19. I have a motion to approve with a condition okay. around windows and doors. Great. And, and live music. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? That carries, thank you. TE 32.33, refusal of Boulevard Cafe permit application located at 696 College Street, Roxton Road, Flankage, Ward 19. I have a motion to approve with the following conditions. Okay. Around time and noise and all the stuff that we normally put in. Okay, all those in favor? Okay, any opposed, that carry. And I think item as amended. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. Uh, TE 32.35, impose operating conditions to a Boulevard Cafe permit located at 3 Baldwin Street, or 20. Oh, I think we missed 34 there. 
This is the. Oh, um, you're, you're absolutely right. Sorry, I, college as well. I apologize. Um, T32.34 refusal of a Boulevard Cafe permit application located 890 College Street, Delaware Avenue, flankage. I have some operating conditions in a motion okay. to approve the patio. Motion on the screen, please. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Item as amended. Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. Now we're at 3 5. Impose operating conditions to a Boulevard Cafe permit located at 3 Baldwin Street. Councillor Layton. Yes, the instructions from the councillor was to move the staff recommendations, and they had some conditions to approve. Okay, so we're moving uh, conditions first. Are there conditions? There are some conditions in a staff report. It's already inside the staff report? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we're just moving the recommendations, staff recs. All those yeah. in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. TE 32.38, uh, refusal of a Boulevard Cafe permit application with deck lo located at 415 Spadina Road, Lonsdale Road, Blankage, Ward 22. I believe uh, Councillor Mallow uh, would like to see this application approved. So can we just put that on the screen? Yes, um, and this is the second cup, folks. So, um, any all those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. We now move to TE thirty-two point five eight Dufferin Street from Dundas Street West to Bloor Street West extended peak parking period regulations Ward eighteen. Councillor Bailao. Uh, we are just deferring that to June. The deferral mo request to June. Wait a minute. No, no, no. This we're doing. Sorry, just I, I'm a little too fast. Okay. We're, we're, we have to get time to display. Okay, not a problem. So what, what item are we on? Right uh, we are on item number 58, and my apologies, Thank clerk. Okay. Yeah. Well, squeezes them. Okay, 58, please. Go to uh, all those in favor of the deferral? Any opposed? That carry. PE 32.64, traffic control signals, College Street at Havelock Street, Rush Home Park, Crescent, and College Street at Gladstone Avenue. Councilor Bailao. Move staff recommendations. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carry. TE 32.68, traffic calming, speed humps, Macaulay Avenue. Councilor Bailao. Move alternate recommendations. There you go. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. T32.69, traffic calming speed humps, Roussette Avenue, Councillor Bailao. Approve. Staff recommendation? Yeah, this is 69. Speed humps. Wait, wait, the staff. What did the staff say here? Okay. We don't know. Is this, a, this is motions to approve? Do we need to show anything on the screen? Okay. Great. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Adopted. Yes. yes, adopted. Sorry. Um, TE 32.71, traffic calming speed humps, Hanson Street. Councillor McMahon. I already did that this morning. I had a little nice speech about that, remember? I think you helped you move the motion, but I don't think you dealt with it. Sorry? Yeah, you, you moved the motion. There was can you, a typo can you kindly you move it, it again? Okay, sure. I won't do the speech again, but move uh, alternate recommendations, and hopefully we'll get the warrant switch. Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. T32.77, endorsement of events for liquor licensing purposes. I don't believe there are any more. I have a motion on that one. Okay. Councillor Layton. Sorry, and this was just to take the weekdays away from uh, a North by Northeast at a location that's in a residential neighborhood, but they'll per will permit it on weekends. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Item as amended. Any opposed? That carries. T32.80, parking amendments for Brock Avenue. Uh, Councillor Bailao. Approve recommendations on the letter. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. T32.81, speed humps installation on Brock Avenue, Dundas Street West to Florence Street. Councillor Bailao. Approve recommendations on the letter. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. 
TE 32.82, accessible loading zone request on the north side of College Street between a point of 77 meters west of Dun Dufferin Street and a point of 11 meters further west. Councillor Bailao. Approve recommendations on the letter. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. TE 32.83, parking amendments for Osler Street, DuPont Street to Caribou it? Avenue. Councillor Bailao. Approve recommendations on the letter. Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. TE 32.84, reopening of item TE 31.96, titled Parking Amendments on Sheridan Avenue between Dundas Street West and College Street. Councillor Bailao. Approve recommendations on the letter. I think we have to reopen it first. Move to reopen. Okay. And uh, all those in favor of the recommendations before us now? Correct? Yep. That carries. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. T32.85, parking amendment for Sudbury Street. Approve recommendations on the letter. Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. T32.86, reducing the speed limit on Dover Court Road, Dundas Street West to Queen Street West, Ward 18, Ward 19. Approve recommendations. Staff, <laughs> move the recommendations in the letter. Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. TE 32.89, expanding par permit parking on Riverdale Avenue. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. TE 32.90, traffic safety on Riverdale, Pape to Kiswick. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. TE 32.91, pay and display on Eastern Avenue. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. T32.92, 62 Chester Hill Road, file number A1356-17 TEY, Ward 29. I will move the recommendations in the letter. Any opposed? Carried. T32.93, potential heritage properties at 490, 492, 494, 496, and 500 College Street, and 307, 309, and 311 Palmerston Boulevard, Ward 19. I'll move the recommendations in the letter. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. T32.94, appeal to Toronto Local Appeal Body, T Lab of Minor Variances of 16 York Street, Ward 19. York Street? On what street? York Street. It's not Ward 19. I think that's Ward 28. Oh, is that oh, oh sorry, Queen's Key East, Young? No, sorry, we're on item number 94. Um, I don't have the item before. No, Hold on. It's been looking at it online. Uh, it's just a Councillor Preston. Yeah. Oh, oh, we'll, okay. we'll move the recommendations in the letter. It's on the other okay. side. Uh, what you, that is Ward 20. If the, someone fix it's actually yeah. War 20, okay. Yeah. Uh, recommendations in the letter? Thank All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. TE 32.95 lane designation, Queens Key East at Young Street, War 28. That would be me. Mm -hmm. Move approval, please. Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. TE 32.96, J. McPherson Green and the relocation of the Enbridge Gas Distribution District Station. 427, I would move the recommendation in the letter. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. TE 32.97, guide rail at the northwest corner of the curve at O'Connor Drive at Broadview Avenue, Ward 29. I will move the recommendations in the letter. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. TE 32.98, College Street Planning Study, Rush Home Road to Lansdowne Avenue, Ward 18. Recommendations on okay. the letter. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. And Madam, Madam Speaker. Okay, is there, those are the only two? Okay, so. Madam Speaker. I, give me one second. We've dealt with five. What about 23? 23. Okay. So, item number uh, TE 32.23, intention to designate. Intention to designate under Part 4, Section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act and authority to enter into a heritage easement agreement, 50 King Street, 
East Ward 28. Thank you. Move staff recommendations. Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. I believe that brings us to nothing. Actually, I have a request to reopen an item. 32.69. I actually did a mistake. I would like to defer that to the June Council. 3269. Okay, so, uh, motion to reopen TE 32.69 traffic calming speed Hums Rousset Avenue. Motion to reopen. And okay. defer to June. And motion to defer till June. Because <laughs> we've got nothing to do in June. Uh, all those in favor? Okay. Any opposed? Carried. Okay. Um, okay. Let's get some bills done. Okay. Okay. Who's got the general? That the Toronto East York Community Council pass and declare as, as bills. Oh, it's not. Oh, true. whoa. Whoa. That totally Old wasn't eyes. Passed. Old eyes. The Toronto East York Community Council pass and declare as bylaws bills 557 to 570, 576 to 578, and 580 to 595, prepared for the May 2nd, 2018 meeting 32. Okay. Thank you very much. And then Councillor Layton. You got a vote. Oh, sorry. Um, all those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Councillor Layton. That the Toronto and East York Community Council pass and declare as a bylaw confirmatory bill to confirm the legislative proceedings of Toronto and East York Community Council acting under delegated authority of meeting 32 of May 2nd, 2018. Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Um, we want to thank everybody, especially the clerks. They received clearly, I think, over 200 and 30 pieces of communications which they all had to log and we all had to read which is good um, but thank you very much and i want to thank the members who actually stayed and i know many of you had <laughs> i know many of you had obligations including myself but thank you yep we're all late <laughs>